If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 126, The Unbreakable Vow A good night for a genocide. Headmaster, why are you here? Dumbledore, who was looking up at the starry sky, turned to look at the blonde boy who was coming. Lucas, will you keep our promise? Of course. Lucas nodded. Professor Snape, who was beside them, narrowed his eyes, and his eyes flicked back and forth between the two. He didn't expect Lucas to have an agreement with Dumbledore. Dumbledore said with a solemn expression, I have some things to deal with recently, and I may not be able to stay at school for the time being. But the threat in the school has not disappeared, and I am very worried about Harry's safety. I know that child has become estranged from you a lot recently, you have to understand a child's vanity. Lucas smiled bitterly, Headmaster, you seem to have forgotten that I am the same age as Harry, and I am just a child as well. Really? But I always treat you as an adult like me. Dumbledore gave Lucas a meaningful look. I know that Harry is investigating the Chamber of Secrets recently, and I hope you can help him at a critical moment. You know what the monster in the secret room is, and you should also understand its power. Dumbledore's words were finished when Lucas felt a biting cold feeling coming from behind him. It turns out that Mr. Grindelwald already knew what the monster in the Chamber of Secrets is. Could it be that Mr. Grindelwald is the heir mentioned in the legend? Professor Snape, I think you have misunderstood. The reason why I know is that the headmaster told me. He passed down the blame to the old man, he didn't want to have an angry Professor Snape on his case. The potions professor glanced at Dumbledore coldly, and snorted heavily. Dumbledore raised his hand and said calmly. Lucas, what do you think? I don't think so. Are you planning to wait until everything is over, and then transfer all the credit to Harry the Savior Potter like last year? After Lucas finished speaking, Dumbledore fell silent, and this is already the best answer. Seeing him like this, even Professor Snape let out a disdainful laugh. A few minutes passed before Dumbledore kept talking, based on Slytherin's current house points, I think this school year's house cup will be taken away by Slytherin again, it seems that I have to congratulate you both in advance. Headmaster, you don't think I really care about that empty trophy, do you? The reason I was so angry last year was because I didn't want everyone's hard work to go to waste. And I want to remind you that the current Slytherin house points were earned by everyone. Even without your help, the house cup will still be ours. Lucas' rebuttal had just been finished when Professor Snape's whispering voice came from behind. Mr. Grindelwald, it seems that our esteemed headmaster has nothing but sweet and greasy syrup in his brain. Let's not waste our time here. Lucas followed the advice of his own head of house. The two turned around and walked towards the door. Severus, Lucas, please wait. Lucas, I remember that you put forward some additional conditions two months ago, you can't go back and forth like this. Oh I don't think I'm going back on my word, but now Harry is taking the initiative to face the basilisk. I'm very lucky. And the conditions I raised this time are not too much. I just need you to promise that I can enter the Forbidden Forest in Hogsmeade Village at any time. Snape looked at the boy beside him in surprise, he didn't expect this cunning boy to make such a simple request. Dumbledore said without any hesitation, no problem, I promise you, but not now, in fact, I no longer have the authority of the headmaster. It's okay, I'm not in a hurry, not to mention there is Professor Snape to testify, I believe you will not break your promise, headmaster. Of course, what about you? What guarantees can you give me? How about the unbreakable vow? Let Professor Snape be the executor. The other two didn't seem to expect Lucas to be so decisive. The unbreakable vow is something used between two wizards to make a promise. If one party breaks the vow, it will lead to the death of the party who broke the vow. This. What are you worried about? Could it be that everything you said before was false? Seeing Lucas' scrutinizing eyes, Dumbledore nodded immediately, okay. Lucas held Dumbledore's hand together. Professor Snape stood between them. Will you, Lucas Grindelwald, protect Harry Potter's life during this school year, dot. I will. Will you, Albus Dumbledore, hand over the Greyfinder sword to me, and agree to give me the right to enter and leave the Forbidden Forest and Hogsmeade Village at will after I have completed my part of the deal, dot. I will. As the vow was made, the magic of the two entangled each other around their wrists. Lucas could feel a magic power that didn't belong to him slowly flowing in his wrist. Lucas, I will leave Harry's safety in your hands. After Dumbledore finished speaking, he operat and left. 
It seems he must be in a hurry to find a way to solve his troubles. Professor Snape gave Lucas a cold look, turned and walked towards the castle. Due to walking too fast his black wizard robe floated up again. In this dark environment, he looked more like a Dementor. Going back to his dorm, Lucas once again cast a spell on the door. When he walked out of the void, he had already appeared in the depths of the Forbidden Forest. Through his long explorations he had already covered most of the Forbidden Forest. At this moment, only the last area in the depths remained. If he's not wrong, this should be the territory of the werewolves. Ding, the host has obtained a new achievement, Werewolf Territory, Reward, 100 Achievement Points. Detected that the host has completed a new achievement, Explore the Forbidden Forest, Reward, 3000 Achievement Points. The Forbidden Forest is truly a treasure, Lucas couldn't even remember how many achievement points he had earned here. Finally completing the exploration achievement, he was actually a little bit reluctant. But there was not much time left for him to be reluctant. Accompanied by a slight sound of footsteps, more than 30 wizards came out from the depths. Except for the night of the full moon, werewolves are no different from ordinary wizards. The only difference they have, is probably that they like to eat their steaks raw. You are not welcome here, little wizard. The werewolf at the head looked to be about 50 years old. Judging from his position, he seems to be the leader of this group of werewolves. Hello everyone, my name is Lucas Grindelwald, a second year student at Hogwarts. I'm here this time to discuss a business with you. After Lucas finished speaking, several bottles of Wolf Spain potion appeared in his hand. There was a commotion among the wolves, because the lure of Wolf Spain potion for werewolves is huge. However, the leading middle aged man is still very prestigious. With just a glance from him, the rioting crowd became quiet. What business do you want to talk about? Seeing the vigilant look in the middle-aged man's eyes, Lucas gave an appreciative look. It's nothing, I just hope that you can do things for me in the future. If you agree, I promise to give you a full dose of Wolf Spain potion every month. Little child, who do you think you are? It's ridiculous to want us to be loyal to you. Accompanied by a roar from the middle-aged man. The werewolves behind him showed an extremely ferocious smile. It seems that I still need to do this. After Lucas finished speaking, he waved his wand, and the fire shield was successfully cast, making the blue fire surround himself and the werewolves. Not giving the middle-aged man time to react. He raised his wand and pointed at the few werewolves on the farthest edge. Avada Kedavra. The green death beam hit a werewolf who let out a miserable howl. Immediately afterwards, the killing curse split into three strands, killing another three people close to that werewolf. This is the killing curse developed by Salazar Slytherin, he actually turned the killing curse of a single attack into a group attack. What now? Surrender? Or die? The werewolves hesitated for a moment, and finally lowered their heads. Detected that the host has obtained a new achievement, conquering werewolves, rewards, 500 achievement points 1000 unique tricks for dog training. 9 lessons required for raising dogs. Seeing rewards Lucas wants to ask the system, is this serious? If he really took out these two books, these werewolves might turn on him immediately even if they have to die. Looking at the werewolves staring at him, Lucas gave the middle-aged man the wolf spain potion brewed by Professor Snape and bought from outside. In the process, he also learned the other party's name. Andrew Holmes was once a common wizard, but one day he was accidentally bitten by a werewolf. Then he hid in the forbidden forest of Hogwarts and has been here for decades. Now I have a task for you, do you know the centaur tribe in the forbidden forest? Andrew nodded. Of course I know them, those four-legged guys are always nosy. That's good. Your first task is to wipe out all of them. Can you do it? He didn't need to hear the answer, the bloodthirsty smiles of the werewolves had already answered him. Centaurs, these natural fortune tellers, are too troublesome to keep alive. Not long after Lucas left, the centaurs in the Forbidden Forest suffered a catastrophe. Overnight, all the centaurs were slaughtered. After the Acromantula's extermination, the centaurs followed their example and also became extinct. In the blink of an eye, the night passed and the students in the castle didn't know that so many things happened last night. They still didn't know that their headmaster, Dumbledore, had been fired. The students who were having a delicious breakfast received a newspaper from an owl. This time, the Daily Prophet was extraordinarily generous, it seems that a newspaper was sent to all students for free. Look, the murderer has been caught, it was Hagrid and his acromantula. Merlin's beard, this spider is really big. 
But Hagrid doesn't look like a bad guy, why would he do such a thing? No matter what, as long as the Chamber of Secrets was not really opened. But why haven't the Aurors left the castle yet? Hearing someone ask this question, the noisy students all became quiet. Yeah, why are the Aurors still in school now that the danger is gone? Before they figured it out, another flock of owls flew in. This time they brought other newspapers or magazines such as The Witch's Weekly and The Complete Book of Broomsticks. Rita Skeeter's article this time was not published in The Daily Prophet, because even if she wanted to publish it, she had no chance. But a magazine like Witch Weekly is perfectly fine. Rita's pen is still strong. Plus there are pictures of the Ministry of Magic hunting spiders and capturing Hagrid as evidence. Setting off the questions she raised more impartially. First of all, although the acromantula is poisonous, it cannot petrificate people. If the murderer who attacked the students was an acromantula, why does it only petrify students and not hurt them at all? This question has been supported by many people. Rita also criticized the actions of the Ministry of Magic in the report. Saying she thinks they are just using scapegoats to deceive the majority of wizards. At the end of the article, she complained about Dumbledore's expulsion. Saying that now that Hogwarts is without Dumbledore's protection, there will be no safety at all. It has to be said, Rita's pen is really powerful. Just a few articles and she actually passed on the dissatisfaction of many parents towards Dumbledore to the Ministry of Magic. After all, it was the Ministry of Magic that finally dealt with the incident, and it was also the Ministry of Magic who had lied to everyone. Lucas looked at the article and nodded in satisfaction. As for Minister Fudge, he was afraid that he must not be so happy at the moment. Indeed, Fudge has already dropped all the things that can be smashed in the office at this moment. This poisonous woman, I must have her arrested. Time passed, and February started without knowing it. The name Rita Skeeter has been making a splash these days. Not only did the sales of Witch Weekly skyrocket. It also made Fudge have to fire some people in order to shirk responsibility and avert the anger of the wizards. Vinder Rosier received a commission from Lucas. Soon some of their own people were arranged to work in the Ministry of Magic. Although they are all idlers, Lucas does not dislike them. Food has to be eaten one bite at a time, and the road has to be walked step by step. When Voldemort returns the year after next, he is confident that he will be able to take down the entire ministry in one fell swoop. Lucas, have you heard? That guy Lockhart is going to do something again, it seems that he said he is trying to boost morale. Hearing Hermione's words, Lucas immediately thought of Valentine's Day, and letting out a long sigh, he prayed that Lockhart wouldn't bother him that day. At this time he saw Ginny Weasley. After not paying attention to her for a while, Ginny's face has become very pale. Looking at the way she walks slowly and weakly, Lucas knew that this was a sign of too much vitality being absorbed. If this continues, Ginny Weasley will pass out due to the lack of vitality. That means, the drama of the year is about to begin and the young version of the Dark Lord, Tom Marvolo Riddle is about to appear. Chapter 127, Harry finally found out the truth, but Ginny was taken away. With Dumbledore leaving Hogwarts. Professor McGonagall, being the deputy headmistress, took charge of school affairs temporarily. Although the Ministry of Magic insists that the Acromantula was the culprit who attacked the students. But Professor McGonagall does not believe it. The monster in the Chamber of Secrets was not eliminated. So under her leadership, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry implemented the strictest curfew system ever. Also, Professor McGonagall cancelled this year's Quidditch Cup. This annoyed Harry who wanted to get the cup for Gryffindor. Over the past month, Harry and Ron have not given up on their investigation. It's just that with Lucas' advanced notice, Hermione mostly avoided them. As for the two using their own abilities to investigate information about the Basilisk, if they really do it, Lucas is even willing to forego the latter plan as a reward. It wouldn't be impossible to make Harry famous again. But the question is can the two of them do it? February 14th, Valentine's Day. Such a beautiful day spoiled from the morning by that idiot Lockhart. Looking at the big pink flowers on the walls around the Great Hall, Lucas felt like it was an insult to his eyes. At this moment, colorful heart-shaped confetti floated down from the ceiling, making him let out a sigh. Suppressing the discomfort, he sat in his seat. What? No appetite. He asked the surrounding Slytherins. Oh this is the worst Valentine's Day I've ever had. After speaking, Blaze Zabani picked a scrap of paper out of his pumpkin juice. Pansy Parkinson frowned in anger with her eyes fixed on Lockhart at the teacher's table. This idiot, 
I really want to hit him with a killing curse. Wow Pansy, we support you, please act quickly. That's right, Pansy, we will definitely ask our family to help you feel better in Azkaban. We might even help to break you out if you really do it. Pansy rolled her eyes at everyone, then picked up the apple on the table and took a bite. Watching the little snakes joking with each other, Lucas chuckled and turned his gaze to the teacher's seat. The atmosphere in the teacher's seat was very pessimistic. Lockhart was wearing a pink robe with his trademark shining smile on his face, he looked down at the little wizards below. The other professors beside him all had very ugly faces, especially Professor Snape. Seeing the way he gritted his teeth, Lucas was worried that he would suddenly explode and take out his wand to curse Lockhart. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone! Seeing that the seats were almost full, Lockhart got up and congratulated everyone loudly. So far, I have received cards from 46 people, and I would like to express my gratitude to them. That's right, I prepared this little surprise for everyone on my own initiative, and of course it's more than that. Lockhart clapped his hands when he finished. The door of the Great Hall opened and a group of sullen-faced dwarfs came in a file. What is unacceptable is that these dwarfs carry golden wings on their backs and hold harps in their hands. Let's welcome the little cupids in kind. Lockhart was the first to applaud. Today they will wander around the campus and send Valentine's Day cards to you, and of course I believe my colleagues are also willing to actively participate. You might ask Professor Snape how to whip up a love potion. If you think that's not enough, you can also seek the help of Professor Flitwick, he knows more entrancing enchantments than anyone I have met, that sly old dog. Professor Flitwick squeezed his eyes shut, trying to keep himself breathing deeply. It could be seen that the dueling champion was suppressing his temper. As for Professor Snape, he looked at everyone present with his cold, empty eyes. The meaning revealed in the eyes is very obvious. Whoever dares to go to him for advice on how to make a love potion, better be prepared to suffer the consequences. Lockhart finished what he wanted to say, and sat back in his seat contentedly. Following shortly after, those dwarves with sullen faces walked towards their respective targets. You are Harry Potter. Harry, who was eating, was suddenly taken aback. Looking at the little man beside him, he subconsciously nodded. Poor fellow Savior couldn't have known what's going to happen next. The dwarf took the harp in his hand and said, I have a message to you with music. So saying, the dwarf played the harp in his hand. It's just that the tone it pops up doesn't seem to be called a tune. Ah, his eyes are like green's balls of yarn. His hair is like a black mop. He is a warrior in my heart. My boy who lived. I want you, Harry Potter. Harry was dying to find a place to hide right now. This is simply the scene of a large-scale social death. Looking at the little man who turned and left after reading the message, he breathed a sigh of relief. But when he saw people around staring at him with a smile on their faces, his cheeks suddenly turned red. Stupid Gilderoy Lockhart. Lockhart would never have imagined that the famous Harry Potter would naturally swear. Soon, there were various exclamations in the Great Hall and many students were happily watching the excitement. In the next second, they realized that it had turned into a lively scene. There was chaos as a lot of students began to flee the room because they were worried of being humiliated like Harry. But doing so won't help, because these nasty little dwarfs will chase you to finish reading the message, and their voices were super heavenly. Blaze Zabani gave the dwarfs a worried look. I say, Chief, why don't we leave as soon as possible? Why? Isn't this very lively? Blaze smiled awkwardly. Just as he was about to speak, he saw a dwarf walking towards them. Don't be me, don't be me, please just don't be me. His prayers seemed to have been answered as the dwarf passed by him without stopping. The eyes of everyone followed the figure of the dwarf curiously. Until he stopped beside their chief. Are you Lucas Grindelwald? Bang! The little man had just finished speaking when Lucas pulled out his wand and turned him into a squirrel. The squirrel looked at its body in panic then turned and ran out of the great hall. Oh Mr. Grindelwald, it's not good of you to do something like this, you can't reject someone's love. Professor Lockhart, if you continue, I'll turn you into a female squirrel, and turn all the dwarfs you find into males. Looking into Lucas' cold eyes, Lockhart smiled awkwardly and sat back in his seat. The rest of the day, the dwarves ignored the classroom discipline and broke into the classrooms at will to deliver messages or greeting cards. This annoyed the other professors very much they just hoped the day would pass quicker. The last class in the afternoon, Transfiguration class. Professor McGonagall looked at everyone and said, I have good news for everyone. 
the Quidditch Cup is going to return. It is possible to go to Hogsmeade Village to play. Dumbledore is back. Could it be that you caught the real air? The students below the podium gave full play to their imagination, but they were all rejected by Professor McGonagall shaking her head. I just received a message from Professor Sprout that the mandrakes are mature and can be harvested tonight. Professor Snape will brew the restoration draft overnight. Tomorrow morning, you will be able to see your friends back with you. This is really good news for everyone. But this also means that tonight may be when Ginny is brought into the Chamber of Secrets. After class Lucas joined Hermione and Cho Chong to tell them that if Harry comes to ask, they can tell him the answer directly. Sure enough, it was exactly what Lucas thought. It wasn't long before the two girls returned to Ravenclaw Tower that Harry and Ron went to ask Hermione for help. Hermione told them where in the library they could find the information straight to the point and they found the information of the basilisk as they wished. The legend says, anyone who sees the eyes of the basilisk will die immediately, Harry, Mrs. Norris looks exactly as described in the book. Then why didn't the others die? Ron asked himself the answer. This question bothered Harry as well. But when he looked at his own reflection on the window, he immediately understood the reason. The two excitedly recorded the information they found and when they left the library, they realized that it was already pitch black outside. The two of them couldn't care less, they needed to find Professor McGonagall as soon as possible and tell her about the basilisk. But when they arrived at the door of her office, they discovered that all the professors were basically there. Looking at the dignified expressions of the professors, it seemed that something bad happened again. The air attacked again, and this time he also took a student away. Professor McGonagall's voice came from the office. As soon as she finished speaking, there was a sound of breathing in the office. The message on the wall clearly says, her bones will remain in the chamber forever which is too bad. Professor McGonagall said the air's message verbatim. Immediately afterwards, the duo of Harry and Ron heard Professor Hooch's voice. Who is that student? It's Ginny Weasley. It wasn't just the professors who were surprised to hear the name, even Harry and Ron outside the door were taken aback. Especially Ron. His eyes widened, he couldn't believe what he just heard. Immediately afterwards, he looked at his friend, eyes full of anxiety. Chapter 128, Harry asked Lucas for help. Harry signaled Ron to be silent. Just when the two were planning to continue eavesdropping, there was the sound of hurried footsteps at the far end of the corridor. Gilderoy Lockhart came hurriedly from a distance. As soon as he entered the office, he apologized loudly to everyone. Sorry, I overslept, what's the situation now? Oh the right candidate has come. Professor Lockhart just came. A student was captured by the monster and taken into the chamber. It's time for you to show off your brilliance. Lockhart paled instantly, then he looked at the speaking Professor Snape, and asked with an ugly smile. Professor Snape? You just, I. That's right, Professor Lockhart, didn't you say before that you knew where the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets was? Professor Sprout chimed in. I. Lockhart was sputtering at the moment. Professor Flitwick also got up from his stool. You also said that you know what the Chamber Monster is. The professors did not give Lockhart a chance to speak at all. They've had enough of this arrogant, incompetent, self-aggrandizing idiot. Faced with such persecution, a bead of sweat slowly oozed from Lockhart's brow. After wiping it hastily, he said dryly, I think everyone may have misunderstood. That's it, Professor Lockhart, tonight is an excellent opportunity for you to show your talents, and we promise not to let anyone disturb you. Make sure you come face to face with the monster alone for a heroic duel. Professor McGonagall gave the final word. As the deputy headmistress, it was not easy for Lockhart to refuse her words. All right then. I'll go to my office to get ready. With that, Lockhart turned and fled from the room. Seeing his ever-accelerating pace, it was obvious that he didn't intend to go to the Chamber of Secrets. Professor McGonagall sighed, and said in a slightly sad tone, all the students must be sent home tomorrow. Hogwarts is over, and it might never open again. Professors, go back to your respective houses, tell the students the truth, get them ready to leave by train tomorrow morning. The expressions of the professors were equally sad. However, they still followed the arrangement of Professor McGonagall. They all got up and walked to their respective house common rooms. Harry and Ron ran to the room in the dungeons where they usually met. Ron couldn't keep himself calm. Harry, what should we do? Ginny, Ginny, she's been taken. 
Professor McGonagall said that the air is going to kill Ginny. Oh no, I should have paid more attention to Ginny that day, she was clearly trying to tell me something, but I carelessly ignored her. Looking at his friend pacing worriedly, Harry stepped forward and pressed a hand on his shoulder. Calm down Ron, there should be something we can do. How? Ron looked at his friend in confusion. Harry said with firm eyes, yes, we might have a solution. As you heard just now, Professor Lockhart was assigned to deal with the Basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets, so let's ask him for help. Him. Ron's expression became hesitant. Most Hogwarts students are aware by now that Lockhart is an incompetent douchebag. Only some little witches who are obsessed with his appearance still take him seriously. Not only him, of course, but also Lucas. Hearing Harry name another person he hates, Ron frowned even tighter. Ron, there's no time to hesitate now, think about Ginny, and think about the Basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets, you don't think the two of us can handle the Basilisk, do you? Seeing Ron shaking his head, Harry breathed a sigh of relief, go back and inform your big brothers, and let Percy inform Mrs. Weasley. They should all know about Ginny. Watching Ron run towards the upper levels of the castle, Harry took a deep breath and walked towards the Slytherin common room. There is a basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets, and anyone who sees the eyes of the basilisk will die instantly. Although Harry was reckless, he wasn't arrogant enough to think he could handle a dangerous creature like a basilisk unless he had no choice. On the other hand, the powerful Lucas should have no problem. Dumbledore said that too. If you get stuck, ask Lucas for help. Harry looked in the direction of the Slytherin common room. The glasses refracted the light on the wall, making it impossible to see his eyes clearly. It is even more impossible to understand his true emotions at the moment. Slytherin common room. Since Professor Snape came to explain the situation, everyone returned to their dormitories to pack up their trunks. As children from wizarding families. The Slytherins are well aware that this time if Hogwarts is closed, there is probably no chance to open it again. Many people acted very sad. Lucas was left alone in the lounge, waiting for Harry to arrive. Ginny had just entered the Chamber of Secrets, and the Basilisk Medusa notified him. Lucas was very sure that Harry would definitely come to find him as a powerful help. No matter what his purpose is. Ding ding ding. A signal came from the entrance door. Lucas got up and straightened his wizard robes, stepping up to the door. Harry. Lucas, I need your help. Harry's eyes were so helpless at the moment. He told him the news of Ginny's kidnapping, and then looked into Lucas' eyes and asked. You know about the basilisk, too, don't you? Seeing Lucas nod, Harry confirmed his guess. Since Hermione knows that there is a basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets, Lucas had no reason not to know. It's just that he didn't understand why Lucas didn't tell Dumbledore the news. Looking at Lucas who had a smile on his lips, Harry took it for granted that Lucas wanted to get Dumbledore out of school as much as Mr. Malfoy. I've heard about the situation from Professor Snape, so what do you want? Lucas, I know where the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets is, and I want you to join me to deal with the Basilisk. Harry thought for a while after saying these words, and added, You should also want to rescue Ginny, right? Faced with such a clumsy method, although Lucas was disdainful, he nodded cooperatively. Of course. I'll go back and prepare first. Where shall we gather? In the women's bathroom on the second floor, Myrtle said that she heard someone talking there when she died, and then the basilisk appeared, so the bathroom must be the entrance to the chamber. The two came to an agreement and Harry quickly ran upstairs to wait for Ron to arrive. Once he arrived, the two rushed to Gilderoy Lockhart's office. Oh Harry, I'm a little busy right now, I'm afraid I can't entertain you, sorry. Lockhart was about to close the door after speaking, but he was forcibly stopped by the two boys. Professor, we are here to ask for your help. But it's really inconvenient for me now. The half of Lockhart's face exposed outside the door was pale and full of tension. But seeing the determined eyes of the two, he still compromised and opened the door. The two entered the office. Looking at the scattered clothes and suitcases, Ron immediately said, Professor, are you leaving? I suddenly received an urgent notice that I need to deal with some very important matters, very urgent. What about my sister? Sorry, I'm really sorry about this, but there's a lot of urging over there, and I have to get there right away. Looking at the suitcase on the ground, Harry suddenly said, you want to escape. Lockhart paused. Well, it is true. But you are the professor of defense against the dark arts. Guys, you know, 
when I signed my employment contract, it didn't say I would have to. Although he didn't say anything later, they still understood his meaning. But you are a great hero who defeated many monsters. Harry, books can be deceiving. Lockhart said slyly. At this time, he has already finished packing his suitcase. Carrying a big suitcase Lockhart turned to look at the two of them. Okay, let's say goodbye, but before that, I need to do something. After that, he drew out his wand and pointed it at them. Just then, a cold voice came from outside the door. Expel your miss. A powerful spell knocked Lockhart into the air as his wand fell into Lucas' hands. Are you all right? They shook their heads and Ron looked at Lucas with complicated eyes, he felt really uncomfortable being saved by someone he despises so much. They did not continue to waste time. Lucas pointed his wand at Lockhart and forced him to follow Harry to the women's bathroom on the second floor. When Harry used parcel tongue to open the Chamber of Secrets entrance, Lockhart's eyes filled with surprise. Professor, don't just stay there, it's your turn next. Don't wait for him to figure out what it means, Lucas had already raised his leg and kicked him down the passage Spartan style. The three of them stood above and listened to his scream. After making sure that Lockhart landed safely, the three of them jumped into the pipeline one by one. Lucas took a step back on purpose when he came to the familiar cave. Lockhart was holding a wand and aiming it at everyone including him. Chapter 129, Tom Appears Lockhart looked smug when he obtained a wand. After Lucas slid out of the pipe, he pointed his wand at him right away. Don't move, Mr. Grindelwald, I know you are very powerful, but if you dare to act rashly, I can't guarantee that I will not hurt you. Now throw the wands in your hands at me. Lucas took a careful look at the wand in Lockhart's hand and discovered it was not the broken wand of Ron like in the original book. He looked suspiciously at the two boys beside him and saw Harry lowering his head in annoyance and self-blame. Drop your wand quickly. Along with Lockhart's urging voice, Harry and Ron saw a wand being thrown. Turning to look at Lucas, they saw that he seemed indifferent. Grindelwald, what do you mean, how are we going to save Ginny without a wand? Lucas didn't get a chance to answer because Lockhart started laughing and taunting them first. You don't have to worry about this, everyone will know when you get out of here that we came a step late and failed to save the girl. The three of you also lost your minds because of seeing her mangled dead body. And I. I successfully repelled the basilisk and rescued you from the Chamber of Secrets, so who should I start with now? Why not start with Mr. Harry Potter? Seeing Lockhart raise his wand, Harry and Ron became very tense thinking they were truly done for this time. Ron even lowered his head in surrender. At this moment, something unexpected happened in front of the two of them. Lockhart suddenly bent over, clutching his stomach. Under the surprised gaze of the two there was a lot of blood on his robes. Lucas reached out and recalled his wand. Then he rewarded Lockhart with an overpowered flip endo. The huge force lifted the stupid peacock into the air, he did a triple flip and was slammed into the stone wall fiercely. The subterranean cave that existed for thousands of years began to shake and stones began to fall from overhead. Lucas summoned Harry's wand, stuffed it into his hand, and kicked him out. Watching Lucas and Ron surrounded by stones, Harry shouted anxiously, Ron, Lucas, are you all right? We're fine Harry, but Lockhart's in a bad situation, you go save Ginny first, we'll be there later. As soon as Ron finished speaking, he was knocked unconscious by a stone falling on his head. Harry who saw the situation from the cracks in the stone, was even more anxious. At this time Lucas came to the opposite side of the stone crevice, he stared into Harry's eyes and said, Weasley's words are correct, you should go to rescue Ginny Weasley now, leave this to me, don't worry. After saying that, Lucas turned and walked towards Ron. Seeing that Ron has a friend who is taking good care of himself Harry felt relieved and walked towards the secret room. But he didn't know that just after he left, Lucas immediately threw Ron aside, and even cast a stunning charm on him. Seeing Lockhart's bleeding wound Lucas held up his wand mercifully, Vulnera Sainter. This spell is a counter-curse specially created by Professor Snape for Sectumsempra. The advantages of Sectumsempra have been mentioned many times, but it seems that it has never been said that it is a reversible spell with a counter-curse. What is a counter-curse? It can be understood as a spell specially used to restrain Sectumsempra. So why is this an advantage? Because except for the counter-curse, other spells cannot restrain the wound caused by it. In other words, the wound caused by Sectumsempra, neither potions nor various healing spells will have any effect. The only effective one is the Vulnera Sainanter spell created by Professor Snape. 
The wound on Lockhart's stomach healed quickly, then Lucas pointed his wand at his head and said, Obliviate. Lockhart's eyes went blank as Lucas directly cleared all his memories. It is his punishment for deceiving the world, and he must admit that it also felt really good. After doing the world a massive favor, he leisurely strolled towards the pile of rubble that blocked the way ahead. With the void escape magic, Lucas passed through the stone pile with ease. When he arrived at the Chamber of Secrets the young Voldemort was writing his name in the air with his wand. Harry watched the letters reform in the air, forming a dramatic self-introduction in front of him. I am Lord Voldemort. Voldemort. Harry looked at the ghost-like boy in front of him in surprise. Yes, Voldemort is my past, present and future. Riddle brushed Harry's hair aside with his wand. I'm curious, how can a baby without any magical talent repel the greatest wizard of all time? You're not the greatest wizard, Dumbledore is. Just as Harry finished speaking, an ethereal melody sounded in the secret room. It is rumored that the singing of the phoenix can give courage to those who are pure in heart, and it can also increase the fear in the hearts of evil people. Lucas, who is hidden by the side, watched Fox appearing in midair with a playful look in his eyes. It's really such a big coincidence that this phoenix came here. As Tom saw Fox flying toward them, his expression was full of vigilance. Of course he wasn't afraid of the phoenix. It is the owner of the phoenix, Albus Dumbledore, who he is afraid of. But seeing the phoenix just threw down a battered sorting hat he had a mocking look on his face. Is this Dumbledore's gift to his champion? A singing bird in a dirty hat. After laughing, Riddle started walking towards the giant statue of Salazar Slytherin's face. He also recounted how he manipulated Ginny to kill Hagrid's roosters, how he made her write on the wall with rooster blood. In the end, he explained how he forced Ginny to release the basilisk. Unfortunately, little Ginny seemed to have noticed something unusual, and she no longer trusted her diary. Of course, I didn't want to listen to the stupid thoughts of an 11-year-old girl every day. By the way, I haven't told you yet, this girl's heart is not about you, Harry Potter. Hearing Tom's ridicule, Harry's expression became very ugly. Of course he knew who Ginny liked and admired. Enough Voldemort, let Ginny go. Oh that's not okay, not only will she die today, but you will never leave either. Tom opened his arms and spoke in parcel tongue facing the statue. Speak to me, Slytherin, the greatest of the Hogwarts Four. The statue's mouth snapped open, revealing the basilisk coming from within. Its huge body fell to the ground, and even made the entire room tremble. Harry was running for the door long before the basilisk came out. Feeling the vibration under his feet he just wanted to find a place to hide quickly where the basilisk couldn't find him. He didn't dare to turn his head, and was even more afraid of seeing the basilisk's eyes. Harry Potter, you should have discovered a long time ago that we are actually very similar, both half-bloods, both raised by those disgusting muggles. We also share the gift of parcel tongue. But you believed in the wrong person, let me see your skills next. Kill him. Riddle ordered the basilisk in parcel tongue. The basilisk turned its head to look at Lucas who was hidden aside. Go, girl, play. Lucas' voice rang in Medusa's mind. She nodded and quickly chased in Harry's direction. The pipes in the secret room extend in all directions. Driven consciously by the basilisk, it didn't take long for Harry to run back to the original place. Lucas then drew his wand making the sorting hat fly towards Harry. He was waiting for the Gryffindor sword to be drawn. All his hope to find the last secret room is on that naughty sword. Harry took the sorting hat, not sure what the hell Dumbledore wanted him to do with the battered, dirty hat he had given himself. The moment he was in a daze a light flashed in front of his eyes. Looking at the hilt of the sword slowly appearing in the sorting hat. As if grasping for a life-saving straw, Harry stretched out his hand and pulled it out. The sword of Gryffindor returns to the world. The phoenix song sounded again and Fox reappeared with firelight. The sharp claws and beak were preparing for an attack, and its target was the behemoth entrenched below. Medusa looked up into the sky, a bird and a snake looked at each other. Seeing that a big war is about to break out, a sudden, low voice came from the quiet secret room. Avada Kedavra. Green light hit the phoenix in midair and Fox turned into a flame without even realizing it. Looking at the ashes on the ground, Lucas knew that in a short while the phoenix would rise from the ashes. Who? Riddle looked towards the direction where the killing curse flew out from and the footsteps of a third person sounded in the secret room. Watching Lucas slowly reveal his figure, Harry said in surprise, Lucas? Where's Ron? Is he all right? Seeing that Harry meeting himself was actually showing such a reaction Lucas sighed. 
Harry, hand me the Gryffindor sword in your hand. Harry looked at the sword in his hand, then at Lucas who was walking towards him and finally noticed that something was wrong. Why did you attack Fox just now? And why did you use the killing curse? Harry, I don't want to explain this to you now, give me the sword in your hand. Harry hastily hid the Gryffindor sword behind his back, it looked like he wasn't going to listen to Lucas. What a hassle. Lucas' helpless voice rang in Harry's ear, then he was hit by a white light. Petrificus totalis. I guess you are no stranger to this spell. As soon as Lucas finished speaking, he appeared in front of Harry. Reaching out, he took the Gryffindor sword and examined it carefully. This goblin-made sword has a crystal clear ruby inlaid on the hilt while the blade of the sword is bright and shiny. On one side of the sword body, the name of Godric Gryffindor is also engraved. Lucas tried to infuse magic into the blade and found out that the sword of Gryffindor is the same as his goblin sword. Both can contain magic power and make use of it. Hey, who are you? And why didn't the basilisk attack you? At this time, Tom Riddle, who had been ignored for a long time, finally couldn't stand it anymore. Along with his roar, Lucas finally looked at him. Chapter 130, Everything was part of Lucas' plans, the third horcrux is destroyed. We meet at last, Tom Riddle. Looking at Voldemort in the Slytherin robes in front of him, Lucas had to admit that Voldemort was a little handsome with a nose, he was just a bit worse than him. Riddle looked puzzled, the blonde boy in front seemed to be very familiar with him, but he is quite sure that he has never been in contact with him. Who are you, Dot? Well, since you don't seem to know me, let me tell you that I am Lucas Grindelwald. Grindelwald. Riddle frowned. When he saw Ginny Weasley lying on the ground, he suddenly realized. So you are the object of this little girl's crush. Lucas was very helpless, why didn't he realize that Tom was so gossipy? Seeing that the young Voldemort still can't recognize him, he had no choice but to continue to remind him, Tom, can you help me with my homework? It's you. Tom said in surprise. He will never forget this annoying guy. At the beginning, he didn't know how much homework he had done for him. But in the end, there was no benefit at all. Not only that, this guy also lost his diary. Wait. Lost. He seemed to have sensed the problem and looked at Lucas solemnly, you gave my diary to this little girl. Harry's eyes were full of shock as he lay paralyzed in the back. Although he can't move, it doesn't mean he can't hear. Unexpectedly, the culprit of all this turned out to be Lucas. Harry moved his eyes slowly, looking at the pile of ashes not far away. He had seen Fox's ability to be reborn from the ashes in the principal's office so he knew that the killing curse cannot kill the phoenix. And just like he thought, the little pile of ashes suddenly moved and a small bird slightly bigger than a chick got out of it. Before Harry could be happy though, another green light hit Fox. It had just been reborn when it turned into flames again, and the ashes on the ground piled up even higher. Harry, don't have unrealistic ideas, this phoenix won't be able to leave today. And I'm also curious about one thing. How many times can the phoenix be reborn from the ashes? If I continue to kill it like this, will it really turn into a pile of ashes in the end? I'm so curious, why don't we try it? Harry watched the smile on Lucas' face and his whole body felt cold. Ignoring Harry again, Lucas looked back at the young Dark Lord in front of him. What were we just talking about? Oh yes, speaking of abandoning you, actually you misunderstood, I just returned you to Ginny Weasley. He 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 Riddle suddenly laughed softly. The laughter grew louder and then into a big mocking laugh. I never thought that Dumbledore would tolerate someone like you in Hogwarts. He is really too old. Lucas shrugged, seeming to agree with what Tom just said. Then why doesn't the basilisk attack you, it wasn't like that fifty years ago. Riddle's question, Harry was also very curious about it. He even wondered why Lucas was alright standing opposite the basilisk. Lucas noticed the curious eyes of the two and glanced at Medusa with a chuckle. The basilisk understood, and twisted her body to come behind him. Because we are friends. While speaking, Lucas opened the eye of Medusa, but as a horcrux, Tom was not petrified. Watching two pairs of snake pupils, one big and one small, appear in front of him, he understood immediately. Compared to his identity as the heir of Slytherin. Obviously, it is easier for the same kind to win the favor of the basilisk. Although he knew that Riddle might have misunderstood something, Lucas didn't intend to explain himself to clear the misunderstanding. Rubbing his chin, he took a few steps around Riddle. Your state is really troublesome. Hearing these words, 
Riddle looked a little smug. That's right, I'm connected to Ginny Weasley, what can you do? Boom. As soon as he finished speaking, a group of red flames appeared in front of him. Feeling the threat from the flames, Riddle's face instantly became ugly. But what surprised him was that Lucas actually put the fiend fire back. It wasn't that hard to save Ginny Weasley. A bit of fiend fire or letting Medusa bite the diary with her fangs could solve this problem. It's just that Lucas is greedy for the other party's soul power. But if he absorbs Riddle's soul power, Ginny's vitality might dissipate instead of returning to her body, and that's why Lucas felt it was a little troublesome. Under the puzzled gazes of Riddle and Harry, Lucas crouched down and held Ginny in his arms. Then he looked coldly at Riddle who was standing not far away. Life steal, void devouring. Without waiting for Riddle to react, the ground under his feet became a void and a group of purple-black arms stretched out, dragging him into the void. At the same time Lucas passed all the absorbed vitality to Ginny. The other hand was not idle either, soul-devouring hit Tom at the same time. Feeling the power of his soul getting weaker and weaker, Tom finally showed a panicked expression. Once the void closed again, Ginny in Lucas' arms was no longer as cold as ice and her body temperature had basically returned to normal levels. Swallowing the purple soul crystal in his hand, Lucas went to the Black Diary and said, Harry, do you know why I want this Greyfinder sword? Harry couldn't speak at the moment, he found it hard to even blink. Looking at the other person's current appearance, Lucas smiled slightly. The sword of Greyfinder appeared in his hand at some unknown time. This sword is the most successful alchemy weapon created by the goblins. Its most special feature is that it can absorb any substance that is beneficial to itself. As Lucas spoke, he raised the sword, and the basilisk Medusa opened her mouth wide, letting a drop of transparent venom fall from her fang. The Greyfinder sword slowly absorbed the venom that fell on its blade, in this way it has the properties of the basilisk venom. It also has the ability to destroy horcruxes. Having explained this to Harry, Lucas suddenly raised the Greyfinder sword and pinned it to the diary with his back hand. A puff of black smoke rose from the diary and Tom Riddle's distorted expression appeared in the thick smoke. This is where horcruxes are special, if the horcrux is not destroyed or disassembled like Lucas does, the soul fragments inside can never be destroyed. Lucas just absorbed part of Riddle's soul power when he defeated the Shade. Ding, congratulations to the progress of the host series of achievements, destroy Voldemort's horcruxes, three-sevenths, reward, 500 achievement points. Finishing dealing with Voldemort's horcrux, Lucas needs to take care of the following aftermath. Don't think his nonchalant act just now is just for a show, because while it seems that he has exposed his true colors in front of the two of them, it won't really affect him. In fact, he knew it in his heart. The shard of Tom Riddle's soul was destined to be annihilated. And Harry? He will not remember all this, he will only remember his brave battle against the basilisk and destroying Voldemort's plot once again. And finally, together with Lucas, they successfully rescued Ginny from the Chamber of Secrets. Seeing Lucas walking towards him step by step, Harry suddenly had a bad feeling in his heart. Harry, when did you get jealous of me? Hearing what Lucas said, Harry's eyes were filled with shock. Lucas smiled and continued, I think it was around Halloween? Or earlier? Let me guess, maybe it's the news that I've become the Slytherin chief? Or maybe it's because Draco used my broom and snatched the golden snitch from you? Looking at Harry's increasingly surprised eyes, Lucas sighed, Harry, I regard you as a friend, you shouldn't be jealous of me. Did you know? My father gave me a very precious present for my birthday during the summer vacation. It's called the Curse of Desire. It's a very ancient black magic. Do you know the Mirror of Ereast? That magic was cast on that mirror. It's just that the person who cast the spell doesn't seem to want to arouse people's deepest desires, so the effect of the magic is weakened, so that the mirror can only arouse people's desires while they are in front of it. Seeing Harry's terrified eyes, Lucas smiled and said, That's right, I used it on you on the night of the Death Day party, and it seems to have worked quite well. This kind of you is beneficial to what I have to do later, I'm sorry my friend, but I can guarantee that no one can hurt you during the seven years of school. Okay, the chat is over, you shouldn't know, I need to delete it, sorry friend. Goodbye, friend. He didn't give time for Harry to digest his words. The last thing Harry saw was Lucas raising his wand and pointing it at his forehead. Immediately afterwards, a gentle voice came from next to his ear, Obliviate. The memory charm can delete the target's memory, and can also add false memories to the target. Lucas would never have done this before. After all, 
his memory charm would have easily been spotted by Dumbledore. But thanks to a bonus obtained after the awakening of the charm's talent, his memory charm barely reached the full level effect. Lucas slightly modified Harry's memory according to the plot of the original book. Certainly, he deleted the scene of Harry being poisoned and finally using the basilisk fangs to destroy the diary. In Harry's memory, he ended up heroically killing the basilisk with the sword of Gryffindor and destroying the journal. After finishing all this, Lucas came to Ginny Weasley again and also modified her memory slightly. With everything finally settled, he knocked Harry unconscious. Looking at the basilisk beside him, he said, OK, let's prepare for the aftermath. We can't really let the savior get a reputation that doesn't belong to him. Chapter 131, Aftermath Work The basilisk Medusa seemed to understand that she was about to leave this place where she had lived for many years. But she was ready to live in a new home and didn't seem the slightest bit reluctant to leave. She even kept hitting the ground with her tail to show her excitement. Lucas, let's go. I can't wait to meet new friends. The reason why the basilisk said so was because Lucas told her that no creature in the secret garden will be hurt by her eyes. After entering, she can finally meet new friends with confidence and boldness. As the master of the secret garden Lucas can set the rules for the basilisk's eyes. This also made him feel the power of Helga Hufflepuff again. She opened up a small world where all creatures living in it must abide by the rules set by the space master. Lucas felt it was a pity that he didn't live more than a thousand years ago, otherwise he would have been able to meet the founders. He came to the basilisk again, can you make your body smaller? Small? I don't know, I think it should work. The reason why Lucas asked was because he discovered that some of the pipes here were actually not as thick as he had imagined. But the basilisk has lived for a thousand years, so it is impossible to only have the current size, so it is likely that it subconsciously kept its body within the range allowed by the pipe. Under Lucas' gaze, the body of the basilisk gradually shrank. In the end, it turned into a big snake with the thickness of an arm and a length of four or five meters. Is that all right? No problem, let's go. Lucas held out his palm, and Medusa put her head in his palm knowingly. Just a blink of an eye and the Chamber of Secrets was left with only Harry and Ginny lying on the ground. After a while, Lucas reappeared in place carrying a large package in his hand. Looking at the edges and corners inside, it looks like there are a lot of wooden sticks inside. He glanced at the two sleeping people to make sure that the two of them won't be able to wake up in a short time. Lucas walked into the Slytherin statue with the package. After setting everything up he patted the dust off his hands. Looking at the huge snake-shaped skeleton in front of him. This snake skeleton was left by a giant python in the secret garden and it should have been dead for a long time because the bones had become brittle. It just happened to be perfect to replace the basilisk. After some time Harry woke up confused, but then he suddenly remembered what happened, Tom Riddle, the diary, and the basilisk, all those memories came flooding back. Ginny. He got up from the ground and looked aside anxiously, but finding Ginny lying shyly in Lucas' arms he suddenly felt a pain in his heart, like he lost something important. But he was still relieved to see that Ginny was fine. Lucas, you're here. Where's Ron? Where's Professor Lockhart? They're fine, you didn't return for a long time, so I came to have a look. Harry frowned and asked, where's the basilisk? Where's Voldemort? What basilisk? What does it have to do with Voldemort? When I came here, there were only the two of you, and the diary was the only other thing. Harry followed Lucas' gaze and the familiar diary appeared in sight. He hurried over to open it and look through it, but nothing unusual was found. Harry stroked the diary where it had been pierced by the sword, then he took another look at the place where he had just been lying down and saw the Gryffindor sword quietly placed there. Confirming that everything was the same as in his memory he breathed a sigh of relief. Nothing, nothing happened, let's leave quickly. When he said this, Harry's expression was slightly smug. He turned and picked up the Gryffindor sword and the sorting hat. Just when he was about to leave. Suddenly, they heard some cries from the side and saw as Fox crawled out of the ashes. Harry's face was full of self-blame, I'm so sorry Fox, I didn't expect Voldemort to use the killing curse on you, fortunately you are a phoenix. Picking up Fox, Harry walked out of the secret room without looking back. As for Ginny behind him? Isn't there Lucas to help take care of her? Lucas looked at the frail baby Phoenix in Harry's arms and once again verified his guess. Phoenix rebirth also needs to consume energy, and this energy is accumulated in the process of its growth. Since Fox was hit twice by Lucas with the killing curse, this second rebirth time was obviously longer than the first one. 
Moreover, after rebirth, he was not as energetic as the first time, and seemed very weak. Once again he confirmed some valuable knowledge. Lucas looked at Ginny Weasley contentedly. Ginny, are you all right? Can you stand up? Ginny blushed at his gentle tone and nodded slowly, then shook her head quickly but didn't say whether she could stand up or not. Seeing this, Lucas smiled, got up and hugged the little girl in his arms. Looking at his face close up, Ginny shyly buried her head in Lucas' arms. When the two reached the pipe they entered from, Harry and Ron had been waiting for a long time. Ginny, are you okay? Although Ron is a jealous git and has a bad temper, he still cares a lot about his family. Just after leaving Lucas' arms, Ginny was still a little bit lost. Hearing her brother's inquiry she nodded absently, I'm fine, thanks to Mr. Grindelwald for taking care of me. After saying that, she secretly glanced at Lucas. Unexpectedly, the other party just happened to be looking at her with a small smile. Seeing the smile on the corner of Lucas' mouth, Ginny shyly hid behind Ron. Ron is normally at odds with Lucas, but since the blonde boy did help to save his sister this time, he walked up to him slowly, and said very softly, Thank you. You're welcome. Humph Ron snorted coldly, took his sister's hand and walked to Harry's side. At the moment Harry was watching to see if they could climb up the pipe, but didn't find any way of doing it so they were stuck. Harry, what's in your hand? Seeing Ron staring at Fox curiously Harry explained it to him. Knowing that it was a phoenix, Ron's eyes lit up, why don't you let it go out and report the news? I heard that phoenixes have the ability to teleport through space with their fire. No Ron, don't you see Fox is already weak? Looking at the dozing phoenix in Harry's arms Ron scratched his head with an awkward smile. Just when everyone was at a loss, there was a rustling sound coming from the pipe. It seemed that someone was sliding from above. When the sound became clearer, they quickly moved aside to make room for whoever was coming and after a moment they saw a platinum head emerge from the dark pipe. Draco Malfoy, this guy who had been petrified for nearly two months suddenly appeared in front of everyone. Draco. Harry called out the other person's name in surprise and the two hugged each other. Draco also comforted Harry, saying that he was fine. Just as the two of them finished talking about the recent events, Lucas' voice came from beside them. Oh I'm so glad to see you again, Draco. Draco looked at his best friend standing not far away and walked towards him. There was also a hug, and Draco asked softly in Lucas' ear, Is everything resolved? Of course. After a short hug, Draco untied the rope around his waist. Professors are ready on the top, let's go up. He handed the rope to Harry, and looked at Lockhart who was lying aside and giggling stupidly. What's wrong with this idiot? Draco, be polite, although he is indeed an idiot now, he's still better than before, so you can't say that about him. Hearing Lucas' teasing remarks, Draco was even more puzzled. Harry kindly explained it to him, but the spoken version is of course the same as in the original. Lucas had already modified Harry and Ron's memories. There will be no mistakes like this. Everyone tried their best and finally climbed up through the lengthy pipeline. Being the last to come up, Lucas was also responsible for bringing Lockhart up with magic. Professor McGonagall, I defeated the air, the air is Voldemort, and the basilisk, I defeated the basilisk, with this sword in my hand. Harry looked extremely agitated at the moment, not caring about the occasion. In front of all the professors and many students, he briefly talked about the events that transpired in the Chamber of Secrets. Looking at his excited look, Professor McGonagall hastened to appease him. Everyone was naturally happy when they heard that the basilisk was eliminated. Lucas even saw Professor Snape look at the pipe several times, he was probably very tempted by the materials on the basilisk. It's a pity that it didn't wait for a few professors to send someone down to check and the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets closed again by itself. Harry who ran around for a long time also fainted at this time, and afterwards he spent several days in the infirmary. A lot happened during this time. First of all, after the crisis was lifted, Hogwarts returned to normal with the Quidditch matches and visits to Hogsmeade being brought back. It's just that because the final exam is approaching, the students are no longer that interested in participating in these activities. Then the news that the Chamber of Secrets was opened was published again in the newspaper. Rita Skeeter's powerful pen has silenced the Ministry of Magic. No matter what she said before, the Ministry insisted that what they destroyed was the real culprit. But now that the chamber has been opened again and with the blood written on the wall as evidence, Fudge couldn't say anything more. It's just that he didn't follow through on his promise to resign and step down. Even though he received countless howlers every day, 
he still insisted on his position as Minister of Magic. The reason is simple. He didn't know where he got the news from, but he learned there is nothing in the Hogwarts Chamber of Secrets, just an empty underground space. As long as he hangs in there and waits until someone is sent to take a picture, he can stand up again. Pine. Pine Caro opened the door and entered the office. Minister, are you looking for me? Has the person sent to contact Rita Skeeter returned? Not yet. Tell her that if she can get the photo of the Hogwarts Chamber of Secrets this time, I will let the past go, and she can go back to the Daily Prophet to work. Will do Minister, I'm going to send her a message right away. Pine Carroll left his office, but only wandered around the ministry before returning. Both he and Rita are part of the Saints group, so naturally, there is no need for him to pass on the message. Leaving the Ministry of Magic aside, the best news for Hogwarts is that Dumbledore is back. And it is thanks to Rita's recent reporting that Dumbledore convinced more than half of the governors. The school board not only lifted the expulsion order, but also restored him as headmaster. The first thing Dumbledore did when he returned is to announce that the defense against the dark arts exam will be waived this year. This good news made the students very happy. They had thought they were going to have to answer another questionnaire about Lockhart's favorite things. But Lucas felt very strange, he remembered that in the original book, it seemed that all the exams were cancelled. But these have nothing to do with him, anyway, the exam was not difficult for him. Now that the final exams are coming in a few days, Lucas and Hermione began their rivalry against each other again. The two refused to give in to each other since they both wanted to be the first in their year. Cho stood aside and didn't know who to cheer for. After the exams were over Lucas looked confident, but Hermione also looked sure of herself. Just when the two were about to check their answers to the exam questions Professor McGonagall came to find Lucas. Mr. Grindelwald. Headmaster Dumbledore asked you to go to his office and said that he has something very important to talk about. Lucas nodded his thanks. After comforting the two girls, he walked towards the headmaster's office on the seventh floor. He knows what's coming next. Dumbledore must be going to ask him about the Chamber of Secrets and whether he can deceive the cunning old man depends completely on his next performance. Chapter 132, Lucas, Headmaster, you have to believe me, we made an unbreakable vow. Bonus one-third. Lucas was standing in front of the headmaster's office on the seventh floor. Facing the stone gargoyle, he took a deep breath and carefully recalled the arrangements he had made in his mind. After confirming that there is no problem, he said the password, Iced Lemonade. Going up the spiral staircase and entering the office Lucas' expression became calm. Welcome, Lucas. Dumbledore stood at the round table, it seemed he had been waiting for Lucas' arrival. Headmaster. I am very glad to see you again. I didn't expect it to be handled so smoothly this time. Not only that, I also solved some small troubles. Really? Then I have to congratulate you. They just talked a few words and then sat in the old place again. As the house elves delivered the black tea, Lucas chose to speak up this time. You called me this time, are you planning to fulfill your promise? As he said this, he kept his eyes on the Greyfinder sword on the desk. Dumbledore nodded and said, of course, after all we have an unbreakable vow, but even without the vow I still wouldn't break my promise. But before that, I have a few questions for you to clarify. Go ahead. Lucas waved his hand to signal. Dumbledore didn't ask the question right away and seemed to be thinking about where to start. Watching Dumbledore put candy after candy in his mouth Lucas frowned. If you eat sweets like this, are you sure you won't get diabetes? Just at this time. Dumbledore looked up at Lucas, eyes full of inquiry. Lucas, you, Mr. Weasley and Professor Lockhart were blocked by rubble, so how did you get out? The exploding charm, I used the exploding charm to remove all the rubble, Ron, and Professor Lockhart saw this. I uh, forget about Professor Lockhart, you should already know about his situation. Yes, regrettably, Professor Lockhart may be spending a very long time at St. Mungo's in the future. Dumbledore was silent for a few minutes after he finished speaking. So when did you find Harry? Of course, I went to find Harry right after he entered the Chamber of Secrets. You forgot that we have an unbreakable vow. I will not break my oath, I just can't break it. Hearing the unbreakable vow, Dumbledore's expression relaxed a lot. Yes, we have an unbreakable vow. So did you see the basilisk? Under Dumbledore's gaze, Lucas shook his head negatively. I didn't see it. I just saw a ghost-like guy. Speaking of this, Lucas' expression became very puzzled. 
It seems that he is not sure whether what he saw was a person or a ghost. His performance made Dumbledore's doubts lessen. Before this conversation Dumbledore had already spoken to Harry, Ginny and Ron separately. From the mouths of the three, he probably sorted out the whole process. The reason he was asking Lucas now. One is to confirm the authenticity of what each of them said. The second is that Dumbledore found something suspicious. Harry said he had a fight with the basilisk, but both Ginny and Ron said they didn't see it. It's easy to explain why Ron didn't see it, after all, he didn't enter the real Chamber of Secrets. So Dumbledore wanted to ask. Also, his phoenix fox has been weak since he came back. Harry said he was hit by Voldemort with the killing curse twice in a row. This also needs to be verified. Professor. Hearing Lucas talk, Dumbledore smiled amiably. About that ghost, I heard Harry mention it, he said it was Voldemort, what do you think? I think it might be true. With that said, Lucas drew his wand. He wrote Tom Marvolo Riddle's name in the air, following Tom's example. Then he waved his hand very pretentiously and the letters in the air quickly separated and recombined. I am Lord Voldemort. The words appeared before Dumbledore's eyes in a moment. That's how the ghost identified itself, and I saw the crest of the House of Slytherin on his wizard robes. Lucas frowned when he finished speaking, it seems that there is something that he couldn't understand. Dumbledore didn't bother. Instead, he called a house elf to refill the black tea for Lucas. What's the matter? Seeing that you are frowning, don't you understand what it is? Lucas sighed, that's right, Professor, I just can't figure it out, is it possible that ghosts can also use magic? Did you see it? Facing Dumbledore's question, Lucas nodded without hesitation and replied, Yes. I saw Voldemort's ghost using the killing curse, and isn't Voldemort still alive? Why did that young man call himself Voldemort? Dumbledore stared at the blonde boy in front of him until he saw the doubt and confusion deep in the other party's eyes. The eyes are the windows of the soul, Dumbledore thought it was true. At least in the past few decades, he has detected from the eyes of too many people whether they are hiding something. My boy, think about Peeves, as a poltergeist he can play tricks everywhere, I don't think you have been hit by one of his water balloons. And that's Voldemort, the most powerful Dark Lord so far. We don't know how many tricks he has. Lucas let out a long breath, you are right, he's Voldemort. After finishing speaking, he looked at Fox at the desk. Headmaster, I really envy you for having a phoenix. The envy in his eyes was so strong that it couldn't be faked at all and Dumbledore was even more relieved when he saw it. Okay, now let's talk about delivering on promises. Dumbledore got up and went to his desk, he took a piece of parchment from under the black diary. This is your pass, as long as you have this, you can go to Hogsmeade and the Forbidden Forest unimpeded. But there is a premise, that is, you can't go after curfew, and this pass is only valid for you alone. Taking the parchment with both hands, Lucas looked very happy. Thank you, Professor, what's next? Seeing Lucas' eyes kept looking at his desk, Dumbledore fetched the Gryffindor sword with a smile. Lucas, this sword is a relic of Godric Gryffindor, one of the founders. The goblin who forged it has enchanted it, so it can only be mastered by those who are considered true Gryffindors. I may give you the sword of Gryffindor and promise never to take it back, but it is up to you to gain its approval. Dumbledore held the Gryffindor sword in both hands and solemnly handed it over to Lucas. Getting the Gryffindor sword Lucas was as happy as a child with a new toy. Dumbledore, who had been watching him, breathed a sigh of relief, but immediately afterwards, something magical happened. The Gryffindor sword slowly disappeared under the gaze of the two. Facing Lucas' astonished eyes, Dumbledore said regretfully, it seems that you are not recognized by the sword of Gryffindor. In fact, this naughty sword often disappears. Lucas couldn't believe this and went on to search around the whole office. Even Dumbledore's bedroom on the second floor was checked. Dumbledore didn't stop him either and just let Lucas turn his room into a mess. Finally, Lucas failed to find the missing Gryffindor sword. Helplessly accepting the reality, he looked very disappointed and Dumbledore said a few words of comfort. There were just some unimportant questions left so he didn't ask any more. Once Lucas left the office, the expression of loss and frustration on his face disappeared immediately. He was just doing it for Dumbledore to see. If Gryffindor did approve of him, that would be a miracle. In a blink of an eye, a week has passed. Today is the day when the test results are released. The familiar bulletin board was full of people early on. Hermione and Cho Chong followed Lucas with him walking in the middle. 
the three of them came to the bulletin board under the envious and jealous eyes of others. Cho Chong first wrote her name on it. Looking at the all-o results, Cho's face showed a beautiful smile. Her grades could improve so much it's all thanks to Lucas for tutoring her. Strange to say, since Lucas is obviously one year lower than Cho. But he knows a lot of knowledge so guiding her to do some homework is not difficult at all. Cho's grades made her the overall first place in the third year. The second to step forward was Hermione, the same all OS result once again aroused the envy and exclamation of everyone. Hermione looked back at Lucas with her eyes filled with complacency. Lucas just smiled and stepped forward to write his name. People around him were not even surprised by the all-o results that they took for granted. If one day Lucas's score does not reach O, everyone may be surprised. After all, a professor once said that Lucas' grades were perfect. He can only get an O because the highest scoring standard is O. Does this mean that the second years this time have two first places? When someone raised this issue everyone reacted. When the people around looked at where Lucas and the girls were, they had long since disappeared without a trace. Harry stood far away, watching what was happening in front of the bulletin board. He escaped the exam this time in the infirmary, so the bulletin board does not have his grades. He was feeling lucky at first, but he didn't know why when he looked at Cho Chong walking away side by side with Lucas, he immediately regretted that he hadn't taken the exams. Harry let out a long breath. At tonight's end of year feast, the house cup will be awarded. This school year, they didn't deduct too many points from Greyfinder and he didn't violate any ban by entering the Chamber of Secrets this time. Instead, he solved the school troubles and kept Hogwarts from being closed. Calculated in this way, it should be a matter of course for him to get some extra points. The House Cup, this time it must be our Greyfinders. Harry clenched his fists, looked at the three figures going away and said in a low voice. Chapter 133, End of the Year Feast Every year around this time there will be some people who are happy and some who are sad. But all the students wanted to enjoy their last day of school, so no matter what happens when they get home. At least the end of year feast should be enjoyable and relaxing. It's because of this that you won't see any sullen students at dinner. Lucas came with the two girls. As long as there is no class, the three are almost inseparable. Lucas, my parents would like to invite you to dinner at home during the summer vacation, to thank you for taking care of me during our trip to Paris last year. Lucas nodded without hesitation. Then he looked at Cho on the other side. At this time Cho was already wearing the banshee's tears around her neck. I, my parents, also invited you to dinner. That's right. Since I'm meeting with your parents, of course I can't favor one over another. I'll see you all during the summer vacation. Let's settle your affairs early. Cho was very shy when she heard these words. And Hermione gave Lucas a blank look, took Cho's hand and said, Cho, let's go, just ignore him. After finishing speaking, she dragged Cho towards the long table of Ravenclaw. Lucas shrugged, turned, and walked towards the Slytherin table. Slytherin and Gryffindor are enemies who don't like each other, but the two long tables in the Great Hall were close together again. Seeing Lucas coming, the Slytherins stood up consciously. This is a tribute to the chief of their house. Lucas smiled and walked gracefully to his seat and inadvertently looked at the Gryffindor long table. At a glance, he noticed that Ginny Weasley was looking at him. Lucas smiled and nodded at the redhead, which made the female Weasley extremely shy. After Lucas took his seat, the Slytherins just sat back in their seats. Looking at the vacant position on the teacher's table, Draco turned his head and said, Do you think Dumbledore will try the same as last year? When it comes to last year, the faces of the students at their table are not very good. Fortunately last year, there was Lucas who finally turned the tide. It was precisely because of Lucas' performance at the time that the other year chiefs decided to elect him as the chief of the house. It's because Lucas conquered everyone in Slytherin at the time. Don't worry, Dumbledore is not stupid, that kind of thing happening once is enough. Lucas hasn't answered yet when Pansy Parkinson was the first to answer that question. Everyone nodded after listening, thinking that what she said made sense. At this time, the fourth year chief Marcy Flint suddenly approached. I don't think so. Some people have been spreading the word recently that Potter killed the Basilisk and saved Hogwarts. Judging from the tone of those people, it seems that they think it would be unfair not to give them the House Cup. After Marcy finished speaking, she glanced at the Greyfinder table and everyone knew who she was talking about without asking. Like last year, the people of Greyfinder spread the great achievements of their golden boy everywhere. But it seems that there is no support from other houses. 
Don't worry, what happened last year will never happen again Lucas said firmly. Then he looked over his shoulder and there was a very small beetle lying there. He hoped that Harry would make a big fuss. It would be even better if he went and opened the chamber again to prove it. It's just that he didn't know that the appearance he saw in the chamber was far from what he remembered. None of that has anything to do with Lucas though. What he really wanted was a bargaining chip with Minister Fudge. And the bait that attracted Sirius and Lupin the werewolf. In fact, when he read the original books and movies Lucas had a question. Did Lupin just accept the position at Hogwarts only because he learned that Sirius escaped from prison? And did he really not know that Sirius was innocent before Harry showed him the Marauder's map? Coincidentally, Sirius escaped from prison, and Lupin was successfully hired as a professor of defense against the dark arts. And it's on the premise that all the professors are also aware of his werewolf identity. Lucas had to be suspicious. Perhaps Lupin and Sirius had met before entering Hogwarts. Now that the Marauder's map was in his hands, it was impossible for Lupin to detect Wormtail's presence through the map. Lucas wanted to see what the truth of the matter was. Clap clap. Before he knew it, the teacher's seat was full of people. Dumbledore clapped his hands, and the great hall immediately fell silent. Before the feast begins, let us applaud Professor Sprout and Madame Pomfrey. Thanks to them for cultivating mature mandrakes in time, and successfully administering the cure to the petrified people. Dumbledore had just finished speaking when there was warm applause in the room. Amidst the warm applause, the door of the Great Hall was suddenly opened and Hagrid's tall figure appeared in everyone's sight. Sorry, I'm late. Harry looked at Hagrid in surprise and immediately ran up to give him a hug. Harry, I'm proud of you. I've heard about your heroic deeds from Azkaban. Hagrid's praise made Harry feel very embarrassed. The young lions of Greyfinder's applause grew louder when Hagrid appeared. Dumbledore stood up again. It's the end of the school year again, and I think everyone is looking forward to it, isn't it? Seeing everyone looking at him expectantly, Dumbledore smiled kindly. Harry stretched his neck, holding his head high and seemed ready to receive the glory. Dumbledore whetted the appetite of the crowd. The house points for the four houses were then announced. In fourth place, Hufflepuff with 371 points. In third place, Ravenclaw with 398 points. In second place, Gryffindor with 447 points. And first place, Slytherin with 502 points. The Slytherins looked proudly at the people around them. While last year was Lucas's performance alone, this year's score is the effort of all the Slytherins. A high score of 500 points was rarely seen even in the past. Harry Potter looked at the Slytherin table calmly. It was the same last year so he is not in a hurry. Dumbledore's extra points must come later. Very well, everyone be quiet. Next, I announce that this year's House Cup has been won by Slytherin for the ninth consecutive time. Please applaud and congratulate them. There was warm applause from Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw. But Gryffindor fell silent and everyone turned to look at Harry, even Ron looked surprised. Harry, what's going on here? I, I don't know either. Before Harry could react, green and silver confetti floated down from the blue ceiling. Wait. Professor Dumbledore, please wait. Harry stood up abruptly shouting loudly to the teacher's table and the great hall suddenly became quiet. Noticing that everyone's eyes were on him, Harry looked around and swallowed nervously. Headmaster, don't you have anything else to announce? Dumbledore looked at the nervous child in the middle of the hall and the spirited blonde boy from last year suddenly appeared in his mind. After comparing the two, he sighed inwardly. Harry, I understand what you want to say but we found that there are many inconsistencies in the process described by the few of you. Inconsistencies. Harry turned to look at Ron and Ginny, seeming to be asking what they had said to Dumbledore. In an instant, the people in the room focused their eyes on the two of them. Ron looked left and right and said nervously, Harry, I was waiting for you at the entrance pipe, so I didn't see any basilisk. Then you should have heard the voice too. Harry reminded. Ron hesitated for a few seconds, but I didn't hear anything. Harry shook his head, then looked at Ginny Weasley on the other side. Ginny said bluntly, I just remember how I got in. Then I didn't know anything, and when I woke up from the coma, I saw you and Lucas Grindelwald. Bringing up Lucas, Harry hurriedly turned to look at the other party. At this moment, the desperate Harry actually pinned all his hopes on Lucas. But when he saw the apology in Lucas' eyes, his heart suddenly felt cold. I'm sorry Harry, but when I went in to find you I didn't see any basilisk. Of course, 
maybe it was there before I went in, maybe it got away, didn't it? The students were not stupid. They heard that Lucas seemed to be trying to help back Harry Potter with the matter of the basilisk. But Harry didn't seem to appreciate it. No. It doesn't make any sense, that basilisk was about 50 meters long. I pierced its brain with the sword of Greyfinder, and I also destroyed Voldemort's diary. Harry told everything he had been through and even said Voldemort's name. This made a lot of people in the Great Hall show expressions of fear. Looking at Harry who was getting more and more flustered, Dumbledore frowned. He doesn't know what happened to the child in front of him, but now is not the time to study these things. Harry, calm down. Dumbledore's loud voice rang in Harry's ears and he gradually became calmer. Seeing that everyone doesn't believe in him, Harry whispered, Professor, I can prove it. Let's just open the Chamber of Secrets and go in to take a look. Hearing Harry's words, Professor Snape's eyes lit up. He coveted the corpse of the basilisk but he had thought he had no chance. Unexpectedly, Merlin brought this rare opportunity to him again. Headmaster, I think that what Mr. Potter said is somewhat reasonable, and I agree to enter the Chamber of Secrets. Professor Snape had just finished speaking and Professor McGonagall also nodded. Since this matter has become like this today, if they don't enter the chamber, it may not be easy to solve. Dumbledore saw that the other professors had no objections either so he led everyone to the bathroom on the second floor. Under everyone's gaze Harry used parcel tongue to open the Chamber of Secrets again. Several professors looked at each other and slid down the rope one by one. As one of the parties involved, Lucas, Ginny and Ron also followed. At the same time, the prefects of each house also entered the Chamber of Secrets as witnesses. Chapter 134, Is the Boy Who Lived Lying? Nothing has changed underneath the lengthy plumbing. As Lucas slid down, the professors were already watching for traces of spells nearby. Professor Sprout looked at the bones on the ground with emotion. Professor Ketleban would be very sad if he saw this. I don't think Ketleban should have this kind of trouble now. He will retire during the summer vacation, and he can live quietly with his pets in the future. Hearing what Dumbledore said, the professors present breathed a sigh of relief. This shows how much everyone fears Professor Ketleban. After all, there's always a co-worker with dangerous creatures at work. And Ketleban has an horrendous track record, with no less than 62 periods of probation that no one understands how he survived them without getting fired. The only reason he's probably retiring is that he has only an arm and half a leg left of his limbs. There's even a bed with his name in the hospital wing because of how often he gets injured by magical creatures. Professor Dumbledore, please come this way. Professor Flitwick stands in front of a pile of rubble. He picked out a few broken stones with his magic wand and placed them in front of everyone. Judging from the traces, it is indeed an exploding charm, and it was cast very skillfully. Judging from the traces of the gravel, all the stones flew out. As a charm's Professor Flitwick's words are authoritative. Several professors looked towards where Lucas and the others were standing. Professor Flitwick even praised without hesitation, Mr. Grindelwald, I am amazed by your talent for magic spells. Please come to my office if you have time in the next school year. We should have a lot of common language. Thank you, Professor. Lucas never misses an opportunity to learn. Even if he now has Rowena's library and Salazar's laboratory, he will not be so arrogant as to think that he's invincible. Instead, talking more with these well-learned professors can be beneficial and their experience in the application of spells would be of great help to Lucas. When Harry saw the professors studying endlessly a few broken stones he started getting anxious. Professor Dumbledore, in front of you. Go further and you will reach the real Chamber of Secrets. Oh well, let's go and have a look, Harry, don't worry. Dumbledore walked slowly down the road as the professors followed behind him. Seeing this, Harry ran to the front, pointed to the corner and said. See what's ahead and you'll believe what I say. What's up ahead, Harry? Dumbledore just played along, he had obviously learned from Lucas and others that there is a shed skin of a basilisk there. He just deliberately pretended not to know. It's a snake skin, the skin of a basilisk. Harry had just finished speaking when Lucas felt that Professor Snape became short of breath beside him. Turning his head to look, he saw that the potions professor's eyes were much wider than usual. Really, for potions masters like Professor Snape it is impossible to resist the charm of a basilisk shed skin. When the skin appeared in front of everyone, Professor Snape's unique, deep voice rang out in this subterranean space. Hands off, nobody touches it, and I mean nobody. Although the way he speaks is the same as before. 
Lucas could still hear the urgency in his tone. Dumbledore didn't seem surprised. Severus, I will give you this snakeskin, but you need to tell us its size and year before receiving it. Professor Snape chose not to speak but answer with action. Lucas stared dumbfounded at his head of house taking out one tool after another from his pocket. Professor Snape has already made preparations long before coming. 20 meters. Putting away the measuring tool in his hand, Professor Snape looked at Harry questioningly. Seeing that he intended to explain, Snape raised his hand to stop and said, Don't worry, I still haven't checked its age. After finishing speaking, Professor Snape took out an exquisite crystal bottle and carefully cut off a piece of snake skin with a knife. He looked distressed as the skin merged with the liquid in the bottle, the result of the year test will be available in a short while. Probably between four and five hundred years. Putting away the crystal bottle, Professor Snape added, Suppose the basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets is really left by Salazar Slytherin. Then this skin shed must have been here for hundreds of years, besides, I remember very clearly that Mr. Potter said just now that the basilisk was about 50 meters long. All eyes turned to Harry who nodded subconsciously. That's right, the basilisk was 50 meters long, and it could swallow me whole with its mouth open. Professor Snape said nothing more. Instead, he called Lucas who was watching the show. Mr. Grindelwald, now collect this skin with me. Be careful, if one part is damaged, you will have to write an extra 10 inches of potion papers during the summer vacation. Professor Snape was blatantly threatening his students, but this just shows how much he treasures this basilisk skin. The professors all stood in place and waited for the two to collect the skin. It's not that they don't want to move on, and not because they promote workplace camaraderie either. It was because when they moved, Professor Snape's cold eyes would immediately look at them in warning. Dumbledore reassured the anxious Harry and the prefects retreated far away to chat. This short exploration can be described as an eye-opener. They did not expect that there would really be such a large space underground in Hogwarts. Okay, we can continue to advance. It took 40 minutes before Professor Snape finished and allowed them to move. Everyone couldn't wait to walk to the real Chamber of Secrets. The circular door to the basilisk's lair was tightly shut and under everyone's gaze, Harry opened it again using parcel tongue. Parcel tongue sounds eerie normally, but it sounds even more creepy with the surrounding environment. Fortunately, Harry only said a short sentence. Accompanied by the circular door opening, everyone finally saw the true face of the Slytherin chamber. Whoa, don't tell me this is Salazar Slytherin. Gemma Farley as Slytherin's prefect frowned looking at the huge and ugly statue in front of her. Originally, she thought that the portrait in the common room was deliberately made to look uglier. But now she had to accept the fact that the real Salazar Slytherin seemed a far cry from what she had imagined. Ahem. Hearing Lucas coughing in front of her, Gemma quickly put away the disgust on her face. Mr. Potter, where is the basilisk? Professor Snape's voice came from ahead. The environment of the secret room is clear at a glance, and there are no basilisks at all so he felt cheated. Take it easy, Severus. Dumbledore comforted his right-hand man to prevent him from going on a rampage. Waiting until Professor Snape calmed down, he said to Harry, Harry, can you tell us about your battle with the basilisk that day? No problem. Professor. Harry led everyone back to the door of the Chamber of Secrets, then walked in through the pipe on the side. I hid here at the time, because Fox helped by pecking the eyes of the basilisk blind, so I was not killed by it. Speaking of the phoenix fox, Harry's expression was a little sad. If I was stronger, Fox wouldn't have been hit by Voldemort's killing curse when he was fighting the basilisk. It's not your fault my boy. Dumbledore comforted his savior boy then followed the professors to observe the surrounding traces. Right now the professors seem to be experts in trace science, trying to restore the scene at that time. Soon, they frowned and walked back. They looked at each other and shook their heads at the same time. Professor Snape's expression was even worse. Potter, you said that the basilisk entered this pipe, but there is not even half a scale here. Professor Sprout also frowned and said, it's impossible for a 50-meter snake to leave no traces on the ground. She looked at Harry with increasingly questioning eyes. From when they entered the secret room, there were too many flaws. Professor Flitwick nodded, from the statue to this point, there are absolutely no traces of battle. Seeing everyone looking at him with distrust, Harry panicked for a moment. He turned to look at Dumbledore in bewilderment, hoping the headmaster could believe in himself. Harry, are you sure the basilisk came? Seeing Harry nod his head affirmatively, Dumbledore said softly, go ahead then. 
Following the explanation of Harry, more and more doubts were pilling. Several prefects looked at Harry more strangely as time passed which made Harry start to stutter when he was talking. This also increased the suspicion of others, until everyone returned to the statue. Then here, I hid in the statue's mouth and found that there was actually a lot of space inside. I took cover above the entrance, and when the basilisk entered unsuspectingly, I pierced it through the brain with the sword of Greyfinder. Harry finished telling the process in his memory and everyone in the Chamber of Secrets looked at Dumbledore, waiting for his attention. Professor Snape's eyes grew impatient, looking to be not a little disappointed. Headmaster, how long are we going to play with this arrogant Potter? He is just like his father. He let out a sneer when he finished. Dumbledore paid no attention to anyone but went to Harry with a serious expression, My boy, stand still, this won't hurt you. After all, Dumbledore took out the Elder Wand, which symbolized strength. The fact he's using this wand means that he's being serious. Legilimens. The tip of the Elder Wand glowed with a white light. Lucas slowly clenched his hands behind his back to prevent others from seeing the sweat on his palms. He knew it was a matter of success or failure. If Dumbledore restores Harry's memory, everything he has done will be in vain, and he will even be branded as a dark wizard and kicked out of the British magic world. Chapter 135, Professor Trelawney Makes a Prophecy The professors are very experienced. Seeing Dumbledore cast that spell, it was immediately clear what he was going to do. Professor Snape looked at the old man and let out a cold snort of disdain. In the whole room, the Weasley siblings were probably the only ones who didn't understand what Dumbledore was doing. Percy, why did Dumbledore cast a spell on Harry? Percy looked at the curious younger siblings, and explained to them in a low voice. The magic used by the headmaster is called legilimency, which can be used to check people's memories, he's probably checking if Harry's memories were modified and maybe try to fix them. Ron frowned and looked at Lucas in the distance. It must be him, he is the only one who can modify Harry's memory. Ginny Weasley followed her brother's line of sight and discovered that he was talking about Lucas Grindelwald. Her face immediately became unhappy. At this time the light from Dumbledore's wand disappeared. Everyone looked at Harry, wanting to see if something changed. Only Lucas breathed a sigh of relief in his heart. Although he is very confident in his memory charm, this was Dumbledore with the Elder Wand we're talking about. It is difficult to guarantee that his spell will not be broken by the opponent. However, Dumbledore might have been worried that being too forceful with his legilimency could affect Harry's mind. Or he has absolute confidence in his own skill, so he actually just used it for a few seconds before withdrawing the magic power. Harry, do you remember anything? The Savior student blinked, I seem to have a dream. Hearing these words, Dumbledore's eyes lit up. What did you dream about? I seem to have had another fight with the basilisk in my dream. The result. Dumbledore stared at the boy in front of him. The same goes for everyone else. The result? With the Greyfinder sword in my hand, I pierced the basilisk's head. After Harry's words, Lucas completely relaxed, it seems that this hurdle is over. Professor Snape withdrew the tension in his eyes and gave the two a contemptuous glance. Headmaster, how long do we have to delay? There are still many people waiting for us outside. Except Professor McGonagall, the other professors also nodded. Things are very clear so the professors looked at Harry with complicated eyes. Dumbledore, I think we should go back. Professor Flitwick's words woke Dumbledore up. He looked at the helpless Harry in front of him, raised his hand and cast legilimency on him again. Dumbledore, you. Professor McGonagall wanted to stop him, but the headmaster was too fast. The mighty old bee read Harry's memory almost instantly. He sighed, looked at Harry and said, Can you show us that basilisk? Harry nodded hastily and followed the example of Tom Riddle to open the entrance inside the statue. Just when everyone was about to climb in along the hole, Professor Sybil Trelawney suddenly stopped in place and began to shiver. Professor, what's wrong with you? Hearing Percy Weasley's voice, the professors all looked at Trelawney and understood what was going on at a glance. Don't disturb Professor Trelawney. She seems to have seen something, let us wait quietly. Dumbledore stopped the prefects who wanted to help. The crowd quietly formed a circle, with Trelawney protected in the middle. Lucas felt very helpless, he just came out of one trouble, is it possible this will bring another trouble for him? When Professor Trelawney makes a prophecy it is nothing good. It must be the same at this time. Lucas worried that she might tell a prophecy about himself. Then, he stared at the divination professor with both eyes 
and opened the Eye of Foresight at the same time. He intends to rely on the ability of divination after awakening to see if he can use Professor Trelawney as a medium to see the prophecy that she's seeing. The Dark Lord is about to return, he will be hit like never before. A new leader is about to emerge, he will bring eternal light to the magic world. Professor Trelawney's prediction this time was very accurate, but also very vague. Dumbledore took out a prophecy ball and recorded the prophecy just now. Then he thought about the content of the prophecy with a solemn expression. Dumbledore was not surprised that Voldemort would return, he had even expected this day. But who is this new leader? He looked at Harry beside him, as did the other professors. Combined with Trelawney's last prophecy, a formidable foe marked by the Dark Lord himself. Apparently referring to Harry Potter, so is this new leader referring to him? It wasn't just Dumbledore and the professors who thought so at the moment. Even Harry himself thought so. As the man who defeated Voldemort, who better to be the leader? In the crowd, the light in Lucas' eyes slowly faded, then he looked at Dumbledore and Harry with some amusement. The reason for this is because he saw the appearance of the new leader in the prophecy just now. It seems my future plans are going well. Lucas put the smile back on his face and put on the same curious expression as everyone else. Okay, don't spread this matter, let's continue to look down. Professor Hooch, please take Professor Trelawney to the infirmary, she looks too tired. Professor Hooch nodded and helped Trelawney walk out. Others climbed into the statue's large mouth, led by Harry. It seems that because of hearing the prophecy Harry felt confident again. But when he brought everyone to the huge snake bones. Everyone froze in place. Impossible, how did it become like this so quickly? The others were not in a daze at this time, Professor Snape stepped forward and took out the previous tool again. It's just that he just touched the skeleton of the basilisk he found that the bones had been weathered into disrepair, and they would be shattered into slag with just a little force. This made Professor Snape's expression even uglier, because this means that the snake bone has completely lost its value and can no longer be used to make potions. Simply measuring the skeleton length, Professor Snape gave Harry a cold look. According to preliminary measurements, the skeleton is about 25 meters long, just a bit bigger than the skin outside so it matches. Judging from the decomposing state of the bones, it may have been dead for hundreds of years, so there is no basilisk in this secret room at all. Humph, some people are exactly like their father, arrogant and only good at bragging, now they even dare to play tricks on their own professor. Dumbledore, I'm going back first, I don't have time to waste time here with you and the boy who lived. When they saw Professor Snape striding away, several other professors sighed and followed. Harry looked at the snake bones in front of him, and whispered in his mouth, Impossible. Why did it become like this? He seemed unable to accept such a result. Dumbledore sighed and patted Harry on the shoulder. Okay Harry, let's leave first. Professor, I'm not lying, there was really a basilisk here. Calm down Harry, I believe you are not lying, let's leave first, and then slowly think about what went wrong when we go back. Dumbledore walked towards the cave entrance with his arms around Harry's shoulders. Before leaving, he looked back at the empty and spacious cave behind him. Judging by his appearance, it seems that he still has some doubts about this. Everyone returned the same way, with Harry and Dumbledore being the last to climb out of the pipe. The students all looked at the professors curiously. Someone asked the prefects just now, but they didn't say anything. But it can be seen from their face that the results seemed to be bad for Harry Potter. Okay, let's go back to the Great Hall now, don't continue to delay things. Looking at the slowly closing entrance of the secret room behind him, Dumbledore made his way to the Great Hall first. When they were finally back at the Great Hall, neither Dumbledore nor the professors said anything more about the Chamber of Secrets. However, the House Cup was still awarded to Slytherin, which seemed to be enough to explain everything. The eyes of the students of the four houses became more and more strange as they looked at the silent Harry Potter with his head down. The end-of-year feast ended in such a weird atmosphere. Returning to the Slytherin common room, the snakes naturally wanted to celebrate. For this honor, everyone in Slytherin has a share. The chief is here, everyone quiet. The noisy room gradually calmed down. They all looked at the blonde boy on the steps with high spirits, waiting for him to praise them. Not bad, continue the same next year. Although it was only a simple sentence, it was enough to keep the Slytherins happy. Quiet. Lucas' voice rang again. When the room was quiet again, his eyes swept over everyone. At the beginning of this school year, I told you to learn the patroness charm, now unleash your patronuses. 
the cheerful atmosphere suddenly became dull. Under the leadership of their year chief, the students of the seventh year began to cast the patroness charm. Lucas wasn't worried about the seniors, it was mainly the little snakes in the first and second years that worried him. The performance of the second year students was relatively good, and most of them can achieve the white mist. The only ones unable to successfully cast the patroness charm were those idiots Crab and Goyle. As for the little first ties, the situation is not optimistic. Very good, please practice more during the summer vacation. Lucas is very satisfied with the result and after telling everyone not to play too late, he turned and went back to his room. Just as he locked the door, he heard the sound of something heavy falling behind him. At the same time, Medusa's voice came to his mind. Lucas, I want to eat a hare, a very fat wild hare. Looking at Medusa rolling on the ground, Lucas said helplessly, why don't you hunt yourself in the garden? Uh. I just made some new friends and I'm worried about scaring them, Lucas, give me the hare. I want hares, fat, very fat hares. Medusa's tail whipped around, making a mess of Lucas' room. He was right in his judgment, Medusa the basilisk is just a little girl. Okay, I'll get someone to prepare it later, can you go back to the garden first? Really? Seeing that Lucas nodded seriously, Medusa calmed down. Accompanied by a twist in the air, Lucas sent her back to the secret garden. Immediately afterwards he closed his eyes, and it took a full minute before the void in front of him was torn apart. Lucas took a deep breath and stepped into it. As he emerged from the chasm at the other end. Immediately, a system prompt sounded in his ears. Ding, congratulations to the host for completing a new achievement, explore Godric Greyfinder's treasure room, get a reward, 500 achievement points. Chapter 136, Godric's Treasure Room Detected the host completed a new achievement, explore Greyfinder House, reward, 2000 achievement points. Detected that the host has completed a new achievement, explore Hogwarts, reward, 5000 achievement points. The host has been detected to complete a series of achievements, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, rewards, 1 diamond lottery chance, 500 achievement points. The sound of the system is so wonderful, a total of 8,000 achievement points and a diamond lottery. It made Lucas feel that this year's efforts have not been in vain. After a brief moment of excitement he forced himself to calm down. Godric's treasure room, this Greyfinder secret room, was finally found by him. Looking around, the not-so-large room was filled with all kinds of medieval weapons and equipment. Whether it is a cross sword or a kite shield, or even a knight armor, Lucas can feel the powerful magic in them. No wonder it is called the treasure room, every alchemy item here is an incredibly rare treasure. Lucas began his tour along one side of the wall. Every time he passed an alchemy item, he had to carefully observe and study it. For example, the longbow in his hand at the moment, it was also a weapon made by a goblin and endowed with magical abilities. If you don't have magic power, then the string can't be pulled no matter how hard you try. If you are a wizard, even a toddler can draw the bow with ease. And this bow is also imbued with the ability of precision and increased distance, it can help the arrow fly farther and shoot more accurately. Putting down the longbow in his hand Lucas picked up a metal short stick that looked like a flute. The stick was hollow with a tiny button on one end. For some unknown reason, Lucas pointed his stick at the other end of the room. As the button was pressed, the roar and the terrible fire breath of a dragon spewed out from the short stick. Putting down the stick in his hand, Lucas let out a long breath. The equipment here is enough for him to arm an elite team of dozens of people. In addition to these weapons he also saw dozens of pendants with stones carved into amulets. These small stones like a necklace can resist the strongest curse. This is simply a treasure trove. Lucas looked at the Greyfinder sword leaning against a suit of armor. As he guessed, every time this mischievous sword disappears, it must return to Godric's secret room. So when he got it, Lucas placed a space mark on the sword. That day in the headmaster's office, seeing it disappear from his hands he almost cheered. Taking the sword in his hand again, he could feel the magic in the sword that belonged to the goblin who made it. Lucas smiled slightly, and immediately drew an alchemy formation on the ground. Accompanied by the alchemy array, a golden light burst out and the enchantments within Greyfinder's sword were changing rapidly. Nearly half an hour passed and Lucas threw a drop of his own blood into the formation. The radiance of the alchemy array radiated so much that the entire treasure room was dyed gold. Soon, the light disappeared and the alchemy array returned to its original appearance. The Greyfinder sword was still the same, looking as if nothing had changed, but as Lucas lightly clenched his fist, 
the sword magically appeared in his hand. From then on, this sword symbolizing courage can only be used by Lucas and those he approves of. By exploring Godric's treasury he once again confirmed his conjecture. Sure enough, the secret rooms of the founders were all located close to their own houses. The entrance to the treasure room is in the Greyfinder common room. Lucas even heard the lion cubs discussing outside the entrance, they still seemed to be discussing the matter of Harry. Some people were even mocking the poor savior. After listening in for a while he raised his wand and cast a powerful confusion and protection spell on the entrance and exit. Godric is worthy of being the founder of Greyfinder, his secret room was actually very poorly protected. Fortunately, the students of his house didn't know that he had a secret room, otherwise they would have found it a long time ago. It was already late at night when Lucas returned to his room. Stretching his waist, he was in a very good mood looking at the series of achievements he had just completed. He took out a bottle of Felix Felicis, drank it in one gulp and taking advantage of the effect of the potion, he said to the system, Now, use the diamond lottery immediately. The colorful prize pool appeared again, looking the same as last time he used it. There were so many prizes in the prize pool that it was almost overflowing. After three or four seconds, a diamond-like light flew out of the prize pool. Immediately afterwards, a system prompt sounded in his ears. This lottery draw is over, congratulations to the host for getting a diamond reward, super magic anti-magic. Anti-magic? Lucas remembered a certain anime he had seen in his previous life where the protagonist seemed to have a similar ability. But once he finished receiving the anti-magic skill, he found that his own ability was different from that of the anime protagonist. The most important is that his anti-magic is not permanent and he can mobilize it to attack at will. Lucas raised his hand and made a fist, and the sword of Greyfinder appeared in his hand. Infusing the sword with the power of anti-magic, the sword's blade blazed with a black-colored magic. Goblin weapons, anti-magic, and elf combat skills, how did I change from a mage to a warrior? Lucas was wondering, and suddenly felt a tightness in his chest. Seeing the disappearing anti-magic power on the blade, he muttered to himself. This is troublesome. The anti-magic conflicts with my own magic power so it can only be turned on for 10 seconds at most, otherwise it will hurt me. After a break he looked back at the Greyfinder sword in his hand. After careful consideration, he injected anti-magic power into the sword, but this time he didn't stop with a little injection. Instead, he injected a full 10 seconds. Looking at the sword of Greyfinder wrapped in black magic power, Lucas thrust it hard into the ground. The Slytherins who were having a party in the common room suddenly found that their magic power could not be mobilized. The magical power that was active in the body in the past seems to have turned into a pool of stagnant water at this moment which made them terrified. It wasn't until ten minutes later that this feeling disappeared. Lucas put away the Greyfinder sword and was very satisfied with this test. Ten minutes is way better than ten seconds. And the Greyfinder sword, infused with anti-magic power, has completely become a forbidden magic domain. In the future, with Lucas holding a goblin sword in each hand. With his elf combat skills, what is the difference between rushing into a group of wizards with a wolf rushing into a group of sheep? The difference is that he would slaughter them way faster than the wolf could with the sheep. The following morning, the students have already boarded the Hogwarts Express to return home. Lucas, Hermione, and Cho were sitting in the last compartment of the last carriage. The two women were busy talking about beauty potions. Even at such a young age they already care so much for their appearance. Lucas tried speaking several times, but was pushed aside by the two girls and had no choice but to look out the window. This summer vacation will not be easy for him. First of all, he promised Mrs. Black and Kriaker that he would complete their deal. Members of the Saints group have found the hidden cave and are guarding it closely. Secondly, he planned to have a good chat with Professor Snape during the summer vacation. Thinking of the ancient black magic records and Salazar's research notes, he is full of confidence in this conversation. But before that, Lucas needed to talk to Minister Fudge first. In his hand, there is a photo of the Chamber of Secrets that the distressed minister needs very much at the moment. I just don't know what kind of good price Minister Fudge will offer. Lucas, what are you thinking of? I wasn't thinking about anything, anyway, you don't care about me. The two girls looked at each other smiled and came to sit beside him. They had agreed to officially start dating the following year, but a little advance wouldn't hurt. He saw the two staring at him from left and right and raised an eyebrow. And what are you girls planning? Oh screw it. Hermione patted him on the shoulder lightly. Suddenly she leaned close and kissed him on the left cheek. At the same time, the same feeling came from the right cheek. 
Don't forget that when you meet our parents during the summer vacation, we must behave well, handsome sir. Looking at them, he noticed there was a trace of apprehension in the eyes of the two girls. Lucas said with a smile, Don't worry, you will never escape in this life. Then he thought in his mind you already belong to me. The first day of summer vacation, Lucas wrote back letters to the two girls respectively to make an appointment to meet their parents. Then, wearing a fancy wizard robe, he brought Vinder Rosier to the British Ministry of Magic. Since it's not the first time Lucas has come, he arrived at the minister's office on the first basement floor with ease. Being led by Pine Carroll he successfully met the Minister of Magic, Cornelius Fudge. Minister Fudge seems troubled. After a long time not seeing him, Fudge seems to have gained a lot of grey hairs. When he saw Lucas coming, Fudge smiled wryly and shook his head, Mr. Grindelwald, what are you here for? Lucas turned to look at Vinda and she immediately took out a small key and put it on Fudge's desk. Looking at the key in front of himself, if Fudge is right, this should be the key to a Gringotts vault. You seem surprised? Have you forgotten? Fudge slapped his forehead. Recently, because of Hogwarts, he has been very busy. He completely forgot about their previous deal. You keep this key, and we will help you store the dividends every year in the vault. Because it just opened this year, the business is not too good, only 50,000 galleons, I hope Minister Fudge doesn't mind. No, I don't mind, how could it be? Fudge was startled, he didn't expect that there would be as much as 50,000 galleons. He carefully put away the key, then looked at the boy opposite and asked. Mr. Grindelwald's visit this time may not be as simple as just handing over a key. Lucas said with a smile, nothing can be hidden from your eyes, Minister. Sure enough, the magic world will only get better and better under your leadership. I learned that the Minister has encountered some troubles, so I came here to help you. After saying that, Lucas put an envelope on the table. Inside this letter is Rita Skeeter's magical photo of the Chamber of Secrets. Chapter 137, The Boy Who Lied Minister Fudge glanced at the envelope and opened it with a smile. Let me see what surprises Mr. Grindelwald has in store. Maybe it was because of the extra 50,000 galleons, but Fudge already changed his frown just now and his mood became very good. However, once he took out the photos in the envelope, the smile on his face gradually faded and his expression became incredulous. These. The photos of the Hogwarts Chamber of Secrets, Minister Fudge should be in great need of these, right? Is Rita Skeeter your person? Fudge looked at the boy in front of him with a serious expression, but there was also a hint of fear and anger in his eyes. Seeing him like this, Lucas smiled and shook his head, you seem to have misunderstood something, I bought these from Rita Skeeter for a lot of money. She was about to sell the pictures for a good price when my people found her. It's fine if the newspaper buys it, but if your opponents buy it, the minister might be in big trouble. Lucas finished speaking and the office became quiet. Fudge flipped through the photos in his hand and found that there are notes behind each photo. After reading these remarks, he also learned about the situation in the secret room. I'm so sorry, Mr. Grindelwald, please forgive my recklessness. The smile reappeared on Fudge's face. After apologizing, he put the photos back into the envelope and planned to put it away. But a hand suddenly appeared and pressed the envelope under the palm of their hand. Fudge glanced at Vinder Rosier beside him then turned his gaze to the blonde boy on the opposite side. Mr. Grindelwald, what do you mean? Minister Fudge, I do intend to hand you these photographs, but I would also like you to do me a little favor. I think the minister should not refuse, after all, I spent a lot of money to buy these photos. Fudge's heart sank, and he frowned and asked, a little favor? What's the favor? It's just a small matter for you. Lucas put down the teacup in his hand took a paper bag from Vinda and took out a few documents inside then handed them over. I have some friends who are down to earth and hard working. I hope you can accommodate me and help them find a few positions in the Ministry of Magic. Fudge made a rough calculation, the information in hand is not just as simple as just a few friends. He's afraid there are as many as a dozen friends. Isn't that too much, and I have no right to place people into jobs at the Ministry of Magic. Minister Fudge must be joking, don't worry. I don't ask for any important departments, have you seen the three documents at the top? Seeing Fudge nod, Lucas continued, I would like to ask you to arrange for these three people to enter the International Magical Cooperation Department, the Magical Transportation Department, and the Magical Sports Department. As for the others, you can just give them any job, how about that? 
Fudge didn't immediately agree and it could be seen from his frown that this little favor seemed to be giving him a headache. Lucas gave him a few minutes to think about it. When the time came, he spoke again, Minister Fudge, think about those photos, they can help you get out of your current situation. Besides, my three friends going to these departments is also good for our business. You also know that some of our business is related to them. If there are some friends in these departments, it would be beneficial, right? By the way, I also heard that the 422nd Quidditch World Cup next year will be hosted by us in England. The Saints Investment Group can sponsor some galleons, but we need to obtain the right to operate the port keys. Minister, this is a good opportunity to make a fortune. If we have the help of people from these departments, we can make a lot of money. Fudge was silent for a long time. The fact he can become the Minister of Magic shows that he's not a complete idiot. But with 50,000 galleons and those photographs as an incentive, he was already a little shaken. He also thought that those were just unimportant departments and as long as Lucas isn't placing people in the law enforcement division and the Wisengamot, he wouldn't have much to worry about. Pine. Pine Caro pushed open the door and walked in. Minister, are you looking for me? Enter the information of these people in the Ministry of Magic Staff Directory, and then notify them to come to work next week. Taking the information in Fudge's hand, Pine Carroll respectfully exited the room. Seeing this, Lucas motioned to Vinda and she also let go of the envelope that had been pressed. Minister, happy cooperation. Lucas raised the teacup and cheers to the minister. Fudge also gave a relaxed smile. Grindelwald Manor, Wiltshire. Lucas sat in the garden and looked at the ancient black magic records brought back from Rowena's library. The more he studies, the more he discovers the magical charm of the dark arts. It's no wonder old Grindelwald was so obsessed with studying them back then. Cuckoo. Hestia flapped her wings and flew from the sky. She was away for a long time this time. After returning, she dropped the envelope and got into her own den. This is a letter from Nurmengard. Looking at the contents of his father's letter Lucas showed a knowing expression. Who in the world knows Dumbledore best? That was undoubtedly Gellert Grindelwald who was facing the wall inside Nurmengard's Snow Mountain Castle. The two understand each other even more than their respective relatives. With this letter, the chances of convincing Professor Snape are greater. Keeping the envelope close to his body, Lucas got up and walked towards Malfoy Manor. At this time, Draco was having afternoon tea in the garden with his mother, Narcissa Malfoy. As he saw him coming, Draco immediately got up and greeted him. Father is in the study, he has been waiting for you for a long time. The two embraced briefly, and Draco took Lucas to the study. The guy hadn't stopped complaining since he knew Lucas had gone to the Ministry of Magic yesterday. Fortunately, the study room is not far away. Bang! Looking at the closed door in front of him, Draco looked very helpless. It's not known when he'll be able to join his father and Lucas in their conversations. In the study, Lucius Malfoy was busy flipping through today's daily profit. He's been in a bad mood these days, but upon reading today's report his mood improved a lot. Sit down, Lucas. The two went to sit on the sofa and the house elf offered tea consciously, looking nervously at them. Lucas glanced at Dobby who was shivering beside him, curious as to why the Malfoys kept him. What's wrong with this elf? Seeing Mr. Malfoy's questioning eyes, Lucas guessed that Draco must have been hiding what Dobby had done. What a kind boy. It's nothing, I came today to talk to you about the dividends, and I also want to ask Uncle Lucius to help me hand over Mrs. Zabani's share to her. Bringing up dividends, the smile grew wider on Lucius Malfoy's face. He didn't expect that the business of those fifteen shops would be so good, and this is still the result of several people sharing profits. Don't forget, there are three other properties in Nocturne Alley. Of those three places, only Grindelwald and Malfoy were involved. Don't worry. Leave everything to me, I didn't expect to earn so much money in just one year. Thanks to your business philosophy, it's no wonder you can manage a group as big as the Saints group at such a young age. I will have to trouble you to help Draco more in the future, although that child has matured a lot, most of the time his thinking is still very naive. And he and the savior, Mr. Potter. Lucius Malfoy didn't finish though, but Lucas already understood his concerns. The Malfoy family used to be Voldemort's most loyal subordinates and one day, if Voldemort returns and discovers Draco's friendship with Harry Potter, the snake-faced man might lose his mind and probably throw a killing curse to Draco on the spot. Don't worry, I understand your concerns. Responding to Lucius in a flat tone, the two naturally diverted the topic elsewhere. 
I heard that you arranged a lot of people to enter the Ministry of Magic this time. Facing Mr. Malfoy's inquiry, Lucas didn't hide it. He knew he couldn't hide it from these pure blood families. These people who have few eyeliners in the Ministry of Magic. That's right, I just arranged some idle jobs. In addition, three people were placed in the International Magic Cooperation Department, the Transportation Department and the Sports Department. Next year's Quidditch World Cup will be held in England. This is a business opportunity so I need to arrange it in advance. Lucius Malfoy nodded, that's right, every time the World Cup is held, businessmen can make a lot of money. Immediately afterwards, Mr. Malfoy expressed cryptically that Lucas can use his contacts in the Ministry of Magic, but there is a price to pay. The two briefly exchanged views on the Ministry of Magic and then the topic turned to today's newspaper. Did you read today's Daily Prophet? Lucas asked knowingly. When he came in just now, Lucius was still holding it in his hand. Of course, what a joy, I didn't expect Minister Fudge to have such abilities. This can be regarded as a big relief for me. Dumbledore caused me to lose my position as a school governor. I will have to return this hatred sooner or later. Today's Daily Prophet front page headlines were, Harry Potter, The Boy Who Lied. Although the reporter who wrote the article was not as sharp as Rita Skeeter, his guiding of the masses was done well enough. The reporter published the photos of the Chamber of Secrets in order and added descriptions for each photo. Letting the majority of wizards understand what he wants to express simply and clearly. If ordinary children do such a bragging thing the public will only take it as a joke, and forget it after a light smile. But Harry Potter was different, he was the boy who lived that defeated the Dark Lord. Since more than ten years ago, the wizarding world has been promoting his great achievements. Such a celebrity that can even be said to be the savior of magical Britain shouldn't be a liar. Especially the points mentioned in the article. Is the child chosen by Dumbledore really the savior? The boy who lived? Maybe just the boy who lied. Why does a young child become a hero? Because he has great parents. No matter which point of view, they all seem to be questioning Harry Potter's identity. But anyone with a discerning eye can actually see that this newspaper is actually questioning Dumbledore. Because more than ten years ago, after the Dark Lord was eliminated, he announced the existence of Harry Potter. It was he who hid Harry the Savior Potter and didn't let him return to the Wizarding World until last year. For so many years, Harry Potter's great achievements have been spread more from Dumbledore's mouth. Hagrid's really, but he's Dumbledore's man through and through. Lucius Malfoy read out the contents of the newspaper in his characteristic, drawn-out tone. He put the newspaper aside and said with a smile, Dumbledore must be having a headache. In fact Dumbledore was really annoyed right now, especially with that annoying Rita Skeeter. Bang bang bang. Father, Lucas, Professor Snape is here. Draco's voice came from outside the door and the two people on the sofa got up and walked out. Lucius Malfoy said, I invited Severus here as you requested, and I'm curious about what you want to do with him. But I guess you won't tell me, will you? Seeing Lucas nod, Mr. Malfoy opened the door with a smile. Lucas looked at Professor Snape who walked quickly into the manor, and took a deep breath. Instigate Severus Snape plan, start now. Chapter 138, Wild Dogs and Werewolves England, Yorkshire. This is one of the poorest areas in England. In the endless wilderness, a lonely wooden house stands on it. The cabin is not exquisite, instead it looks like it was made improvised. This is really bad. How dare they say that about a kid? Remus John Lupin. He was Greyfinder's prefect when he was in school, and even managed to become head boy. At this moment, he was hiding in a dilapidated wooden house in poverty. All this because of his identity as a werewolf. As a result, he can only do some odd jobs and barely earn enough money to fill his stomach. He can't even keep muggle jobs because he can't justify his absence the days close and during the full moon. James, Lily, I'm sorry I couldn't take care of him. Lupin's eyes were full of sadness as he put down the newspaper with news about Harry. He picked up another one with a huge photo on the front page. Inside, there was a crazy-looking middle-aged man screaming at the camera. Serious Black. His once best friend, later turned traitor, servant of Voldemort. Why would you do something like that? Pad food. Mooney, long time no see. The sudden sound startled Remus. He drew his wand and looked towards the door. Standing by the door was a man with disheveled hair, along with a haggard and emaciated face. Remus recognized Sirius Black from the mid-length hair and familiar facial features. Pad food. It's me. 
Just as Sirius had finished speaking, a curse flew towards him. Dodging the spell, Sirius also drew a wand from behind him. The confrontation between the two used only silent spells as they fought from inside the house to the outside, then from the wilderness to the woods. Neither of the two spoke, but the manner of attack was extremely vicious. Expelliarmus! Expelliarmus! Two shouts came from the woods and both of their wands were knocked away. Without wands, they resorted to fighting hand to hand. One lived in Azkaban for twelve years and was extremely weak and haggard. The other can't eat enough all the year round, and occasionally endures the torture of turning into a werewolf which is extremely painful and leaves his body feeling weak for days. A few minutes later, the werewolf Lupin was the one with the upper hand after all. Looking at Sirius who was being strangled by his hands, Lupin's eyes were full of sadness, why did you betray them? I, I didn't. The newspapers made it clear that you blew up a whole street and killed twelve muggles, and Wormtail. Peter, is still alive. What did you say? Lupin froze for a moment, and his hands relaxed. Speak clearly to me. Ahem Sirius took a few deep breaths of air. He tossed a photo to Remus, and started rubbing his throat again. Don't just look at Harry, look at the rat in the kid's hand next to him. Rat. Remus observed carefully for a long time, and finally noticed the strangeness of the rat. This is. Peter Pettigrew, Wormtail, our good friend. Speaking of Wormtail, Sirius' expression became very fierce. Then he carefully described what happened more than ten years ago, including Wormtail cutting off his finger, then blowing up the whole street to frame him. So James swapped the secret keeper for Peter at the last minute? So you didn't betray them? Seeing Sirius nod, Remus' eyes became very complicated, he didn't know these things at all. Man, I'm sorry, I admit that I doubted you more than ten years ago, so I didn't tell you the secret. Remus shook his head, Sirius, I can't tell for sure if what you said is true or not. I can't believe you just because of a rat with a missing finger. Hearing this, Sirius became very excited. He firmly believes that he didn't recognize the wrong person and that rat is definitively Peter Pettigrew. Remus, I can prove myself, believe me, as soon as we get to Hogwarts, I can prove everything. Stop kidding, Sirius, you're a wanted man, and I'm a werewolf, we can't get into Hogwarts. Just when the two were going to start arguing again with each other, the sound of an owl came from afar. Remus took the envelope tied to the owl's foot. After reading the contents, he glanced at Sirius with complicated eyes. What's wrong? Sirius didn't know what happened, so he checked himself and seeing his dirty appearance, he frowned. Remus, I have been in Azkaban for twelve years. He thought that Remus was disgusted by him for being too dirty, so he went on to remind the other party of his previous situation. But just as he finished speaking, he saw Remus handing over the envelope. Look by Yusuf. Professor of Defense Against the Dark Arts. Sirius looked at his friend in surprise and then a smile appeared on his face. Lupin, this is a great opportunity. I think Merlin must be looking after us. But I'm a werewolf. Lupin said self-deprecatingly. Oh man, since Dumbledore invited you, he must have a solution, he is Dumbledore after all. Remus thought for a moment and looking at his former friend, he nodded. I can help you, but if I find out that you are threatening Harry in any way, I will definitely cast a killing curse on you. From today, you must stay by my side until school starts, and hand over your wand. Okay. I promise you. Sirius was very happy, and handed over the wand readily. Anyway, he just snatched this wand. Mooney, do you have anything to eat here, I'm starving to death. Maybe it's because he can finally take a break, or maybe it's the reunion with his old friend. But Sirius seemed to have returned to his usual unrestrained and happy-go-lucky appearance. Although he was a bit embarrassed by his current home, Remus still led Sirius into his cabin, took out some loaves of bread and put them on the table. Sirius took a mouthful of water and a mouthful of bread, and he ate it all within two minutes. Damn it, how could they say that about Harry? Those bastards. Don't let me know who wrote this story or I'll bite his leg off. After reading the report on Harry in the Daily Prophet, the easily angered Sirius cursed. As he looked down, the more he read, the angrier he became. Harry was his godson, so of course Sirius would not be happy to read he was being slandered. Oh Mooney, we have to help Harry, he must be having a hard time at school, the poor kid. Of course, when I enter Hogwarts, I will protect and teach him well. Well? And who is this? Asked Sirius, 
pointing to a corner of the newspaper. Remus glanced at it and read the name, Lucas Grindelwald. Grindelwald? How could Dumbledore recruit such a student, it's way too dangerous for Harry to stay at Hogwarts. Now there is not only Wormtail, but also a Grindelwald, Mooney, we must protect him, Harry must always be bullied at school. Damn Grindelwald, disgusting Slytherin. As a member of the Black family, Sirius knew all too well what the last name Grindelwald stood for. Remus didn't say anything, because he was busy writing an answer to Dumbledore. After the letter was sent, the two looked at Harry's photo in the newspaper and commented. He's really just like James. I think his eyes are like Lily's. Malfoy Manor. Professor Snape still had that icy look. Mr. Malfoy gave up his study to the two, and went to the garden to drink afternoon tea with his wife and children. This month's potions, and this is the Wolf's Bane potion. Lucas put away the five bottles of potion, looked at the potion's master helplessly and said, Professor, you have been brewing Wolf's Bane potion for a long time, why don't you give me some more? When we made our deal, it was agreed that I would only provide one bottle a month, so there is only one bottle. As a businessman, you must be honest and stick to the deal, Mr. Grindelwald. Lucas sighed for shooting himself in the foot. Well, thank you. Seeing that Snape was still staring at him closely, he suddenly patted his forehead, I forgot, this is your holy spirit grass. A carved wooden box appeared in his hand and Professor Snape confirmed that the herbs inside were all right, got up and planned to leave immediately. Professor Snape, how about we talk? I don't think there is anything to talk about. I still need to go back to take care of the potions. So I won't keep accompanying you. Wait Professor, are you sure you don't want to talk about it? What I want to talk about has something to do with Lily Potter. Professor Snape, who had already reached the door, stopped abruptly. He then turned and walked quickly towards Lucas. With a serious and nervous expression, he asked, Who told you this name? I don't need anyone to tell me, I just need to ask a little bit to find out, after all, she has a famous son, doesn't she? Seeing that Professor Snape didn't speak, Lucas continued, Now, can we talk? What are you going to talk about? This is not a good place to talk. Why don't you come with me to Grindelwald Manor? It's not far from here. Snape didn't speak though, but gave his answer with practical actions. Seeing him walk out of the room quickly, Lucas hastily followed. Under the gaze of the Malfoy family, the two hurried to an even more luxurious manor not far away. Chapter 139, Horcruxes Harry is actually a pig waiting to be slaughtered? Grindelwald Manor, Wiltshire Although spring has passed for a long time, the fireplace in the manor is still burning. Under the effect of magic, the high temperature generated by the flame cannot affect anyone in the house. The crackling sound echoed in the spacious living room. Vinda Rosier, Gellert Grindelwald right-hand woman. At this moment, she obeyed Lucas' order and led the people out of the villa. Lucas sat opposite Professor Snape, with their favorite drinks in front of the two of them. Professor. Please don't be restrained, just treat this place as your own home. Say what you want to say quickly. Professor Snape was still the same. Expressionless, cold, and rude. Well, then, I want to talk to you about Harry Potter. There was a ripple in the empty eyes, and a deep voice sounded, Potter. But I don't think we need to worry about Potter's matter. Professor Snape stood up from the sofa, apparently not intending to listen anymore. Lucas was in no hurry. Instead, he waited for Snape to approach the door before opening his mouth. Does it not matter even if Harry Potter dies? He is Lily Potter's, no, it should be said that he is the only son of Lily Evans. Professor Snape did stop. He frowned, and turned to look suspiciously at Lucas on the sofa. The blonde boy raised his hand, inviting him to return to his seat. Professor, have you heard of Horcruxes? Horcruxes? Snape showed a puzzled expression, he didn't understand what Harry's life or death had to do with some messed up horcrux. Lucas didn't give him an answer right away. Instead, he first explained the origin and function of the horcrux. According to legend, in ancient Greece, a powerful dark wizard appeared in the world. He was the first person to create a basilisk, and he was also the creator of many black magics. He was known as Herpo the Fowl, one of the earliest known dark wizards. Why are you telling me this? Snape was slightly impatient. Although the basilisk aroused some interest in him, he just wanted to know why Harry Potter's life was at risk. Whether it has something to do with the so-called Horcrux. 
Lucas signaled him to be calm, and then continued to talk. Because of Herpo's continuous experimentation with black magic, many innocent people were killed. With more and more killings, Herpo found that his soul began to become broken. He didn't panic because of this, but had a whim, what would happen if he took out part of his soul and stored it somewhere? So he started to experiment, and succeeded once, using the killing curse to murder someone while at the same time having the intent of separating a piece of his soul, later placing that piece into an object. The artifact that resulted from this was the first Horcrux. Snape frowned upon hearing this. He is no fool so naturally, he can feel the extraordinariness of the Horcrux. What is the function of Horcruxes? It's not as simple as storing souls, is it? Lucas nodded and shook his head. It is true that it can only store souls, but even if it is the most common thing, as long as it is made into a Horcrux, it will become the most evil black magic item in the world. Because of being protected by black magic, except for a few specific methods, the Horcrux is almost indestructible, and the soul fragment inside will not be harmed. It is precisely because of this that people with horcruxes become immortal in a broad sense, even if their bodies are attacked or destroyed. Because part of the soul in the horcrux was not attacked, this person can still live in this world. After listening to Lucas' introduction Snape's eyes were filled with shock. It took a while for him to calm down. He raised his head to look at the blonde boy opposite. There is no evidence for what you say, so why should I believe you? As soon as he finished speaking, Snape saw the boy handing him a book. The production methods of Horcruxes are all recorded in a book called Secrets of the Darkest Arts. I saw this book in the Hogwarts Library directory, but unfortunately I couldn't find it. Fortunately, Merlin took care of me and let me discover these research notes in another place. Snape took the thick stack of research notes. It seems that the research notes should have existed for a long time, because the decay is very serious. Slowly opening the first page, Salazar Slytherin's signature came into view. This is. That's right, it's Lord Slytherin's research notes, which I got by chance. Lucas guided the professor to find the pages that talk about horcruxes and quietly waited for Professor Snape to finish reading. When the other party raised his head, before he had time to ask a question, Lucas spoke first. If you still don't believe it, you can consult someone, Professor Horace Slughorn, I think you are familiar with him. Of course. Snape nodded, he was my potions professor when I was in school and he is a very knowledgeable person. That's right, Professor Slughorn's knowledge is indeed profound, he had revealed the secret of making horcruxes to a person decades ago. Professor Snape closed his notebook, closed his eyes and tried to digest what he heard. After a while he looked back at Lucas. Then what does this have to do with Potter? Could he be a horcrux? Salazar's notes said that horcruxes are mostly used on objects, but they didn't say that living people can also be used. Lucas did not argue with him, but instead asked, Professor, don't you wonder why Harry can speak parcel tongue? The strangest thing is that he doesn't even know he's a parcel tongue. According to my research, whether it is the Potter family or the ancestors of Lily Evans, there has never been a parcel tongue. On the contrary, there is a man who is a descendant of Salazar Slytherin, and parcel tongue is his innate gift. Coincidentally, this is the same person who discussed horcruxes with Professor Slughorn. It's been rumored that he was defeated, that he's dead, but Professor Snape should know best whether he's dead or not. There was a hint of panic in Snape's eyes and his right hand unconsciously clenched his left arm. There is a special mark there. Although the color is light, as long as it doesn't disappear, it proves that the person who placed it is still alive. How many? What? Lucas looked across curiously. Professor Snape repeated, how many horcruxes does that person have? Since you have investigated it, you must have found out too. No, no, I only found a few, but I don't know exactly how many horcruxes that guy created. However, I'm sure that Harry Potter must be one of them. When Lily Potter was protecting her own child, she defeated that person. That person had already made a horcrux at that time, and his soul was already in an unstable state, so it was easy for his soul to fracture unintentionally after having his body destroyed. And in the whole room at that time, the only one who was still alive was Harry Potter, so he accidentally became a horcrux. That's why he can also speak parcel tongue. This also confirms the original prophecy that the Dark Lord will personally mark him as his enemy. At first, Snape was surprised that Lucas knew of the prophecy, but after thinking about it, he was sure it must be Dumbledore's doing. After this conversation, the living room fell into a long silence. 
Snape reopened Salazar's research notes and read the information about Horcruxes word by word. Lucas ordered the house elf to prepare two cups of tea again, then waited for the other person to ask himself. After about half an hour or so, Professor Snape snapped the research notes shut. It doesn't say how to extract the soul fragment, it only talks about how to destroy the Horcrux. Lucas nodded affirmatively, that's right, if you want to kill Voldemort, you must first destroy all the Horcruxes he made. How many did you find? Lucas looked at the old bat opposite with a little surprise. Two, if you count the diary that appeared in the Chamber of Secrets, there are three Horcruxes that have appeared till now. They are Ravenclaw's diadem, Hufflepuff's cup and the diary that opened the Chamber of Secrets. Professor Snape was taken aback, then nodded and said, making these relics into Horcruxes really fits the Dark Lord's personality. But a diary. Thinking of the diary being in Dumbledore's hands, Snape's face changed slightly. So Dumbledore knows about the Horcruxes too. I'm not sure if he knew it before, but after this Chamber of Secrets incident, he must have learned about it, and he should also know that there may be a soul fragment in Harry's body. Bringing up Harry Potter, there was a hint of resentment in Professor Snape's eyes. The boy, does the boy have to die? That's right, not only does he need to die, but Voldemort must do it himself, so as to destroy the soul fragment in his body. At this moment, there was finally an expression on Professor Snape's unchanging face. With pain in his eyes, he looked at the ceiling and whispered. It turned out that the child was nothing more than a pig raised in captivity for slaughter. Professor. Lucas raised his voice. When the other party looked at him, the magic power of legilimency instantly entered the brain through the professor's eyes. Severus Snape, as an occlumency specialist it's really not easy to use legilimency on him. But taking advantage of his current state of mind Lucas started flipping through his memory. Lucas' voice rang like a whisper in Snape's ear. What a beautiful girl, red hair, blue eyes, confident, excellent, oh and the head girl of the student body, it's amazing. Lily. Professor Snape was lost in memory and unconsciously, he called out her name. Lucas quickly found the memory of the night Lily Potter died. Seeing Professor Snape hugging her dead body and crying bitterly, he was deeply shocked. It was because the Professor Snape he saw was very different from the one he knew. No, it should be said that Professor Snape in front of Lily Potter was an affectionate and warm person. Lucas took a deep breath and prepared to start the next phase. He came to Professor Snape and whispered, Professor, don't you have any doubts about Lily Evans' death? As a muggle-born, where did she learn such a powerful protection spell? The voice just fell and Lucas felt that his legilimency was interrupted. When he looked at Professor Snape, he found that the other's eyes became hollow again. Chapter 140, Curse of Blood Sacrifice, I Can Help You Save Lily's Son What do you mean by what you just said? Seeing Professor Snape change back to his previous icy self, Lucas shrugged and returned to his seat. Professor, don't you really wonder what magic Lily Evans used? As far as I know, none of the currently known protection spells can compare to the one used by Lily Evans. Lucas brought up the name Lily again but Professor Snape's eyes were no longer disturbed. Probably because of the success of the legilimency attack by Lucas just now. Now he is like a hedgehog, firmly defending his heart. Hat. Snape let out a sneer. Although the Potter family is not one of the 28 sacred families, it used to be an absolute pure blood family. In such a family with a long history, there are always some unknown secret books. That's right. Lucas nodded. But why haven't I heard of such a thing in the equally old Malfoy family? Last summer, Draco and I went to 12 Grimald Place. The Black family. Yes, as the oldest pure-blood family, Madame Black has little impression of such magic. Lucas didn't speak any more. Instead, he snapped his fingers and called the house elf to his side. Little master, Shauna follows your orders. Go get us two desserts, mine can't be too sweet. Okay, little master. Please wait a moment. Shauna's figure just disappeared and Professor Snape's voice came immediately. Tell me what you know, you must have already investigated it clearly. Another quaint book appeared in front of him. Reading the title of the book, Snape asked suspiciously, Why have I never seen this book? Look at the content first, especially the part about the curse of blood sacrifice. Professor Snape opened the book dubiously. It is easy to find the relevant introduction of the mentioned curse. The user must be full of strong love, the loved ones who are guarded will not live to be 50 years old. Reading it aloud, Professor Snape's expression froze, 
and the distress in his eyes showed for a moment. Where did you get this book? Didn't you say that no one knows what magic Lily used? Then what is it? Professor Snape raised the book in his hand and asked sharply. Don't be impatient. Lucas appeared suddenly, raised his hand and pressed Professor Snape's shoulder. The next thing is my personal secret. If you are willing to make an unbreakable vow with me, I will tell you. If you don't want to, then today's conversation will come to an end, in fact, I only wanted to tell you about Harry. After saying that, he turned around and walked out of the room. He thought Professor Snape should take some time to think about it. He just walked out the door and saw Vinda come from the side. Lucas, how did the conversation go? There is a high probability of success, what can you do for me? Vinda chuckled lightly and said, we have some results from the investigation. Remus John Lupin was recently spotted at a Yorkshire fair, accompanied by a huge black dog. Lucas raised his eyebrows, showing a hint of joy. Wow serious black, this white sheep of the black family finally appeared, just let people keep a close eye on them, the two of them are not easy to deal with. Vinda nodded, and was about to talk about the situation of the Diagon Alley shop, but she saw Professor Snape striding out of the room. I promise you, just tell me what's going on. Okay, Aunt Vinda, please be our witness. Lucas held out his right hand to Professor Snape's. Both sides will keep what they say and see today confidential. The moment the unbreakable vow was completed, the space beside Lucas was torn apart. Professor, please follow me. Seeing the shock in Professor Snape's eyes Lucas felt a little smug in his heart. Holding each other's hand across the void chasm, the two appeared in Rowena Ravenclaw's library. Where is this? Snape looked around, he had never seen such a magnificent library. A dazzling array of books are placed everywhere, and he even saw many ancient books that can only be found in the restricted section of Hogwarts even some that can't even be found there. Welcome to the library of Rowena Ravenclaw. Ravenclaw. Snape was still puzzled. Until Lucas showed him the books written personally by Rowena. Professor Snape, who closed the book, had complicated eyes. After a while, he sighed. Hogwarts has existed for thousands of years. Everyone only knows that Slytherin left the Chamber of Secrets, but never thought about whether other founders did the same as him. So you found the book that records the curse of blood sacrifice here. Seeing Lucas nod, Professor Snape looked around the magnificent library in front of him again, and soon, he was attracted by a showcase. This is. He walked quickly to the showcase and slowly named the items in it. Ravenclaw's diadem, Hufflepuff's cup, and Greyfinder's sword, it looks like you are only short of Slytherin's locket to collect the relics of the founders. Lucas nodded, but did not tell him that he already knew the whereabouts of the locket and just a few days later, he will be able to get the locket back. By then the relics of the founders will be together again. He will also get a chance to draw a diamond lottery. Seeing Professor Snape staring at the display case so fascinated, Lucas coughed to wake him up. Professor, let's talk about business first. He invited the professor out of the library and the sunny flower garden outside shocked Snape again. How can there be sun here? I was amazed too, please sit down, Professor. The two sat down on stools in the middle of the flower garden. Lucas took a letter out of his pocket. Back to the original question, where do you think Lily Evans, a muggle-born witch, learned the curse of blood sacrifice? Professor Snape, who had been firm just now, suddenly became hesitant. Seeing this, Lucas continued, Professor Snape, I already know the prophecy about the chosen one from Headmaster Dumbledore. But I'm curious about how Voldemort knew the content of the prophecy. Snape froze and it took a long time to relax again. He said regretfully, it was me, I overheard the conversation between Dumbledore and Professor Trelawney, and learned the content of the prophecy, which I later passed to the Dark Lord. But Voldemort didn't know the complete prophecy, because when I heard just half of it, I was chased away by the owner of the hog's head. Professor Snape opened up about how he had tipped off Voldemort about prophecy afterwards, and how he begged Dumbledore to protect Lily's family after learning she would be a target. Although he already knew what happened, Lucas still feigned shock. I remember the owner of the hog's head is called Aberforth Dumbledore. Seeing Professor Snape nodding, Lucas took a deep breath. The next words are very critical, which is related to whether he can successfully plan against the opponent. Professor, that means you, a 19-year-old youth who just graduated, went to follow the greatest wizard of this century. And successfully eavesdropped on the prophecy without being noticed, no heard exactly half of the prophecy, 
and then was kicked out by Headmaster Dumbledore's brother. Do you think it's possible? Do you think that if Draco was stalking you, you wouldn't know about it? Professor Snape shook his head thoughtfully. Although Lucas comparing himself to Draco, that stupid kid, was a bit inappropriate. But at the time he was following the much older and skilled Dumbledore. It is indeed no different from Draco following himself. The professor fell silent and Lucas continued, when Voldemort learned of the prophecy, he followed the prophecy and took the initiative to find the Potters. But as far as I know, the child born at the end of July could also have been Neville Longbottom. Professor Snape nodded, that's right, but the Dark Lord chose Lily's child. Speaking of which, Snape's eyes became sad again. Looking at the man in front of him showing such emotions, Lucas sighed. He waited until the other person calmed down before speaking again, the blame lies here. Harry's mother Lily used ancient black magic and sacrificed herself to protect Harry. At the same time, Neville Longbottom's parents were also tortured into losing their minds by Death Eaters. Don't you think it's too much of a coincidence? Professor Snape suddenly raised his head to look at the boy sitting opposite him. It can't be, it can't be Dumbledore. Then explain to me why there is such a coincidence. Seeing Professor Snape speechless, Lucas continued his efforts, you said you asked Dumbledore to protect the Potters. Then, as the greatest wizard in this world, the one that Voldemort fears, why doesn't Dumbledore become the Potter family's secret keeper himself? If he became the secret keeper of the Fidelio's charm, who could obtain the location of the Potters from him? Snape's expression became a little flustered. Lucas took another deep breath, Professor, if I'm right, Dumbledore will tell you afterwards that Voldemort is still alive and will definitely come back to kill Harry in the future. The benefits of foreknowledge are manifested at this moment. Hearing Lucas say these words in a firm tone Snape's heart began to waver. Just at this time, a letter was pushed in front of Snape. If anyone in this world knows Dumbledore best, I am afraid that only my father is that person. Take a look, Professor. Snape took out the letter and started going through the beautiful cursive characters on it word by word. At the same time, Lucas' voice also sounded from the side. Albus Dumbledore, although his mother was a muggle-born witch, the Dumbledore family has a very long history. It is said that when a member of the Dumbledore family is in great need, a phoenix will appear to their aid. It all stems from the contract that their family signed with the phoenix clan in ancient times. My father, Gellert Grindelwald, was bound by a blood pact with Dumbledore, and the two were closer than brothers. My father, who likes to study the dark arts, once heard Dumbledore mention that his family has a very powerful black magic. This black magic is related to blood. Once it is successfully cast, the designated person will never be able to harm the person protected by it. It does sound very similar to the curse of blood sacrifice, don't you think, Professor? Looking at Professor Snape's slightly trembling hands, Lucas got up and slowly came behind him, Professor, let's cooperate, I have a way to help you rescue Lily's son. Professor Snape stood up suddenly, and staring at Lucas with a serious face, he asked, Do you really have a way? Chapter 141, Instigating Rebellion is 90% complete. Harry Potter definitely held a special place in Professor Snape's heart. He hates him because he inherited James Potter's looks, but he has to protect him because he is Lily's only son. Whenever he saw those green eyes, Snape would always think of the past when everything was better. What do you mean you can save him? Spirit Purifying Potion, have you heard of it? Snape frowned, as if recalling all the potion books he had read. After two minutes he shook his head, no, I'm pretty sure I haven't heard or seen it anywhere. Professor Snape's mother, Eileen, comes from the Pure Blood Prince family. Although the Prince family is not one of the 28 sacred families. But in the past, it enjoyed a high status in the magic world because people in this family are very good at making potions. It is a well-known potion family in the British magic circle. Professor Snape is possibly the only descendant of the Prince family and he inherited all the potion books in the family. So he was very surprised that he didn't know what the potion did. Lucas got up and motioned for the other to follow and the two went to the top floor of the library. Snape watched Lucas take a book from the top of the towering bookshelf. That's it, see for yourself. Spirit purifying potion, after taking it, it can repair soul damage and repel foreign souls. Materials Seeing the effect of the spirit purifying potion, a gleam of excitement flashed in Professor Snape's eyes. This potion is just the right medicine. If Harry Potter took it, Voldemort's soul shard could be easily dealt with. But when he saw the ingredients needed for the potion, 
his face immediately became ugly. Professor, what's the matter? It's useless, this potion cannot be brewed successfully. Snape closed the book after he finished speaking. Why did the professor become like this, Lucas knew it very well. He took out a wooden box and even before the lid was opened, the delicate fragrance of the flower inside had already filled the library. Professor Snape looked up, watching the box being slowly opened. Living flower. That's right, one of the main materials for making the potion. Seeing Snape reaching out, Lucas immediately put the box away. When I saw the spirit purifying potion from this book, I immediately sent people to look for it, and not long ago, I finally found the only living flower in the world. Professor, as long as you agree to cooperate with me, I will give it to you immediately. Professor Snape shook his head with a wry smile. So what if there is a living flower? I can think of a solution with the painstaking efforts of the Phoenix Tears and Ashes, Dragon Heart Blood, and an unicorn's willingly given blood. But the main ingredients of this spirit purifying potion also include elves' tears. Where can I find this creature of legends? Lucas smiled confidently, you don't need to worry about this, give me two years, and I promise to collect all the materials for you. Professor, why don't you try to trust me once? Do you really want to just watch Harry being sent to Voldemort for slaughter? There was a moment of silence in the library. Lucas has been leaning on the bookshelf since he finished speaking, waiting for the professor's reply. Almost an hour passed before Professor Snape finally let out a long breath. What do I need to do? It's done. Lucas waved his hand and took out two wooden boxes, one large and one small. The small one is filled with zodiac flowers, and in the big wooden box are eight holy spirit grasses. You don't need to do anything for the time being, you just need to brew the water of life. There are eight holy spirit grasses in here, with these two boxes of ingredients, you can brew two bottles of water of life. One of the bottles is of great use to me, and the other bottle is for you, Professor. In addition, there is this living flower, which I will also give you in advance, including the book in your hand that records the lost potion. Nothing was paid yet and he was getting so many precious things first, Snape wasn't used to it for a while. You're not afraid of me telling Dumbledore. Don't we have an unbreakable vow? And I also have great faith in you, Professor. Lucas placed the wooden boxes in Professor Snape's arms. Looking into the professor's eyes, Lucas said in an unprecedentedly serious tone. Professor Snape, please believe me, our goals are the same, although I can't tell you the reason, but for Harry, I hope he stays alive more than anyone else. As long as I can keep him alive, I'm not afraid of being an enemy of Voldemort. As long as it keeps him alive, even if it means sacrificing the lives of all the saints group in my hand. Looking at the serious eyes of the young man, Snape's heart was shocked. He didn't understand why Lucas cared so much about Harry Potter. He also knew that even if he asked, the other party would not answer. However, this is good, the boy in front of him was right, their goals were the same. Lucas watched the old bat's eyes soften. Knowing that his plan to instigate Snape had been completed by 90%. Why does he say 90? That's because the last 10% needs to be verified by Professor Snape himself. As a double agent, Snape would never just listen to his words. Whether it's the curse of blood sacrifice or the horcruxes. Or the Dumbledore conspiracy theory. He will use his own method to verify it himself. Anyway, there's still a lot of time before the summer vacation ends. Lucas believed that by the time school started again, his plan to instigate Snape would be 100% successful. As for what he had just said to Professor Snape. Of course he was serious. The ultimate achievement requires Harry Potter, Dumbledore and Professor Snape in front of him to survive to the finale. So Lucas will never let the three of them have an accident. He must get the legendary draw rewarded by the ultimate achievement. The reward from that is something that can potentially change the world after all. For the greater good. Lucas will not regret no matter how many people are sacrificed for a legendary reward. When the two finished their negotiations it was getting dark. Professor Snape declined the dinner invitation and it seemed that he was in a hurry to go back and verify the authenticity of what Lucas said. But before he left, he still gave Lucas something he already knew. Dumbledore convened all the professors yesterday to discuss who would be the defense against the dark arts professor for the next academic year. Remus John Lupin will be hired as defense against the dark arts professor for the next year. If Mr. Grindelwald doesn't want to have trouble with your little girlfriends, stay away from this man. Professor Snape left the manor without looking back. Looking at the figure of the professor disappearing into the night Lucas smiled silently. Master, 
the cave is ready, you can go there anytime. Hearing reports from a subordinate nearby, Lucas nodded slightly. Next, he plans to rest for a few days, then go meet Hermione and Cho Chang's parents. After that, it is natural to complete the agreement with Mrs. Black. Bring back Regulus Black's body and the locket. As long as he gets Slytherin's locket, he will have another chance at the Diamond Lottery. He's just wondering what kind of reward he can get this time. Yorkshire, in the wooden house where Remus lives. Sirius looked at the light passing through the broken roof and said helplessly, when we catch Peter and prove my innocence, I will immediately return to Grimald Place. By the way, you will come with me when the time comes. That house is big enough for the two of us to live in, and when Harry is on vacation, he can also move there. Hearing his friend talking about such things, Remus couldn't help but interrupt, Padfoot, if I remember correctly, your mother removed you from the Black family more than ten years ago. Oh, don't be such a party popper, don't worry, I'm the only one left in the Black family now, who else can inherit the house besides me? Remus shook his head and said nothing. But speaking of the Black family, he suddenly thought of Sirius' younger brother. Thinking about it now, it seems like I haven't seen Regulus for a long time. Probably gave his life for the master he loved so much, ha, it's really stupid. After finishing speaking, Sirius turned around and fell asleep facing the wall, ignoring the thinus on his chest when they talked about his brother. Time flies and it's finally time to meet the parents, after some convincing from the girls they decided to officially start dating this summer. Lucas is wearing trendy casual clothes today, making himself look sunny and attractive. In order to show his sincerity, he also bought many gifts. When he came to Hermione's house in London, he suddenly felt a little nervous. It's hard to fathom, he can lead hundreds of people and slaughter the same amount with absolutely no change in his heart, but meeting Hermione's muggle parents in his official capacity as her boyfriend makes him so nervous. As the doorbell rang, a burst of footsteps came from inside the door. Click. The door opened, and Hermione's smiling face showed up at the door. Chapter 142, The Most Important Speech in Life, Minister Fudge's Request Is Mr. Grindelwald here? Mr. Granger's voice can be heard inside the house. Yes dad. Hermione responded and led Lucas into the living room. The Grangers sat upright as they looked at the two teens with very serious expressions. Although he has experienced a lot of things in his life, it was the first time for Lucas to experience such a thing with his girlfriend's parents, so he was inevitably a little nervous. Sit down, Mr. Grindelwald. Oh, you can just call me Lucas. When Lucas was about to take his seat, he suddenly remembered that he was still carrying gifts. Uncle, aunt, here are some gifts for you. The Grangers smiled at each other, they were young ones too. They are too familiar with the way their daughter and Lucas are acting, but even if the two of them understand, being a parent, they still worry about their daughter. What's more, she is still so young. Well, Thank you Lucas. Mr. Granger thanked, and his wife took the gift and went to another room. Hermione, go help your mother. Looking at her father's serious expression, Hermione stole a look at Lucas. Until he saw him giving her a reassuring look, she then left with her mother. In the huge living room, there were only two men left. Lucas took a deep breath and said, Uncle, first of all I want to apologize to you. No, it should be us thanking you. Thank you for taking care of us in Paris, and my daughter, thank you for befriending and taking care of her at school. Mr. Granger had just finished speaking when his wife came over. But the figure of Hermione was still missing. Lucas knew that Mrs. Granger must have told Hermione to stay away for now. Uncle, aunt, I came to England from Austria two years ago and met Hermione at King's Cross Station. Our first meeting is something difficult to forget, her innocence and intelligence deeply attracted me and I understand the worries of both of you. We are still young, and we will face many uncertainties in the future, but please believe me, I am serious about Hermione. So please rest assured, because of family reasons, I understood what responsibility is earlier than others. The Grangers listened quietly to Lucas' story. The two looked at each other again, exchanging opinions with each other using their eyes. Seeing this, Lucas continued, I know you two are reluctant to part with Hermione especially in the future, because of our identities, we may not be able to see each other often. But I can assure you both that everything will be done according to Hermione's wishes. Even if she wants to leave the magic world, I am willing to live a normal life with her. So I hope that you two can give me a chance, and I hope that you can hand Hermione to me, and let me take good care of her for the rest of my life. 
whether the Grangers were impressed is unclear. But Miss Hermione Granger, who was hiding on the second floor and eavesdropping, was very moved. She knew Lucas always kept his word, but she also knows how much responsibility he has to bear. The huge saints group needs him to lead them, and many elderly in the group need his care. But Lucas made that promise to her parents. Fool, how could I be willing to take you away from your life? Hermione muttered to herself, and quietly went downstairs. When she showed up in the living room, Lucas was drinking tea with her parents. Father, mother, what are you doing? You invited Lucas for lunch, you and your mother go and arrange it. Seeing her father wink at her, Hermione smiled sweetly. She nodded excitedly, turned around and walked towards the kitchen. Looking at the happy appearance of their daughter, the Grangers shook their heads helplessly. Waiting until the two leave, Mr. Granger said in a low voice, from the day we learned that Hermione was a witch, I knew that she would belong to that world in the future. In the past two years, I have always followed her to visit the world of wizards, just wanting to know more about the place where she will live in the future. Last year, I saw your store opening, and the unprecedented grandeur is still vivid in my memory. Lucas, I will leave my daughter to you. Please take care of her in that dangerous world. This is a father's request to you. After lunch, Hermione and Lucas walked around the neighborhood holding hands. She was very curious about the conversation between Lucas and her father. Lucas doesn't even know how many times she asked along the way. You really want to know? Hermione nodded repeatedly, the curiosity in her eyes seemed to overflow. Lucas approached slowly and whispered in her ear, Mr. Granger asked me to promise that we will not mess around until you come of age. Boom. Hermione's face turned red all of a sudden. Just when she was planning to teach the nasty guy in front of her a good lesson, her mouth was suddenly sealed by soft lips. Lucas felt very good when he returned to his home. Unfortunately he didn't have the chance to stay happy for long, because someone from the Ministry of Magic came to invite him. Minister Fudge is looking for me. Lucas and Vinda looked at each other, and they both saw the doubts in each other's eyes. In order to learn what's going on, he took Vinda to the Ministry of Magic. When they arrived at the Ministry of Magic atrium, members of the Saints group also sent messages. Harry Potter used magic in a muggle house, causing a muggle to fly into the sky after he inflated her like a balloon. Lucas tore up the note with even more doubts in his eyes. Such a thing, what are they asking him to do? Minister Fudge, are you looking for me? Lucas opened the door to the minister's office, and Dumbledore who sat on the sofa froze for a moment. The old bee obviously didn't expect to meet Lucas, and his action of tasting dessert also stopped. Headmaster Dumbledore? It's nice to meet you outside the school. Lucas, what are you here for? Lucas looked at Minister Fudge, he was also very curious about why he was calling him so late. Dumbledore, Harry Potter has violated the regulations and used magic outside school. And he also broke the statute of secrecy by inflating a muggle like a balloon, causing her to fly south of Sheffield, which caused the Ministry of Magic a lot of trouble. Dumbledore put down the cake in his hand and said. But you should know that Harry didn't do it on purpose. The magic power of underage wizards is already easily affected by emotions. As far as I know, the muggle lady was speaking ill of Harry's parents. Any child would be offended, am I right, Lucas, dot. Lucas, who was tasting the new black tea from the Ministry of Magic, was involved for no reason. After a few seconds of silence, he spoke. Minister Fudge, I think the headmaster is right. If my father was being humiliated, I wouldn't just turn that muggle into a balloon. Fudge had wanted to contradict Dumbledore at first. During the recent public opinion war, both he and Dumbledore were victims. But Dumbledore's reputation was clearly still much better than his. And in the end it didn't work how he wanted, which made Fudge very unhappy. But he didn't dare to blatantly trouble Dumbledore that much, so he could only use these small tricks to cause some trouble for him. And Harry Potter just gave him such a very good opportunity, but Lucas spoke up so he had no choice but to leave it be. After thinking for a long time, he sighed, since this is his 117th. How many times? Oh, it's really bad. Dumbledore, the Ministry of Magic cannot pursue Harry Potter this time, but please educate him properly after you go back. Of course, I will also find time to go to the Leaky Cauldron to talk to Harry, you know his reputation is not very good right now. If people know that he used magic recklessly, it will have an even worse impact on him. Even knowing that the previous newspapers were Fudge's doings, Dumbledore didn't express any displeasure at the moment either. 
He nodded with a smile, thanked Fudge, then got up and left the office. Until the headmaster left for a long time, Fudge sighed, I just made a fool of myself, Mr. Grindelwald. It's okay minister, after all, headmaster Dumbledore is the greatest wizard of this century. What's the matter with you coming to me so late? Yes, I would like to ask you to help find Sirius Black. What happened before has already reduced my prestige among the people a lot. Now the jailbreak of Black made me look even worse. If I can't catch him quickly, my approval rating will hit a new low. Lucas looked stunned. No problem, I will let people pay attention to Black's traces later, you can rest assured that as long as he shows up, my people will definitely find out. The premise is that he has to change back to human form. Lucas thought silently. Sirius Black is an illegal animagus and very few people know his black dog form. At least no one at the Ministry of Magic knew. These guys might still be wondering how Sirius escaped from the Dementors and escaped from Azkaban. After the conversation with Fudge, Lucas directly fell asleep when he got home. The next day he still needs to go to Cho's house to meet her parents. After seeing her parents, he planned to go to the Horcrux cave immediately. Time to fetch Regulus Locket, too. Chapter 143, The Cave and the Heavily Protected Locket Because of his previous experience with Hermione's parents, going to Cho's house was much smoother than expected. Her mother works at the Ministry of Magic, so she knows Lucas Grindelwald well, because of this her parents were very restrained. They behaved like they were the subordinates meeting their boss. Their positions were completely reversed, but the result was good and the two ended up wishing their daughter well. Cho, who is about to start her fourth year of school, is now a big girl. When Lucas left her house, the sun was about to set but he didn't go back to the manor. Instead, he tore the void and went to the cave. The smell of the sea, the sound of the rough waves and the greeting came to Lucas' ears together. Master! Since finding the cliff where the Horcrux cave was, about a dozen or so members of the Saints group were watching over the surrounding area to prevent outsiders from entering it. Thank you for your hard work. Hearing the words of thanks in a gentle tone made these members very excited, even the tiredness of the day was swept away. Led by one of them, Lucas came to the entrance of the cave where the Horcrux was stored. It was a crack on the cliff, and endless sea water was pouring into it. The two of you go in with me, and the others continue to stay outside. The ones who were pointed seemed agitated. Seeing that Lucas entered the sea, the two hurriedly followed. In this season, the sea water will still bring a biting chill to people. It didn't take long for Lucas to enter a dark passage. The passage was pitch black and you couldn't even see your nose, Lucas waved his hand and used the improved Lumo Stella. The bright lights of the stars extended to the end of the passage. With the light Lucas carefully observed the appearance of the dark passage in front of him. The passage slopes downward, because it is close to the sea, and the air is abnormally humid. All the way down, Lucas was occasionally hit by a drop of water falling from above his head. This situation continued for several minutes until a rock wall appeared in front of Lucas. Master, traces of magic have been detected coming from here, we dare not touch it casually, and we don't know what will happen next. Lucas nodded slightly. He fixed his eyes on the rock wall, and then drew his wand. Accompanied by a white light from the wand, immediately a white arch appeared on the rock wall. The arch exudes a bright light, which is extremely dazzling in such a dim environment. It really is right here. As soon as the words fell, the arch emitting white light disappeared. Lucas knew that the real passage needed blood to open. Two members of the saints heard his words and took the initiative to step forward and cut their palm. Once the protruding rocks on the wall turned bright red, Lucas stopped the two of them. Okay, you guys go back and have a good rest, the following part will be enough for me alone, thank you for your hard work. His wand slid across the palms of the two and their wounds healed immediately. It's just that the two who lost a lot of blood looked very weak. Waiting until the two returned to the cliff, Lucas waved his wand again. The arch appeared again, and the blood on the rock was gradually absorbed by the arch. When the arch finished absorbing the last drop of blood, a dark passage appeared inside the door. This is the correct way to the Horcrux storage place. Lucas held his wand and walked in without hesitation. In the blink of an eye Lucas was standing by a lake. He was pretty sure he was in the belly of the mountain, but what appeared in front of him was the dark lake. Lumos. The wand glows with a white light, but this light can only illuminate a range of one meter near Lucas and it was still pitch black all around. It was as if something in the cave was absorbing the light. Lucas stood there without moving a step, looking at the shining green light in the distance. 
he knew that was where the fake Horcrux was kept. Wingardium Leviosa. A fist-sized stone floated from the ground. Wadaway sigh. The stone broke through the air and flew rapidly towards the direction of the green light. Suddenly there was the sound of splashes on the calm lake and something seemed to jump out of the water. Having verified that this place is really as dangerous as described in the original work, Lucas turned and searched along the lake again. After a while, he found the hidden chain. Voldemort seemed to think that no one would find the chained boat, so he didn't deliberately hide the magic breath on the chains. Or maybe he wanted people to find it, considering all the traps lying ahead. When the boat surfaced, Lucas immediately jumped on it and the boat drifted slowly towards the center of the lake. During the way, Lucas clearly saw the white corpses at the bottom of the lake with the light from the tip of the wand. These are Voldemort's most proud works, Inferi Army. Lucas didn't know how many Inferi there were at the bottom of the lake. But he can be sure that the number seen so far should be quite a lot. Just thinking about all the humans that Voldemort must have killed to make this army would make normal people shudder. The boat continued to move slowly across the lake. A few minutes later, the bow of the ship seemed to hit something and made a bang as the boat stopped. Lucas stepped onto the small island in the middle of the lake which was formed from a single piece of black rock. The rock is roughly the size of the Hogwarts headmaster's office. There is nothing superfluous on the small island in the middle of the lake, except for the stone basin emitting green light in the middle. The stone basin is similar to a pensieve, except that it is connected to the base below. There is some emerald green liquid in the basin with a seashell on the side to drink it. It looked quite nice actually. But Lucas knows that this is not water, but a strong poison that can make life worse than death. Whether it is Regulus Black in the original book, or later Harry and Dumbledore. They all chose to drink the poison into their stomachs. Lucas couldn't figure it out at first, but after checking it for a while he seemed to understand why Dumbledore and others would do that. Lucas raised his wand again, and used the vanishing charm, shattering curse and transfiguration one after another. But the stone basin has not changed at all and the emerald green liquid in the basin didn't even make a ripple. What kind of spell did Voldemort use to protect this stone platform so well? Lucas was just too curious. If he wants to take out the locket inside, it's very simple for him, but doing so would break the spell on the stone basin. And he intends to study the spell slowly first, anyway, he has plenty of time. Until nearly two hours passed, only then did he thoroughly study the black magic used. In short, what Voldemort cast on the stone basin was not a spell. Instead, multiple spells were superimposed on each other, and these spells complement each other and are entangled together as if they were carefully weaved. To break these spells you must know the order in which the spells were cast. Undoubtedly, it was even more difficult, and they were spells placed by Voldemort himself. There is no one in the world except himself who will ever know the correct order to cast the spells. After figuring out what's going on, Lucas stretched his arm and closed his fist as if grabbing something. A moment later the sword of Gryffindor appeared in his palm. No matter how powerful these spells are, it's still magic. And Lucas, who has anti-magic, can destroy the magic on the stone with just a light sword. A thin layer of black anti-magic power ignited on Gryffindor's sword. Then Lucas raised the sword with one hand and swung it downward diagonally. The sharp blade cut the stone basin and base making the emerald green liquid spill to the ground and Regulus locket appear at the bottom of the stone basin. The locket is small, without the delicate pattern and S mark that Slytherin's has on the surface, but it is still priceless in the eyes of some people. Lucas took out the locket and easily opened it. Looking at the tight parchment inside the locket, he took it out and unfolded it. Regulus Black, the last last words in his life appeared before his eyes. Regulus Arcturus Black. He was reciting the other party's name in a low voice and there was also the sound of the lake rolling in his ears. When the locket is taken away, the sleeping corpses at the bottom of the lake will wake up one after another. If the person who took the locket was not Voldemort these dangerous creatures will launch a fierce attack. Regulus was dragged into the bottom of the lake by these inferiors after drinking the poison. Lucas put away his wand. The Greyfinder sword in the left hand and the Goblin sword in the right hand are quietly waiting for them to appear. He had promised Kriaker and Mrs. Back to bring Regulus' body back. Kriaker. Pop. With a soft popping sound, the old house elf appeared beside Lucas. Seeing familiar surroundings, bad memories immediately occupied Kriaker's mind. No, no, why did you call Kriaker here? Kriaker is useless, he failed to complete good master Regulus' final order. His tears flowed down his face and his eyes were full of self-blame. Don't cry Kriaker, stand here and watch, 
we need to find your master's body, and then we will take him home. Master! Kriakar glanced at the elf beside him and thinking of the agreement between the two, his eyes became firmer. Kriakar wants to take the good master home. At the same time the first batch of inferiors had climbed out of the water and came to the stone platform. Lucas clenched his two swords tightly, ready to try the power of elf combat skills first, and at the same time find Regulus' whereabouts. Chapter 144, Ruthless Blue Flames Inferiors are actually some dead bodies without thoughts and souls. They are somewhat similar to zombies, but what is better than zombies is that the body is protected by magic and is not perishable. Inferi do not form naturally and they are artificially created and controlled by black magic. The created undead are absolutely loyal to their masters. Voldemort probably took a fancy to this, so he created a large number of them. After all, as long as you kill someone casually, you can create a subordinate who is 100% loyal to you, this is much more useful than some timid death eaters. Roar. As soon as the Inferi left the water, they let out a roar, and the sound was really creepy. These cool, damp loving guys are very afraid of fire and light. But Lucas didn't intend to use fiend fire, because he is not sure whether Regulus will be burned on the fire. The Inferi that left the water did not attack immediately because they instinctively felt the threat from Lucas. Looking at the undead that kept screaming at him, Lucas lunged out. Elven combat skills include hand-to-hand -hand combat, swordsmanship, and archery, as well as how to use magic power when using the above combat skills. The elves are the darlings of nature, born with powerful magic and they have developed their use of magic to the extreme. Even in close combat, every move and style has magic power contained in it. Lucas Slender, muscular figure leapt into the air, passing over a group of corpses with ease. At the same time, the blade with magic power easily cuts off the corpse's head. Tossing and turning, Lucas passed by the Inferi and every time there would always be a head flying into the air. Cutting off the head of an Inferi again, Lucas swung his long sword and pointed at another Inferi on the shore. He has been paying attention for a long time. That particular Inferi has not stepped forward, but kept roaring and after each roar, new Inferi emerge from the lake. A faint purple light shone on the Greyfinder sword. Immediately afterwards, a white light flashed on the tip of the sword, and the corpse was smashed into powder by the shattering curse. Kriakar's big eyes went from worry at first, to surprise later, to shock at the end. It really couldn't understand how the elf could be so strong. Kriakar can't let the elf fight alone. House elves do their magic differently than wizards. If it weren't for the ancient contract binding them, average wizards might not even be able to beat these little guys who do housework every day. Kriakar just snapped his fingers and six or seven Inferi flew into the sky. Repeating this several times, Kriakar let out a small smile. Probably because he felt that he was avenging his good master Regulus. Kriakar, look for Regulus carefully, and hand over these Inferi to me. Kriakar shuddered for a moment, and then he remembered the business. His big eyes hurriedly scanned the surroundings looking for the figure of his master, Regulus Black. At this time, the second and third batches of Inferi have already swam out of the lake. The number of corpses this time is far more than the first batch. Lucas breaks away from the Inferi. In just a short while, more than a hundred Inferi have had their heads chopped off. The elf combat skills are quite good. Lucas looks satisfied. Immediately afterwards, his expression froze, and black anti-magic power emerged from the two swords. Ten seconds passed in the blink of an eye and the two long swords made by goblins were completely wrapped in the power of anti-magic. All magical elements in the cave are repelled. The originally aggressive Inferi also became much weaker. At the same time the members of the saints near the cliff looked terrified. What's going on? Why do I feel that I can't use my magic? Me too, could there be something wrong with Master Lucas? Several people looked at each other. The two who had just donated blood walked back to the edge of the cliff. From the looks of them, they seemed to plan to go down to find Lucas again. Others ran off into the distance, they were going to report the situation here to Vinder Rosier in Wiltshire. If something happens to Lucas, all of them are responsible for the lack of protection. Inside the cave Lucas jumped into the Inferi again. This time there is no need to cut off the head of the Inferi. Just a little touch and the anti-magic power will cut off the magic in their body. Soon, a large amount of Inferi fell down. Your Excellency, Master Regulus is there. Kriakar's exclamation came from behind. Looking in the direction of his finger, a youthful Inferi followed the team towards him. Regulus Black who joined the Death Eaters at the age of 16 and died at the age of 18. 
Lucas turned around and waved the two swords in his hands, soon he arrived before Regulus. The spine of the sword slapped Regulus' chest, destroying the magic in his body, and at the same time sent the corpse to Kriakar. Kriakar, take your master and go first. Lucas crossed his hands and swung the magic power from the two swords forcefully. The two black slashes formed a cross shape, quickly defeating hundreds of inferiors in front of them. Your Excellency! Go! The slashing gradually disappeared, and the magic forbidding area also disappeared. Kriakar clenched Regulus' wrist, snapped his fingers and disappeared from the spot. The small island in the middle of the lake has been completely occupied by the corpses and Lucas was surrounded by them. With a roar, the surrounding undead rushed up. Lucas held up his long sword to resist, but the corpses followed him one after another, and soon surrounded him. In the nick of time a loud hiss sounded in the cave. Countless inferi were thrown away, and some even crashed at the top of the cave. Medusa, the gigantic basilisk, entered the scene. The huge body easily crushed the nearby corpses while the attack of the inferi couldn't even break her scales. Lucas, it's uncomfortable here, it's cold and dark, and Medusa doesn't like it. The voice of the basilisk appeared in Lucas' head. Immediately afterwards, she discovered the undead that were attacking her. Hateful. With a flick of the basilisk's big tail, hundreds of inferi flew into the sky. Medusa, surround the island and don't let these things approach. Okay. The huge body circled several times around the small island in the middle of the lake, forming a high wall as the hard scales made the Inferi helpless. Lucas put away his swords and took out his wand again. Inferi Legion? I won't let any of you stay. Taking a deep breath Lucas mobilized all his magic power. When he opened his eyes again, there seemed to be two blue flames flickering in his pupils. Lucas waved the basilisk back to the secret garden, and blue fire spewed out from the tip of his wand. This time the fire was more ferocious than ever before. As soon as it appeared, it occupied the entire cave space and the surrounding corpses were burned to ashes before they even had time to escape. The ones that hadn't left the lake all turned around and swam to the bottom of the lake. Want to escape? The black wand pointed towards the lake controlling the fire in the cave, making it rush towards the lake in a massive wave of blue fire. Large quantities of water vapor was released as the water of the lake was decreasing at a speed visible to the naked eye. None of the inferi in the lake escaped, and they were burned to ashes by the fire in the water. The cliff outside vibrated inexplicably and the members of the saints sensed that something was wrong so they hastily left the edge of the cliff. As the vibration grew stronger, many cracks appeared on the cliff and blue flames spewed out along the cracks. The members of the saints shouted joyfully, pointing to the flames. It's Master Lucas, it's the Master's successor. All saints know that there are only two people in this world who can cast that spell. One is their leader, Gellert Grindelwald, and the other is Lucas Grindelwald. In the flames, a void crack appeared as Lucas walked out of the chasm calmly and gracefully, with his wand in hand. Regarding the fire behind him, he did not intend to extinguish it. In such a dirty place, it is better to burn it for a while to disinfect it. The matter here is over, you may go back. After Lucas finished speaking, he tore the void again. He stepped forward, and when he reappeared, he was already standing in front of number 12, Grimald Place. The Black family seems ready to welcome him, because when Lucas' presence was sensed, the door opened automatically. Welcome, Mr. Grindelwald. Today's Mrs. Black is dignified and polite, not as crazy as before. To meet Lucas she also asked Kriakar to hang her portrait in the foyer. Mrs. Black, long time no see. The gate slowly closed and Walburga shouted with a smile on her face. Kriakar. Hurry up and receive the distinguished guest. Pop. As Kriakar appeared he bowed low and then stood straight, showing a drastic change in attitude, not as rude as he used to be. There was respect in the eyes looking at Lucas at the moment. Your Excellency, please follow Kriakar to the living room, the locket you want Kriakar to give you is ready. Lucas' eyes lit up and he followed the ancient house elf through the corridor, step by step into the living room. Chapter 145, Slytherin's Locket in Hand Coming to the living room Kriakar placed the portrait of Mrs. Black on the sofa. Mr. Grindelwald, thank you for bringing Regulus back. Walburga's eyes were moist, especially when she mentioned her son, her eyes were full of sadness. Kriakar was the same as he silently prepared a cup of black tea and put it on the table, then planned to leave. Now is the time for the mistress to talk to the elf lord and as a house elf he doesn't deserve to be here. Kriakar, wait. The old house elf stopped and looked back at the elf on the sofa. 
when he saw Lucas wave at himself to return, Kriaker first looked at his mistress in the portrait. Mr. Grindelwald is a distinguished guest of our black family. Kriaker, so you must obey his orders. The elf nodded and walked up to Lucas step by step. Your Excellency, there is. Kriaker didn't finish his sentence, because he saw Lucas take out something very familiar. Before Lucas came, he specially made a necklace for the locket. He put the locket on Kriaker's neck and said, Kriaker, I brought Regulus' locket back, and it belongs to you from today on. Kriaker became overwhelmed and looked at his mistress in a panic. But Mrs. Black in the portrait didn't oppose it. Facing this loyal house elf, she smiled and said, Kriaker, since Mr. Grindelwald gave it to you, you should keep it and protect it. Yes, mistress, thank you, Your Excellency the elf. After Kriaker finished speaking, he disappeared from Lucas' eyes. Immediately afterwards, the sound of Kriaker crying came from the second floor. Sorry, Mr. Grindelwald. After hearing the crying, Walburga's tone became a little choked up, but Lucas shook his head understandingly. Mr. Regulus remains, what is Mrs. Black going to do with them? I'm going to have Kriaker bury him in the family cemetery, and that's the end of it for us, the Black family. As the oldest pure blood family, it's really embarrassing to become like this now. But Lucas disagreed with her statement. Madam, you may not know that your other son is still alive, and he just escaped from Azkaban not long ago. Don't mention that unfilial son in front of me. Her face darkened, then she looked at Lucas apologetically. It can be seen that Sirius Black had really hurt his old mother a lot. Thinking that this place will become the stronghold of the Order of the Phoenix in the future Lucas felt compelled to warn her, lest the white sheep spoil such a good place. Madam, whether you admit it or not, Sirius Black is your son. It would be fine if he was captured and brought back to Azkaban, but if he is acquitted one day, then this house will be automatically inherited by him. Impossible. She said angrily, I have removed him from the family, he has no qualifications. In fact, he does exist. Although you removed him, it was only a verbal and family announcement. From the perspective of the Ministry of Magic, he still has the right to inherit. Hearing Lucas explain, Walburga was silent for a long time. At this moment, Kriaker reappeared after calming down his emotions and there was an exquisite locket in his hands. The locket is engraved with exquisite patterns, and Slytherin's unique and gorgeous S mark attracts attention. Your Excellency, according to the agreement, I will give this thing to you, but Kriaker wants to remind Your Excellency. It is protected by a very powerful magic, and Kriaker can't destroy it by any means. And it affects Kriaker, it speaks in Kriaker's head. When mentioning the locket, Kriaker was very distressed. Lucas patted Kriaker's head, don't worry, I have a solution, I'm an elf, and an elf can do anything. Oh yes, your excellency the elf is a powerful elf, and he will definitely be able to destroy it. Kriaker had just finished speaking when he suddenly heard his mistress orders. It seems that she had thought of a solution for the house. Kriaker, find Narcissa immediately, I have something very important to tell her. Yes, mistress. When Kriaker left, Lucas looked at the portrait and asked, Are you going to hand over the house to the Malfoy family? No, I intend to present the house to you, Mr. Grindelwald. Me? Lucas asked in surprise. That's right, I know you don't care about a house, but we have to repay your kindness for bringing Regulus back. It's a pity that our black family has fallen, otherwise I would have given you the whole family's support. She had just finished speaking when the sound of apparition came from the room. Narcissa Malfoy nay Black and her son suddenly appeared in the drawing room. Aunt? Mr. Grindelwald. Narcissa didn't understand what was going on now. What was Lucas doing in the old house of Black? And sitting with the portrait of her aunt. From the looks of it, the two seemed to be having a good time chatting. Great aunt. Draco bowed respectfully to the portrait. Walburga changed her serious face from just now, and showed a kind smile on her face. Draco? It's been some time and you are already this big. Auntie, what did you call me for? Narcissa didn't want her son to have too much contact with Mrs. Black. Since the accidents of her two sons, Mrs. Black has not been in a good state of mind, so much so that the portraits left behind are a little nervous. Kriaker. Kriaker consciously walked in front of the portrait, held the portrait in both hands and walked towards the stairs leading upstairs. Others had no choice but to follow behind him. Draco pulled Lucas by the sleeve to slow down, and the two fell behind. What the hell is going on? 
Why are you here? Did you forget about last summer vacation? As soon as he was reminded, Draco recalled immediately. The two whispered to each other at the end. After a few words, they came to a door. There is a nameplate nailed to the door, and it can be seen that the nameplate has just been repaired. However, the name on it is clearly visible, much better than the nameplate on Sirius' room next to it. Auntie, why did you bring us to Regulus' room? You'll know when you go in. The door was opened by Kriakar. When Narcissa saw her young cousin lying on the bed, she immediately covered her mouth with both hands. Auntie, Regulus, this is... Dead, died fourteen years ago. What? Narcissa looked at Mrs. Black in the portrait in surprise. Kriakar, take out Regulus' locket and give the letter inside to Narcissa. The loyal elf opened the locket around his neck and removed the parchment paper stored inside. Seeing the contents on the parchment, Narcissa's eye sockets gradually became moist. Narcissa Malfoy, although her husband is a Death Eater, she was only loyal to her family. So in the original book, she would choose to help Harry after she learned that her son was fine. Because in her heart, family is more important than anything. Narcissa, who pays attention to feelings, looked at her cousin's immature appearance and said in disbelief. He was only 18. Yes, 18, my youngest son even died before me, and his bastard big brother is still going around preaching that he's a Death Eater. Narcissa, is it true what they say about that bastard Sirius escaping from Azkaban? Seeing Narcissa nodding. Mrs. Black continued, Tomorrow you will go to the Ministry of Magic and take my seal to inherit the house into your own name. Narcissa immediately understood what her aunt meant. Then the two chatted alone in the room for a long time. When the door opened again, Narcissa went straight to Lucas. Thank you for your help, Mr. Grindelwald, you will always be the honored guest of the Black and Malfoy families. Narcissa bowed slowly after finishing speaking. I'll call the house elf later to tidy up the house and bring home the personal belongings of the Black family. After I finish the inheritance procedures of the old house, I will present the house to you in the name of the Black family to express our gratitude. Lucas waved his hand, don't worry, the more important thing now is to bury Mr. Regulus. He has been wandering for 14 years, and it's time to go home. Hearing this, Narcissa's eyes became moist again. Lucas looked at the portrait of Mrs. Black again and said, if one day, there is someone who can restore the glory of the Black family among the offshoot of the family, I promise that I will return the house to the other party unconditionally. Thank you very much, Mr. Grindelwald. Because Narcissa still has a lot to do, Lucas said goodbye and left first. Besides, he had to go back and remove Voldemort's soul fragment from the locket. Only in this way can he complete the series of achievements for collecting the relics of the founders. Returning to Grindelwald Manor, Vinda was waiting for him at the entrance. How are things going? It went very well. I'll go back to my room first. Before I come out, don't let anyone disturb me. Getting a response from Vinda, Lucas then walked to his room. Locking the door, he took out the Slytherin's locket and began to destroy the dark magic on it. Lucas seems to have seen the diamond lottery beckoning himself. Chapter 146, The Magic Left by Slytherin, New Diamond Rewards Late at night, Lucas still held the fiend fire carefully. Normally, he could directly use anti-magic to destroy the black magic on the locket. But it's been said before, the relics of the founders are all precious alchemical items. In the case where the specific function of the locket is not clear. If he were to use the anti-magic power rashly, he was afraid that the locket itself would also be destroyed. This is not worth the haste. However, Several hours passed and Lucas looked at the original locket inside the fiend fire with a puzzled expression. As far as he knew, Voldemort should have obtained the locket and the gold cup at the same time, so the protective spells between the two should be almost the same. Extinguishing the fire in the palm of his hand, Lucas held the locket up to his eyes for a closer look. Could it have something to do with the locket itself? The more he thought about it, the more possible it seemed. Tearing the void, he took the pendant to Salazar's laboratory, he remembered that there was still a notebook here used by Salazar Slytherin to record innovative ideas. After a while of rummaging he finally found Salazar's innovation manual under the table. Reading carefully page by page through the scribbled writing and unintelligible drawings on it, Lucas actually found a dark magic protection charm. Prism Curse, black magic casted by mixing blood with one's own magic power. Although it is black magic, it is used to protect one's own safety. 
Salazar took inspiration from reflective prisms to create this kind of black magic that continuously refracts the magic power and reduces the power of the attacking spell. According to his vision, if the prism curse is applied to powerful alchemical objects, it can completely resist the killing curse and fiend fire. Seeing this, Lucas was able to confirm that the spell was cast on the locket. But he checked carefully for a long time and there was no way to cast or break the spell. Are you kidding me? Lucas looked through all the written things in the laboratory and didn't return to his room at the Grindelwald Manor until the next afternoon. Looking at the locket lying in his palm he frowned. Do I really need to destroy it? Thinking of Ron splitting the locket with the Greyfinder sword in the original book, Lucas summoned the Greyfinder sword and walked out of the room. In the garden, Lucas held his sword high in both hands. He stood motionless for a minute or so. Suddenly he opened his eyes, and chopped down the sword vigorously with both hands. The blade of the sword cut across the air, making a slight sound. After a while, there were still no changes to the locket. If you observe carefully, you can find that the blade stopped less than one millimeter away from the locket. Lucas put away the Greyfinder sword and returned to the room with the locket. This time things went much smoother and the fiend fire quickly cleared away the black magic aura on the surface. Although the prism spell created by Salazar is powerful, it cannot withstand physical attacks that are also products of alchemy. Although he did not find a way to crack it in Salazar's laboratory yesterday, he found some useful information. For example, after the protective spell is broken, as long as the drop of blood mixed with magic power in the core still exists, the magic spell will automatically absorb the magic power to restore it. It is a pity that there is no specific method to cast such a powerful spell. Perhaps Salazar Slytherin also thought the spell was too powerful. So after casting a spell on the locket, he destroyed his notes on the prism curse. Along with the white light flashing at the tip of the wand, red rays of light bloomed in the alchemy formation and Slytherin's locket gradually divided into three parts. As soon as Voldemort's soul fragment appeared, it was devoured by Lucas using soul devouring. Feeling his magic grow stronger again, Lucas exhaled and said, System, what is the strength of my magic power now? Ding, the host's magic power is, 50, elite or air. It's still 10 points away, at most 5 months. I will be able to enter the Quasi Legendary level. Suppressing his excitement he looked back at the locket in the alchemy circle. At this time, there is still a drop of blood in the middle of the locket divided into three parts. The blood drops are bright red, translucent, and even give people a strange feeling. This is the blood of Salazar Slytherin, along with his own magic. Lucas came to the alchemy circle and took out a potion vial. Holding the bottle in one hand and the wand in the other, carefully separating the magic power from the blood drop. With the constraints of the alchemy formation, although this process was slow, fortunately it was completed without any risk. Lucas poured his own blood back into the locket and wrapped the magic of Slytherin around his own blood drop. When he finally restored the locket to its original state, he immediately perceived the existence of the prism curse. I didn't expect it to be really successful. Lucas looked happily at the drop of blood in the alchemy bottle. This should be well preserved the blood of Salazar Slytherin. There is only this drop in the world, and it might be useful someday. Ding, congratulations to the host for obtaining a new achievement, Salazar Slytherin's locket, reward, 500 achievement points. It has been detected that the host completed a series of achievements, the relics of the founders, rewards, one chance to draw diamond lottery, 2000 achievement points. Unexpectedly, the relics of the founders actually gave an extra 2000 achievement points. Lucas tidied up the alchemy array on the ground, then he went to the chair by the window and sat down. After drinking a bottle of Felix Felicis, he let the system use the diamond lottery. The diamond prize pool reappeared with numerous rewards in it. As the prize pool shone brightly, a series of colorful words appeared in front of Lucas and words rushed into his mind. Ding, this lottery draw is over, congratulations to the host for winning the reward, magic spell text. Magic spell text draw the rules and range with a wand, and those who step into the trap will have to abide by the rules. It is a kind of enchantment, and imposes an absolute rule on those who step into the enchantment. Although there are many restrictions on this spell, and it is also very slow to execute, if it is used to set up traps it can be incredibly useful. Lucas rubbed his chin, his eyes suddenly lit up. This ability came at just the right time. Maybe he can rely on the help of this magic to successfully gain an advantage over Dumbledore. If he really succeeds, he will be more confident in dealing with Voldemort's resurrection the year following this one. But a long-term plan is needed. At the very least, 
he needs to wait until Professor Snape is successfully instigated. If there is no help from the other party, no matter how perfect Lucas' plan was, it was useless. Maybe I should try the power of spell text first. Lucas walked out of the room and started walking around the garden wall. Because the manor is too large. With his magical power, it takes several divisions to bring the entire manor into the scope of the text rules. Vinda looked strangely at Lucas writing and drawing on the walls, he's never shown such a childish attitude even when he was younger. She smiled lightly and shook her head without paying much attention. She thought Lucas was just a little stressed, so he used this way to relax. Lucas wrote spells all over the manor, then pretended nothing had happened and went back to his room. When he wrote in midair with his wand whoever steps into Grindelwald Manor loses his magic power. The text in the entire manor suddenly flickered. Boom boom boom. Lucas, are you okay? Not long after, Vinda Rosier's nervous voice sounded outside the door. Just now, her magic power suddenly disappeared. Not only her, but also the magic power of all the saint members in the manor disappeared. Vinda looked aside at the broom sweeping the floor and her brows were tightly wrinkled together. Lucas smiled mischievously when he heard the voice outside the door. Waving the wand, the words in the air disappeared immediately. At the same time the texts in various parts of the manor were also gradually hidden. Opening the door Lucas asked curiously, Aunt Vinda, what's wrong? Don't you feel something is wrong? No? What happened? Oh, it's okay, if you are busy I will leave first. Seeing Vinda leave with a puzzled expression on her face, Lucas laughed as he closed the door. The following few days he used spell text to play pranks from time to time. This is mostly to become familiar with the application of the magic. On the other hand, it is to pass the boring time. Until Draco brought news of Narcissa Malfoy and he went again to 12, Grimwald Place. Lucas has officially become the master here. Seeing that Narcissa was about to take down the portrait of Mrs. Black, he hurriedly stopped her, Aunt Narcissa, don't trouble yourself, I don't live here. Mrs. Black probably doesn't want to leave either. I think she and Kriaker should just stay here, just as usual. Oh thank you, Mr. Grindelwald. While Berga Black in the portrait expressed her gratitude, she really couldn't bear to leave the house. Think of Sirius Black who has become homeless, Lucas was in a very good mood. This good mood lasted until the start of school on September 1st. King's Cross Station. Lucas stood by the side of the road with his hands in his pockets. When he saw Hermione and Cho running towards him anxiously, he went up to them immediately. The two women tacitly stuffed their luggage into his arms, then the two carried the cat and the swan to platform nine and three quarters. Leaving Lucas behind staring at their retreating forms dumbfounded. When Lucas arrived at their compartment it was still the last carriage, this place seems to have become Lucas' exclusive compartment. The little wizards at the school also know about it, so they won't bother them. Occasionally, New students are seen entering the carriage at the end, there will also be well-meaning people who will stand up and explain. Soon, the whistle of the Hogwarts Express train sounded. Not long after the train left the platform, the door of the compartment where Lucas was in was slammed open. The loud crashing sound attracted the attention of the students nearby. The two women frowned and turned their gazes to the outside of the carriage. When they saw the figure outside the door, the two looked at Lucas who was reading a book leisurely. Chapter 147, Harry's character is getting worse. Lucas wouldn't have thought that he actually had a little fang girl outside of school. Seeing Hermione and Cho cast their scrutinizing gaze on him, he looked helplessly at the petite figure outside the door. The girl outside the door had long, slightly curly brown hair, and her light brown eyes were very expressive. When she caught Lucas' gaze, a sweet smile appeared on her face and with her dimples it formed a very cute appearance. Lord Chief, my name is Astoria Greengrass, a new student at Hogwarts. My dream is to enter Slytherin House. I usually don't have any hobbies. The only thing I like is reading. And, A and D. Hearing Astoria introduce herself like that, Hermione let out a chuckle. Then the person you like is the Lord Chief. Astoria, who was nervous inside, didn't hear what Hermione said at all. When she realized something was wrong, her little head had already nodded several times. No, no. Hermione seemed to enjoy teasing the little girl in front of her. Does that mean you hate Lucas? Astoria's head seemed to become a rattle. At the same time, she looked anxiously at Lucas, as if worried that he might misunderstand her. Lucas coughed lightly and Hermione stopped teasing the little girl outside the door after hearing it. Are you Daphne's sister? N. 
Astoria nodded vigorously. Why do you call me chief? Because the Lord Chief Chief is the Lord Chief. Facing Astoria's look of worship, Lucas suddenly didn't know what to say next. Just when he was considering whether to say something encouraging, Daphne Greengrass came hurriedly from a distance. Sorry, Chief, I hope my sister didn't bother you. Looking at her face full of worry as she apologized, Lucas said with a smile, Do you think I'm the kind of person who gets angry so casually? Your sister is very cute, and she didn't bother us at all. Astoria was a little scared when she saw her sister coming, but after hearing Lucas's praise, her eyes lit up, and the expression on her face was extremely proud. Her face was just so expressive that it clearly showed her emotions for all to see, this made Lucas and the two girls laugh. When Daphne finally managed to leave dragging her little sister, the calm was restored on the train compartment again. However, because of the commotion, the protagonist of the conversation in the nearby compartments naturally became Lucas Grindelwald. Who makes him so eye-catching no matter where he goes? The Hogwarts Express finally left London behind. The picturesque scenery in the suburbs is always fascinating. Lucas put away the books in his hand and stayed with the two girls, listening to Hermione and Cho talking and teasing. You are really quite charming, just rescued the beauty Ginny last school year, and now there is another little girl. Yeah, I think Ginny Weasley seems to be attracted to you as well, Task, what a playboy. Lucas pretended not to hear, and concentrated on looking at the beautiful scenery outside the window. But he was thinking in his heart, who will save me at this time? Maybe it was Merlin who heard the call from his heart and Draco once again played a heroic role. The door was opened again and Draco's voice came from outside the compartment. Lucas, I have something important to talk about with you. You came just in time, I just happened to have something to tell you as well, let's go to your compartment to talk. Lucas got up and walked out of the compartment swiftly, leaving the girls behind to their conversation. This series of actions were performed so naturally and fast, he even left spell text on the door of the compartment before leaving. Seeing him leave as if fleeing, both girls looked a little unhappy. Immediately afterwards they both sighed again. Why can't this guy restrain his charm? Hearing Cho's emotion, Hermione laughed and said, If he doesn't have such charm, how can you still like him? Lucas didn't go to Draco's compartment as he said he would. As the chief of Slytherin, he still needs to perform his duties, like inspecting the compartments belonging to the Slytherin house. And he also knew that those disgusting dementors would be on the train in a few moments so he needed to inform the Slytherins in advance. This is a good opportunity for them to show their talents. Draco, what do you want to tell me? It was my father who asked me to convey something, he said that Professor Snape asked you to come to his office after the start of term feast. Lucas' eyes lit up, it looks like his plan was a success. Lucas, last time I wanted to ask, what exactly did you and Professor Snape talk about that day? Looking at his best friend who was full of curiosity, he said mysteriously, secret. Although he knew it would happen, Draco still felt very angry. Lucas saw his reddish cheeks and smiled, Come on, next school year, I promise to tell you all about it. But you have to think clearly, if you get involved, you won't have any room for retreat. Humph, that's it. After Draco finished speaking, he walked quickly to his compartment and Lucas continued to inspect the situation of the students of his house. Walking through the carriages one by one, he soon arrived at the compartment where Harry was together with his friends. Harry had a very bad summer vacation because the Daily Prophet reported about him continuously for many days, calling him a liar and other such words. Harry had thought that after two months of hiding in the muggle world people would forget. But he didn't expect that he would meet that annoying woman and end up using accidental magic on her, which put him on the cover page of the newspapers once more. So, you blew the old woman into a balloon. Well, there wasn't much difference since she already looked like a balloon even before that. Ron's eyes lit up. It's so cool that you taught her a lesson like this. Your father was the best chaser in Hogwarts, she can't humiliate him like this. Seeing the look of righteous indignation of his friend, the guilt in Harry's heart disappeared without a trace. I also met Minister Fudge this time, and he didn't seem like such a nasty person. I think we misunderstood him last time at Hagrid's house, and Minister Fudge didn't hold me accountable for misuse of magic this time, he even got me a room at the Leaky Cauldron. Seeing the envious expressions on the faces of his friends, Harry felt a little smug. After all, not everyone can see the Minister of Magic and Ron had said that even his father had a hard time seeing Minister Fudge. After talking about Harry's summer vacation life, they started chatting about the arrest warrants posted on the streets and alleys. 
Neville Longbottom said uneasily, aren't you all afraid? That's serious black you know. I heard from my grandma that he blew up a whole street and killed twelve muggles. He was an evil dark wizard. The timid Neville turned pale. Seamus Finnegan then continued, especially you Harry, I overheard my mother talking to a colleague. They guessed that Sirius probably escaped from Azkaban to kill you, so you must be careful. Facing the concern of his friends, Harry first thanked them. Although there is always a faint feeling of uneasiness in his heart, he trusted Dumbledore to protect him. Thinking of what Dumbledore had said to himself before the summer break, Harry's timidity was dispelled a lot. Dumbledore had said that there was power in him that even Voldemort could not comprehend, and it was a power that even Dumbledore couldn't have. Thinking again of the prediction made by Professor Trelawney the previous year, Harry seemed to believe that he was the one in the prophecy. Don't worry, I'll be fine, Dumbledore will protect me. And Sirius wants to kill me for you know who, that just means they're afraid of me, doesn't it? Lucas never knew that arrogance was contagious. Watching Ron and the others keep stroking Harry's ego, and Harry becoming more and more confident. It looked like he had some serious illness. Lucas is grateful for the decision he made. However, he still planned to take the time to go to Rowena's library to reread the information about the Curse of Desire. Why did he feel that Harry Potter's desires weren't the only things that were magnified? It was as if all of his negative emotions were under the spell. He doesn't need a savior who is only full of bad habits such as arrogance and jealousy. Lucas looked to the corner of the compartment and saw a middle-aged man was sleeping by the window. He appeared on the train at this time and place, with his clothes patched everywhere looking thin and malnourished. With such a destitute appearance, no need to ask, it must be Remus Lupin the werewolf. Seeing that Remus' ears kept moving, Lucas just knew the guy wasn't asleep. Just don't know how he'd react inwardly upon hearing what Harry and his friends had said about Sirius. Now that he is here, of course Lucas wants to get to know him, so he knocked on the door of Harry's compartment. Looking through the glass, the expressions of Harry and others became very ugly when they saw Lucas standing oozed. Chapter 148, Dementors Out of Control? Hello, Harry, long time no see. It's been a long time indeed. Compared to the smile on his face just now, Harry's expression at this moment is a little cold. Seeing this, Lucas smiled and said, What? Still angry about the Chamber of Secrets? I've already explained that I didn't see any basilisks. It doesn't matter, I don't care anymore, what else do you need? If there is nothing else, I want to talk to Ron about something else. Seeing the boy's attitude and how he was trying to get him to leave, Lucas shrugged, originally he just wanted to meet the werewolf, but now it seems that he can only look for another opportunity. Just as he turned to leave, there was a stranger's voice behind him. Lupin moved aside the clothes covering his head and said, A little advice, friends are very important during school. I see that your friend seems to want to apologize, and it's good to forgive when someone is being sincere. After Lupin said this, he looked at Harry and winked, because what he said was specifically for him. When Lupin looked towards the door of the carriage, the first thing that caught his eye was the dazzling blonde hair and deep blue eyes. The next moment, a name appeared in his mind. There are very few people in the British wizarding world who don't know Lucas Grindelwald. It turned out to be Mr. Grindelwald from the Saints Investment Group, nice to meet you. It's an honor to meet you too, Professor Lupin. Remus looked puzzled, not understanding how the boy knew about him. Due to his sensitive identity as a werewolf, he couldn't help looking at Lucas with a little more vigilance. Lucas didn't care, but pointed to the box on the luggage rack with a smile. All eyes fell on the box and saw the words written on it Professor of Defense Against the Dark Arts, R.J. Lupin. Remus breathed a sigh of relief. When he looked at the young man in front of him again, he found that he was extending his right hand towards him. Welcome, Professor, and I am also looking forward to your Defense Against the Dark Arts course. I still have something to do, so I will leave first. Seeing the sunny smile along with Lucas' politeness. Remus remembered the conversation he had with Sirius before coming here. According to Sirius, the surname Grindelwald destined Lucas to be a supporter of pure bloods. And he's also a Slytherin. The two only had the impression of Slytherins being arrogant and obnoxious. But now after Remus got in touch with him personally, he found that Lucas seemed to be a little different from other Slytherins. At this moment, the boy who had already walked out of the carriage turned back. I forgot one very important thing, Harry. You must lock the door of the compartment later, otherwise something bad could happen, please believe me. This is the Hogwarts Express, what can happen? 
is it possible that someone will be so bold as to attack us? After all, Ron couldn't hold back, and said some words rudely. His behavior seems to have become a habit, as if he would feel uncomfortable if he didn't say something to refute Lucas. Lucas saw that Harry also seemed to agree, so shrugging his shoulders, he turned and walked towards the other carriages. Anyway, he has already made a reminder, don't blame him for being kissed by a Dementor at that time. After Lucas left, the conversation and laughter resumed in the compartment again. Remus sat in the corner and looked at Harry in front of him, with a hint of nostalgia in his eyes. After a while he fell asleep again. He was really tired because of the recent full moon, and also because of poverty, that causes him to often not have enough to eat. Sleeping can reduce consumption and make people forget about hunger. Back to his own carriage compartment, the two girls greeted Lucas with blank eyes. He smiled and sat between the two of them, put his hands on their waists and tried saying some nice words to coax them. After a while, the originally clear sky turned cloudy. The pouring rain made the distant scenery look hazy and beautiful. When the evening arrived, dark clouds made the day turn into night ahead of schedule. Lucas knew that the Dementors were coming. It's really strange that it's raining so hard all of a sudden. With that, Hermione stood up and was about to leave, but Lucas grabbed her wrist and pulled her into his arms. Where do you want to go? I'll just walk around the train, it's too boring staying in the same place all day. Cho nodded after hearing this, but noticed that her wrist was being held tightly by a big hand. You two can't go out now, there will be danger soon. Danger. They frowned. Yes, Sirius Black escaped from Azkaban, and the Ministry of Magic feared he was hiding on the Hogwarts Express, so a Dementor inspection was arranged. Dementors? Are they crazy? As the top students of Ravenclaw, the two girls know exactly what a Dementor is. Hermione said dissatisfied, facing the happy and laughing students on the train, how could those Dementors control themselves? She didn't understand the Ministry of Magic's approach, let alone support it. At the same time, it also strengthened her determination to join the Ministry of Magic after graduation. This time it wasn't just about standing by Lucas' side, she also wanted to truly change this stagnant magical world. Not long after Hermione finished speaking, the train stopped suddenly. The two girls, who already knew what was going on, suddenly became nervous. Ladies, draw your wands, remember the patroness charm I taught you. Seeing the two nodding, Lucas said in a relaxed tone, if those Dementors dare to come in, use your patroness to hit them in the face. Lucas' relaxed tone dispelled the tension in their hearts. A few seconds after he finished speaking, all the lights on the train went out. The three of them clearly heard the loud voices of the students coming from the corridor. Lucas walked to the door and looked towards the front of the carriage. The students of Slytherin performed very well under the leadership of their respective chiefs. Even the seventh grade students walked to the carriages where the freshmen were led by the year chief Carl O'Neill and the prefect Gemma Farley. Lucas, look. Hearing voices behind him, Lucas turned his head hastily, just to see the rain on the window condensed into ice at a speed visible to the naked eye. The girls opened their mouths and tried to let out a breath of hot air. In an instant, it turned into a cloud of white mist. Watch out, the Dementors are on board. As soon as the words fell, a figure in black cloth appeared outside the carriage. It stuck out a rotting, dry, scabbed hand. It seems that they want to open the carriage door and come in to check. Go away, there is no one you are looking for here. Hearing Lucas' voice the Dementor paused. These dark creatures are very sensitive to humans' presence. The Dementor in front of him seemed to recognize Lucas so it slowly let go of its hand, intending to go to other compartments to check. Just at this time two voices shouted from behind Lucas, Expecto Patronum. The light from the two clusters of silver and white illuminated the entire carriage. The lights gradually turned into two corporeal patroness. It's worth mentioning that because of Lucas, Hermione and Cho's patroness were actually a cat and a swan respectively. Moreover, Hermione, who was not very good at the patroness charm in the original book, does not have any difficulty in casting it now. For the two girls, just thinking back a little bit about their experiences with Lucas was enough to make them happy. Two patroness jumped out of the carriage compartment and rushed towards the Dementor who hadn't reacted yet. They seemed to have found a fun toy, and kept chasing the Dementor off the train. In the middle of the train, inside Harry's compartment. Hearing noises all around, Harry felt more and more uneasy, then he suddenly remembered the words Lucas left before parting. Ron, lock the door now. It's a pity that he spoke too slowly. Before Ron got up, 
a Dementor had already arrived at the door. Ron's rat hid into his robe immediately when it saw the Dementor. Harry's owl also tucked its head under its wings. No creature in the wizarding world likes Dementors. Click. The door handle was turned, and the door was opened. The Dementor entered the compartment and its head turned curiously in Harry's direction, like it just found its favorite food. A transparent airflow was suddenly drawn away from Harry's body. The Dementor was devouring his happiness. As it devoured more and more, the Dementor began to lose control of itself, wanting to devour the souls of the human being in front of it. At this moment, Lupin who was sleeping opened his eyes and his wand was already in his hand. The moment he got up, he uttered the patroness charm to repel the Dementor. At this time, two playful patroness animals passed by the door. Seeing that there was another Dementor in the carriage, the patroness rushed towards the new Dementor. Remus lowered his wand as he watched the Dementors being chased away, he was a little curious for a moment. There are still people on this train who can use the patroness charm, fully corporeal at that. Just when he was about to find out who the casters were, Lucas's sonorous enhanced voice rang out from outside the compartment. Chapter 149 the fact that Harry fainted is exposed. Lucas stepped out of the compartment and saw Dementors everywhere in the corridor. The Slytherin students had already received the news though. But being their first time to really face Dementors. The patroness charm, which was easily cast in the past, seemed to be malfunctioning. Fortunately, the younger Slytherins locked the doors of their compartments, so even if they can't use the patroness charm, their safety is still guaranteed. Lucas glanced in the direction of Prefect Gemma Farley, she was currently leading the older students to protect the freshmen. The older students were not affected. The patroness guardians were playing around them, and when they encountered Dementors, they would step forward and drive them away. Gemma also noticed Lucas at this time, she was about to come to greet him, but was stopped by him raising his hand. Then she saw Lucas draw out his wand and point it at his throat, using the sonorous charm to amplify his voice enough for the entire train to hear. Listen, all Slytherins, raise your wands, and follow me in casting the patroness charm. Hearing Lucas' voice, the younger Slytherin students who were still timid before suddenly had the courage to face the Dementors. It's the chief. The chief is right outside, let's go and help. I don't want to be looked down upon by the chief. Some people who didn't have the courage to raise their wands, raised their wands high at this moment. The Slytherins seemed to have reached some kind of magical tacit understanding. There was no need for Lucas to count down and no one needed to be reminded. Everyone raised their magic wands and chanted the spell together, Expecto Patronum. Silver white light illuminated one carriage after another. Even Slytherins with poor grades could still cast the patroness charm in the white mist state at this moment. Lucas held his wand aloft as well and an oriental dragon flew out from the tip of his wand. The whole body of the snake-like dragon was silver and white, and the transparent body seemed to contain the starry sky. Lucas didn't know why his patroness was like this, probably it has something to do with his elven blood. The long dragon patroness looked like it was swimming in the train corridor. Every time it passes through a carriage, the other patroness light would melt into its body. As a result, the dragon became even stronger. Soon, the size of the dragon patroness overwhelmed the train. From a distance, the Hogwarts Express seemed to be covered with a silver coat. If you look carefully, you will notice that it wasn't a coat at all, but a silver dragon that swallowed the entire train into its belly. The Dementors had left the train long before the Petronuses had been cast. But be it because of the order of the Ministry of Magic or for the tempting meal in the train, they still floated around the train and refused to leave. Seeing this, Lucas waved his wand again and the long dragon raised its head and let out an ear-splitting roar. The silver light formed a huge wave of light, driving the Dementors far away. The Hogwarts Express train that had lost its power came back on. Everyone felt a wave of warm air brushing against their cheeks and the chill brought by the Dementors was instantly dissipated. Chief of each grade, go to Draco Malfoy to get chocolates, one for each student. Students in years 5 to 7, take chocolates to other compartments, and make sure that the other three houses and freshmen get them as well. Everyone on the train listen, I'm Lucas Grindelwald, the Dementors have been expelled, chocolate can effectively alleviate the effects of Dementors, please don't refuse. Prefect Gemma Farley Please go to the front of the train and inform the conductor immediately, and ask him to start the train as soon as possible, we need to get to Hogwarts fast. After Lucas finished speaking, the Slytherin students sprang into action. Draco opened a suitcase that was enlarged by Lucas with the untraceable extension charm. It can fit all the chocolate they might need. Thanks Merlin. 
those horrible things are finally gone. I must write to my family and ask them to complain to the Ministry of Magic. That's right, they even let the Dementors get on the train, did the person who came up with this idea have his head stepped on by a troll. Students from the other houses couldn't help complaining as they were slumped in their seats. When they received chocolates from Slytherin students, they would politely express their gratitude. This time, the Slytherins got a wave of favorability from part of the other houses which is something incredibly rare. Especially Lucas. Originally, his popularity in other houses was not low, but now he's even more respected by them. After all, he saved everyone's life this time. At the same time, the first ties who just entered this year also became curious about Lucas. Most of these little children don't really understand the horror of Dementors. They just think those disgusting guys must have been quite strong, but the one who just spoke and the students of Slytherin House were even stronger. After being frightened, the first reaction of these children was to become full of excitement. Astoria Greengrass held her head proudly. The chief is really good, everyone is also good, I have to work hard. Daphne who came to take care of her little sister could feel a headache incoming. This is great, just listening to her before, her sister already worshipped the chief, but now seeing his strength with her own eyes, her adoration reached a completely new level. Father, mother, I am afraid that your youngest daughter will enter the tiger's mouth voluntarily. Daphne Greengrass looked out the window as this thought crossed her mind. Clap clap clap. Hearing applause from behind, Lucas turned around and looked over calmly. Professor Lupin, do you need something? A wonderful patroness charm. This is not just a compliment, but a sincere statement. I have never seen such a powerful patroness in my many years. Professor, I think you have misunderstood, it is not me who is powerful, but the entire Slytherin house. Hearing what Lucas had to say, the Slytherins around raised their heads one by one while the students from other houses looked at them enviously. At this moment, the other three houses actually felt that they should also have a chief system. In this case, maybe there will be a responsible and kind chief like Lucas among them. Lupin has suffered all kinds of hardships in these years and thought he was pretty good at seeing through people. But he was also struck by Lucas' humility at the moment and even felt that serious analysis should be wrong. Just when he was about to ask why Lucas' patroness charm absorbed other patronuses, Ron's anxious shouts came from the compartment beside him. Harry, Harry, wake up. Remus turned hastily and was relieved to see that Harry just fainted. When he looked at Lucas again, the blonde Slytherin had already returned to his own compartment. Beside him, there were students from other houses instead. Harry Potter fainted. No way. He was so scared he fainted. I doubt his remarks about the Chamber of Secrets even more now. Compared with Lucas Grindelwald, I am more willing to trust Grindelwald, at least he will not faint because of the Dementor. Hearing the whispers of the people outside the door, Ron got up angrily to defend his friend. Harry was just attacked by a Dementor, that's why he fainted, don't talk nonsense if you don't understand. Ron Weasley, whatever we say is our freedom, and it's not just Harry Potter who was attacked. That's right, several people in Hufflepuff were attacked, and they didn't pass out. Harry woke up just in time to hear a few people arguing. Seeing him sitting up, Ron hurried forward to check on him. The others didn't continue to say anything, but they still looked at Harry with some mischief in their eyes. Harry's face flushed instantly and just when he didn't know what to do, Lupin stood up. Ladies and gentlemen, the train is about to arrive at Hogwarts, please return to your compartments. The status of a professor is still very useful and the people around the door gradually dispersed. But Harry knew things were far from over, it won't be long before all of Hogwarts knows that he fainted just now. Plus the summer vacation with the Daily Prophet talking badly about him. He was afraid that he would once again become the laughing stock of everyone after the feast. Harry nibbled at the chocolate in his hand and blamed Lucas in his heart. If he had spoken clearly earlier when he warned to close the door, he wouldn't have gone through this. The Hogwarts Express was arriving at Hogsmeade Station soon. Astoria walked up to Lucas with cheerful steps and said. My lord, I will report first, you can rest assured that I will definitely enter Slytherin. Lucas smiled and said good luck, I trust you can do it. He watched the girl happily running to Hagrid in the distance, even if she was wet by the rain, she didn't care. Look, everyone has already left. Hearing Hermione's jealous voice behind him, Lucas turned and hugged her in his arms. Since she is a child who is going to enter my house, I must give her some words of encouragement. Hermione's face was reddish, and she raised her hand to pull Lucas' hand away. Let's go, or the carriage will be full in a while. 
the three of them searched all the way. It was only in the second half that they finally found a vacant carriage. Luna. Hermione let out an exclamation, and hurried to one of the carriages. Lucas followed and saw the ethereal girl at a glance. Dirty blonde long hair, silver eyes, radish earrings, and her wand behind the ear, it all made her look so special. Hermione Granger, Cho Chong. Luna Lovegood's speaking voice was as ethereal as her looks. After she greeted the two girls she turned to look at Lucas again, and nodded curiously. Are you the only one in this carriage? Seeing Luna nodding, Hermione immediately asked Lucas and Cho to get inside. We'll be going with you, do you mind? I don't mind. After Luna finished speaking, she looked at Lucas again. This made the three of them very curious, and Lucas couldn't help asking, Why are you looking at me like this? I see reflections of Thestrals in your eyes, can you see them too? Lucas froze for a moment and said, Yes, I can see them. The corners of Luna's lips rose slightly, probably because she thought she had found a companion. She has asked many people, but no one could see the Thestrals pulling the carriages. With gradual understanding, there were more and more topics for the four of them. When they arrived at the castle, Lucas was a little bit unconvinced. Although this girl Luna always has some weird ideas, sometimes the questions she asks hit the nail on the head. It might even give Lucas some inspiration, such a unique girl is really quite interesting. After entering the castle, the four separated and walked toward their respective houses. Well, it was only Lucas who was separated from the other three. After all, they were all from Ravenclaw. Returning to Slytherin's group, Lucas led his housemates to the Great Hall. Just walked a short while and he saw Professor Snape standing at the door. He hadn't seen him for a while, and the professor's temperament looked even more gloomy. When he received a look from the Dewar Professor, Lucas nodded slightly, then walked to the Slytherin table. After a while, the school opening feast began. With the words of Professor McGonagall, the New Year's sorting ceremony was about to start. Chapter 150 was Professor Snape convinced? Astoria Greengrass. This year's first ties weren't anything to behold, with Astoria being the only interesting one. On the long table in Slytherin, Daphne watched worriedly as her younger sister walked towards the stool in front of the teacher's table. She was in a strange mood at the moment. She didn't want Astoria to enter Slytherin, because that would put her right in the hands of that lustful beast, but she was worried about her being bullied if she entered a different house. Slytherin. The sorting hat shouted loudly that Astoria belonged with the snake house. Watching the little girl running towards their long table with cheerful steps, Daphne sighed helplessly. Forget it, let it be. She really couldn't figure out why her gentle and quiet sister seemed to be a different person after meeting their chief. The sorting ceremony was over soon and as usual, Albus Santa Dumbledore stood up and gave a speech. On this day, the old bee appeared on the stage in colorful red wizard robes. If he had a sack on his back, no one would think he was a wizard. Welcome first years, and welcome back to everyone else to this new year at Hogwarts. Before the dinner feast starts, I want to say a few things seriously, the first is regarding the Dementors. Like on the Hogwarts Express. Dementors will be stationed around the school this year. They need to perform a task assigned by the Ministry of Magic, so during their guarding time, no one is allowed to leave the school without permission. I want you to understand that Dementors cannot be tricked by any kind of tricks, not even an invisibility cloak. And it's not in their nature to forgive, so don't go around giving them any reason to attack you. Dumbledore gave Harry a special look, this sentence is specifically to remind him not to try anything stupid. In case he loses his mind for a while and wears his invisibility cloak to find trouble with the Dementors. Finishing talking about the Dementors, Dumbledore changed his serious expression and looked at the teacher's seat with a smile on his face. The next piece of good news is that we will welcome two new professors this year. First, Professor Remus J. Lupin of Defense Against the Dark Arts. Professor Lupin, whose clothes were covered with patches, got up to greet everyone with a restrained expression. What he got was warm applause from Harry and some others. At the Slytherin long table Lucas just clapped his hands symbolically. He did see Professor Snape's ugly expression so he won't do things like asking for trouble. Harry and Ron at the Gryffindor table next to him also saw Professor Snape's disgusted expression. Harry whispered to his friend next to him, I guess Snape must be upset that he didn't become the Defense Against the Dark Arts professor. He actually hates every Defense Against the Dark Arts professor. When Harry said this, his tone was gloating, he was delighted by the annoyed look of Professor Snape. Next is the second professor. 
everyone knows that Professor Ketleban has reached the age of retirement. Plus his mobility is a bit inconvenient, of course, he hopes to spend his retirement time with his remaining limb. So give a warm applause to Rubius Hagrid, who will become Professor of Care of Magical Creatures and of course will continue his original duties as Keeper of Keys. Hagrid received even louder applause, the big man has a lot of popularity in Gryffindor and Hufflepuff. In such a warm atmosphere, a sneer came from the long Slytherin table. Lucas looked at the two people in the teacher's seat. One is a werewolf, the other has a sloppy personality who likes to raise and breed dangerous creatures. He didn't know what to think about Dumbledore's choice of teachers. Perhaps, as Professor Snape said, his head was already full of sweets. Once the opening feast was over, the students returned to their respective dormitories under the leadership of their prefects. Before leaving the Great Hall, Harry was taken away by Madame Pomfrey and the students immediately discussed this. Those who didn't believe that Harry fainted on the train didn't seem to be so firm anymore. Slytherin Common Room The traditional ceremony of the Chief Challenge has officially started. But before it started, Severus Snape, who was their head of house, suddenly arrived. This is something unexpected because he never bothers to attend this particular ceremony. At the same time Harry, who just came out of the infirmary, looked at Professor Lupin beside him. Professor, can you tell me what spell Lucas used on the train today? You mean the patroness charm? Seeing Harry nod, after thinking about it, Lupin explained to him the function of the patroness charm. Then can you teach me? I feel that the Dementors affect me much more than anyone else. Lupin didn't agree to Harry's request. He stopped and went to the window, watching the Dementors floating in the air in the pouring rain. Harry, I don't think you are ready yet, maybe I'll teach you how to do it later. Harry frowned, seemingly dissatisfied with the professor's answer. But Professor, Lucas and I are both third years, so if he can cast it, I can definitely do it too. Harry, you don't understand, the patroness charm is not so easy to learn, most adult wizards have trouble with the spell and not many can actually use it. Lupin saw the determined look in Harry's eyes, knowing that it is useless to keep persuading him. So he had no choice but to teach him the spell of the patroness charm and how to cast it. Expecto patronum. When Harry got the spell he immediately raised his wand and tried to cast it, but nothing happened. Remus sighed and said, Harry, the patroness charm is a very ancient and profound protective spell, and it is very difficult to learn. So don't be discouraged, no matter how talented you are, you can't master it in a short time. However, as your defense against the dark arts professor, I can tell you responsibly that your defense against the dark arts talent is very good. You are just like your father, and with my guidance I believe that you will be able to successfully cast the patroness charm in a couple of months. Harry looked at the melancholic man in front of him in surprise. You know my father. Of course, your father James and I used to be students of Gryffindor and he was one of my best friends, Harry, you are very similar to your father, both are very talented. In this instant, Harry suddenly felt a warmth as if Lupin was part of his family. The two talked about James Potter's deeds as they walked. Perhaps it was because he hoped that Harry's father would have a majestic and upright image, so Remus didn't tell all the bad things their marauders group did back then. All right Harry, it's getting late, you should go back to your dormitory to sleep. Harry glanced at the corridor behind him and said goodbye to Lupin reluctantly. When he returned to his dorm, Ron and the others were eating prank candies. He heard the sounds of various animals coming out of their mouths and he jumped into play right away. As for the patroness charm, it has long been forgotten. Professor Lupin also said that even talented people take a long time to succeed. Harry felt that instead of practicing hard by himself, it would be better to wait for Professor Lupin to impart his experience. Slytherin Common Room Lucas sat on the sofa, looking at the panting brown-haired girl. Although she was a little embarrassed, she still beat all the people in her year. My lord, I still want to show you one more thing. Astoria took a deep breath. Wait until her fast-beating heart calmed down a bit waved her wand and pointed forward, expecto patronum. Silver white light appeared on the tip of her wand. Although it was still in the state of white mist, Lucas could tell at a glance. Astoria's patroness charm is pretty close to becoming corporeal. That's right, keep practicing, I believe you will be able to display a complete patroness in a short time. Hearing Lucas praise, the little girl's face was slightly red, and the smile on her face was much brighter than before. Gemma Farley, as prefect, stood up and announced the final results of the chief challenge. First year chief, Astoria Greengrass. 
looking at her younger sister standing in the middle of the crowd receiving applause, Daphne's eyes were a little complicated. She is very clear about how much hard work her younger sister has endured in order to obtain the strength she has today. Ah! Father, mother, I may not be able to bring Tori back. Lucas had no idea that because of himself, a young girl's hair almost turned grey with worry for her sister. He stood up from the sofa and looked around at everyone in the lounge. You should have heard what Headmaster Dumbledore said. Until the Dementors have withdrawn, students are forbidden to go out without permission. Especially those with a good patroness, if I ever find out you're going after Dementors. I will definitely place you in the lounge as the objects for everyone to practice their transfiguration. Yes Chief. Everyone knows Lucas' temper, while he's usually quite gentle, he always does what he says, so they all nodded. Of course, I know that many of you are still very timid when facing Dementors alone, so. At this time, Lucas looked at the older chiefs at the side. Second Year Chief, Noel Shafik. Third Year Chief, Draco Malfoy. Fifth Year Chief, Marcy Flint. The three of you go catch two Dementors and bring them back for practice. Ahem. Came Professor Snape's cough. Lucas glanced at him lightly, Professor, now is the time for me to issue orders as chief. If you have different opinions, we can discuss it later. Snort. Professor Snape's expression turned even colder and everyone around him could feel the sudden decrease in the air pressure. Chief, do I really need to go? Marcy Flint raised her hand and asked. Of course, you have to protect the two younger chiefs. Seeing Marcy's expression on the verge of crying, everyone around laughed out loud. For the chief of the fifth grade, the application of the patroness charm was perfect. But at one point, she was terribly afraid of ghosts, and a Dementor fit the look of a terrifying ghost much better than the Hogwarts ghosts. Marcy's pleading eyes were ignored. Lucas looked at everyone and said again, No one knows where Sirius Black is right now. I'm sure most of you have been informed that Black is coming to kill Harry Potter. I don't care whether this matter is true or not. If you meet a stranger at school, please inform your year chief or me and the head of house in time. Do you understand? Yes chief. Lucas nodded in satisfaction, and then let everyone disperse. Mr. Grindelwald, come with me to the office. Professor Snape, who had been waiting for a long time, left the lounge with a cold tone. When Lucas caught up with the other party and entered the office, with one glance he immediately saw the cauldron in the corner. Taking a closer look at the materials, Lucas smiled. It seems that his plan has succeeded. If this is the case, the plan for the old bee can start soon. Thanks for listening.